Boys, we've touched already on the three Olympians, the winners of the last four Olympic Games. They leap off the page at you. Christian Blumenfeld, uh, the PTO world rank number one, and then Alistair Brownlee and Jan Frodeno, who arrives as a wild card. Elsewhere, we've touched on Magnus Ditlev, who's put an enormous amount of work and arrives with a great deal of confidence and expect Aaron Royal to lead out uh, from the swim. We have mentioned already the boys have had their elbows held all week. There's been a lot of jostling, and that's the same in the women's race as well, where we have got eight of the top ten in the PTO World Rankings. Ashley Gentle, of course, the champion in both Edmonton and Dallas last year. Lucy Charles Barkley, uh, third in Dallas last year as well. Paula Findlay, uh, Danielle Reef, one of the greats. Annie Haug, bang in form at the moment. And Chelsea Sadara, of course, victorious at Ironman in Kona seven months ago. And we will talk about the women a little bit later, as we've mentioned, because they, uh, they head out after the boys. So to go into a little bit more detail, we're going to touch on Jan Frodeno. 616 days since he last crossed a finish line. It's almost remarkable in some ways that he's here and still competing. The psychology of the man and the ability of him today just to pull something out of the fire without having actually put in a performance of late. It's going to be really tough when you haven't raced for that long. He's had some really bad injuries to overcome, but if anyone can do it, it will be Jan. I mean, the professionalism he shows in his career and the fact that he has a really nice balance with that family life, I think that's what's allowed him to have such a long career and that's what's going to get him through and hopefully see a good performance for him today. How much today for the athletes is it about coming with a plan and a game plan and sticking to it? And how much is it about having to react to what others are doing? I think that's what makes the best triathletes. You can come in with a plan, but that plan has to be adaptable. The one that can deal with any scenario that's thrown at them, kind of really react to the situation and have that fitness to do it. I think that's the person we're going to see come out on top. Okay, it'll be very interesting indeed to see how all that goes. The noise is building enormously here, the atmosphere as well. It's a fantastic uh, occasion. But let's take you through uh, the course now. Oh, actually, we'll come back to the course in a moment too. Let's hear uh, from the GOAT and the GREAT who've been jostling all week. Is there an opportunity for a collaboration with Alistair not in the room? I think it's more opposite. Like he's probably going to work with Alistair and hope that I'm not there on the swim. And uh, yeah, I just have to make sure that I'm uh, having a great swim so I can sort of have control on the on the two older guys from the early on on the bike. I've been thinking about waiting for you on the run, actually. So, oh yeah. yeah, I'm feeling optimistic. I saw you running eight by one k on the track the other day. I was like, oh yeah, it's. It's okay, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. It's, it's, Cam, I'm feeling good, so. We'll Cam, Cam Roof told me that he was uh, cracking you on the track in Andorra. Andorra. So oh, yeah. he, he, he was more convinced that he would be up there on the yeah, run. Yeah, Cam Worth went for a swim with his dog this morning. I'm not <laughs> sure I'd take his word and his accuracy for actually being in the game. Especially now for me as an older guy, like I look at the sport and I'm already, you know, I'm already, I have a bit of distance because I'm not really, it's, it's a different generation. And I look at it and I look at all these guys talking a big game. And there's a lot of people talking a bit big game, but there's not many people delivering big. So when you do, like for me as a fan of the sport, it's also, you know, it's something, yeah, something that I used to do really, <laughs> talk and try and deliver. Talking a big game? Yeah, I think uh, we all do, and we've all been performing on the biggest stage. So uh, yeah, some of us will probably fail on Saturday. You know, you can't have three guys winning the same race. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Hold hands? <laughs> nope. <laughs> well, it's absolutely brilliant to see those two sitting side by side. And I probably shouldn't say this, but to let you in on a little secret as we conducted that interview, one of the stools was just one inch bigger than the other, and Jan was in first and went straight for the bigger stool to impose himself. How good that we have got a rivalry and we've got an opportunity to see these two going head to head today. I love the rivalry and I think this is what triathlon needs as well. We need these big personalities, we need these stories and these two are really bringing it. It just intrigues you, it makes you want to watch and I just can't wait to see what happens today. What's been very interesting as well is that obviously the, the sport of triathlon is fascinated with today but actually it's been garnering headlines in the wider sports media as well. In, in the UK we've had in the Sunday Times, we've had build up in the Times as well. Does it feel like triathlon through the PTO is really beginning to hit? a bit of an inflection point in the wider public. Especially over this middle distance, yeah. We're really seeing PTO bring this event to the wider world. And um, we want to turn these athletes into household names. They deserve to be up there. They're the toughest athletes in the world. And yeah, I just want to see them up there and getting the attention they deserve. Good stuff. It's a wonderful setting here in Ibiza. A wonderful course as well. And Helen's going to talk you through it. We're starting with a swim, it's two kilometres, it's a beach start, there's an Australian exit in the middle which means the athletes are exiting the water and running around to dive back in, then onto the bike. 
We've got a two kilometer ride out through the town where the main lap starts. It's gonna be fast, it's gonna be hot, it's gonna be furious. The athletes have to ride through a tunnel midway through the lap. The pressure is gonna be on in this course. Then it's back towards transition. Quick change, then winding through the old town on the run, heading all the way towards the port. The run is six laps, then the athletes finish on the quayside. We are all set. Three greats into one crown does not go, but what a race in store. We're going to hear from Helen and Vicky throughout the course of the day. But first of all, it's a very warm welcome to John Gooden. Thank you very much, Alex. Exciting stuff here. 2022, the PTO really got out of the blocks, demonstrating what they are trying to achieve in terms of growth for the sport through both storytelling and a racing tour. The foundations are now laid. Lessons are being learned by everyone. Contenders and prospects are being determined. The big story, of course, Jan, Ali, Christian, the last three Olympic champions racing for the first time together. It is all building up very, very nicely here indeed Wearing in Ibiza. 131, ladies and gentlemen, the 2008 Olympic gold medalist, three-time Ironman world champion and two-time 70.3 world champion from Germany, Jan Frodeno! Wearing 124, currently ranked 39th in the world, two-time Olympic gold medalist, four-time world champion from Great Britain, Alistair Crowley! Wearing 106, PTO ranked ninth from Germany, Florian Angers! Wearing 105, PTO ranked eight from France, Leon Chevalier. Wearing 104, PTO ranked seventh from Australia, Max Newman. Wearing 102, PTO ranked third from Denmark, Magnus Ditlev. And wearing 101, uh, PTO ranked one, the only triathlete to ever be Olympic World Ironman and 70.3 world champion from Norway, Christian Blumenfeld. So, back here in the commentary booth, alongside three-time Olympian and two-time world champion, Helen Jenkins. Helen, we see there the revelers in, here in Ibiza have swapped out their party gear. They're here to support this fantastic race. It's such a, an interesting blend, isn't it, coming to the White Isle? Is a lot of us have used this as a party destination in the past. Perhaps you pro athletes have seen it slightly differently. Yeah, there's a really big contrast, isn't there, between the half the people here seem to be uh, in compression Athletes socks and ready positions. for a triathlon, and the other half Athletes, are here partying, are uh, maybe on stag dos. <laughs> Getting ready for the start here. here for the first European tour ever the first race of the PTO tour and the gun has gone off nice conditions here in the swim Helen it is a two kilometer race two laps 
at the Figueratus Beach. Well protected, no surf expected. I think it's about a 21 degree water temperature as well. And they're fast at the start. Yeah, it's a beautiful swim and it's in the ocean. So although this is not affected by waves, I'd say those that um, are used to swimming in the sea, they're comfortable in the ocean, they may have an advantage here today. We know someone like Jan Fredino, he's, uh, he likes surfing, he spent a lot of time in Australia in the past. This could be a great start for him. We did see the athletes um, choosing different positions. Uh, so it's interesting to see where they are go and who is going to go like gravitate towards the fastest swimmers as they're heading out towards that first boy. So out there at the front of the yellow cap is the considered goat, Jan Fredino in the yellow cap. And an interesting note we got down from our colleague Vicky on the start line, saying that Ben Canute, who's a strong swimmer, has decided to come out all the way to the left, whereas a lot of the other races were out to the right. He doesn't want to be in the mix in the pack there. He breathes to the right as well. So we can see already the strategy playing a part in the race early. Yeah, and Ben Canute is a really experienced athlete. He raced um, short course a lot. He likes these sea swims. He always races well in Oceanside, California, where it's traditionally as a beach start. So I'd expect to, we'd expect to see Ben Canute near the front of the swim, but I really think this kind of swim does suit him. But as I just said, Jan Fredino, he loves swimming in the sea as well. He's got really, it's an advantage if you've got long legs when you're running into the sea. So Jan Fredino being one of the taller athletes, it really helps with that get out speed. You're able to run maybe just a couple of steps further than anyone else. That big dive into the water and then you're into your swimming. And so the taller you are, the further you can run, it really does help. And we have an Australian exit on this swim. So that means the athlete's going to exit after each lap, run a short way and dive back in. So those skills, although it's not a really long way in and out, they really do have an effect when you have to exit the swim halfway through. Someone else to keep an eye on as well is Aaron Royal. He is wearing the silver cap. We see him sort of centre right of your picture. We've got Aaron Royal sitting near the front there. So the current PTO number one ranked athlete, Christian Blumenfeld, has been waiting for the opportunity to challenge the triathlon old guard, and he's hoping it'll bring out his very best. I'd love to know how you have prepared to take on two men, Jan and Alistair, who I presume were not necessarily heroes, but you had a lot of respect for coming through the ranks. How do you get to the start line thinking, I'm here to beat you, it's not a pleasure to race you? Well, I, th I think that's something that's motivated me, like to race against the best. And uh, because then, of, of, course, of course, the stakes is higher, but also if you're coming out of, of the battle on the biggest stage, that's uh, something that really uh, means really much to me. And uh, to win a race isn't necessarily just a win, you know, you want to beat the best. And I couldn't really ask for any bigger battles there on Saturday than racing those two guys and also having Magnus Ditlev in the mix and Jason West who's coming uh, out of a pretty good performance on the run in uh, Oceanside. So uh, it's sort of the mix between uh, the old generation, the new ones and also up and coming guys. So uh, it can be like a switch of the, like, the different decades, like you have his decade from 2008 until like 2019 and then hopefully Alice are in between there now, it's my turn. It's certainly been interesting to see the interaction between those guys this week. Yeah, and he feels it's his turn, and I think the swim is key for Christian Blumenfeld. He comes into this race backing his run. He knows he's probably, well, on paper, he is the fastest runner in the field, but the swim here is where it's crucial for him, and he really has to try and be as close to the front as possible. So, out in front, that is Jan Fredino. We were expecting you true to form, as you said, there's the, the long frame of, of Jan is, is doing well, of course, that experience, and that is what a lot of his fans would have liked to have seen early as well. 
Yeah, and Jan Fredino is a great swimmer, and just the fact that he hasn't raced for a while, we don't know exactly what form he's in. I, I think he's going to be in great form, the fact he's shown up. I don't think he'd be here if he wasn't fit, if he wasn't injured. But the fact he's had a running injury means potentially his swimming has come up another level, because unfortunately for athletes, we get injuries, and then you do spend time on the other disciplines. So we might see his swimming ability coming up, So, but it's certainly at the front at the moment. feels like he's in a good position for the start of his race. What a frustrating time it's been for Jan Frodeno. 616 days since he's completed a race. It's, it's a really long time since the last race, and you do think, how do you feel coming back into it after that long? Is there a bit of, I suppose, rust? Uh, how are you going to feel getting back out there? First race in a long time, but I think we can't discount all that experience that he has had in the past, and that is going to give him the ability to come out and race well, regardless of how long it has been since his last race. Olympic gold medalist, three-time Ironman world champion, twice the world champion at 70.3 distance as well. There's not a lot that he hasn't seen and done in this sport, but a long time out. And he lives for the competition. He's been thirsting for the opportunity to get in there and test himself against some of these young guns like the Norwegians. Of course, we have Christian in the field today. And just let them know, remind them why he is considered the greatest of all time. Yeah, and I think this it really inspires him. He's, he's been out for a long time, but this is really motivating. The fact that he's got this battle, he's coming back. I mean, he's done everything there is to do in the sport, but the fact he's still so fired up. And I think this versus Christian Blumenfeld versus Alistair Brownlee, this has got him back and hopefully got him back in really good shape. So the teal colored cap that you might have uh, caught sight of when we were closer to the pack there is Alistair Brownlee. As we saw, Amfredino out in front at the moment, coming back. It is a two-lap course Aussie exit, which means they'll exit the water. Quick dash, I think it's about 50 meters across, and then they'll dive back into the water to come back in for that final lap. You can see there, they're still quite close together. We don't feel like anyone has really stretched out this swim yet. Ideally for the top swimmers, they really want a long line. The pace has to be on. And we're gonna see that if the, there's breaks further back. And we can see there is a few gaps opening up and that's where it gets a little bit, um, little bit tricky for the ones further back. We did just see the orange hat of Christian Blumenfeld there. So he is not currently near the front. He is losing a bit of time. There are some gaps opening up and it's really important for him to be aware of where he is and the moves that are happening in front. Give you a little reminder or, or let you in on some secrets of the colors of the caps that I have in front of me and you guys with sharper eyes than mine might be able to identify. So in the orange is Christian Blumenfeld, in the white is Magnus Dietlev. Look out for the silver cap of Aaron Royal. He's always fast in the swim. Ben Knut is wearing the red cap. Alistair Brownlee in the teal. Here we are, we can see that hat in third is definitely uh, the teal hat there of Alistair Brownlee. Now, the, those of you that follow the PTO on the socials may have come across the mystery pro. He or she is causing a lot of chatter in the triathlon community. Let's pull up what the pros have predicted here. So. Christian Blumenfeld first, Alistair Brownlee second, and Aaron Royal third. Jan Fredino not in the running, according to the Mystery Pro. Helen, what do you think about that? Oh, very interesting. I, I can see that um, when someone's been out for that long, you tend to come into a race, you're either going to blow the field apart and win or come last. <laughs> so I think maybe that's where it's coming from. 
but it's so hard to know just with him being out for so long. But the Mystery Pro has caused a bit of controversy, so it'll be interesting to see if um, yeah, anyone has kind of, kind of lined up with those predictions. So Jan is at the front at the moment. A very good start for him. He is pulling along the rest of the field at the moment as they make their way back towards the beach. Now, you can see there is a second yellow cap there, which is confusing all of us here in the broadcast position. And I'm just having a... Oh, is that looking like Jan's in second place now? Yeah. And Looks like Jan in third, so it could be Aaron Royal in, um, in the lead. We're not 100% sure who had the other yellow hat, but what is great here is for the top swimmers, there is a gap opening up further back. We have now got a front group moving away, which is what these fast swimmers wanted. And why is that important as we progress through the race? Uh, well, the fast swimmers, they know Christian Blumenfeld is the fastest runner, and the aim is to get as much time as possible on him. Yeah, that looked like Aaron Royal to me, who was out in front with Jan Frodino in second. As they're coming across now for the the Aussie exit. We're looking for athletes like Daniel Backgaard to be up there as well, another really good swimmer. Yeah, there's so we see that Aaron Royal is leading them out. Frodeno, Brownlee on his feet, Carl Smith right up there as well. Salvesberg, he was a late, uh, late starter to the race. He's right up there, coming from that short course background. He does have that good swim ability. Florian Anger, great swim for him. And obviously very strong on the bike, and that's what it's going to set up. Those guys that can stay with that front pack, Helen, who are uber bikers, they, it's going to be so important for them. Yeah, and there's key there. We saw Christian Blumenfeld is 28 seconds back, so he's lost 28 seconds in the first lap. He's really going to want to minimise that. And try not to know. The great thing about an Aussie exit is, is he might have someone there shouting at him when he comes through what his time gap is. And he's around a few good athletes. He can maybe use those to get back up to the front and really try and get as close as possible on that swim. And we're just getting word that Magnus Ditlev is 42 seconds back. So I don't, I don't think he expected to be that far back out of the first lap. No, maybe not. I, but I do think this is maybe there is a bit of better. Sorry, there is a better swim standard here than maybe we've seen in the last few PTO Opens. We have Alistair Brown here, Jan Fredino. They really want to open up this swim. And Aaron Royal has that swim ability, but he doesn't always use it because it doesn't make sense for Aaron Royal to be off the front on his own in the swim, expending that energy. But today, if Aaron Royal gets out there, swims fast, he's got guys with him and he can work with those guys and they can put in. Hopefully, I guess the aim is a little bit of team tactics there between them is to try and put more time into Christian Blumenfeld. So Aaron Royal in decent form at the moment, came third at Challenge Gran Canaria. He is, of course, uh, a former Olympian. He's a winner at 70.3 as well back in 2020. Very consistent 2022 season. Third place at PTO Canada being a, a highlight of his. He was actually last to get a slot in Canada, but his performance earned him a pick for the Collins Cup. And that, I'm sure, is going to just help bolster his confidence coming into this season as a 32-year-old professional. It's been a while between drinks for me and I'm very, very excited to be here. Uh, touch wood, so far everything's gone really smooth. I've only got another 48 hours to bridge until I make it to a start line, which has been a long time. And uh, of course, you know, that kind of field, this kind of race, the kind of hype, uh, it's beautiful. It's what I live for. Personally, for me, racing someone like Alistair is something that I live for. You know, we've, got, we've had a few battles over the years and it's, um, it's kind of been very one-sided at one time, then it's been one-sided at another, and, and I think it just draws people along, you know, and it becomes kind of a triathlon thing, becomes a national interest, um, simply because, you know, now there's a few people who are just, you know, known within their country, and that kind of makes it easier to follow, and they're characters that have been around for a while, so I think it's got the electric mix to be not just electric on the race course, but also get a few people fired up at home. 
Well, it's great to hear Jan Fredino talking about how important it is for these athletes to get out there racing, get this coverage, and yeah, we're getting to see these great battles between them. And he's currently starting off. He's in a fantastic position already. We can see that group getting away there. This is what Jan wants. <laughs> this is what he would have come in uh, aiming to happen. He has missed this. That is, that's the tone that I've been getting back from all of his social media activity and any interviews that I've been able to pick up of his. And they had some, some nice sporting, uh, like jabs over the socials with uh, Alistair Brownlee as well, like about buying family-sized cotton wool to wrap one another in, and just because there's this. The, the wider idea that he's just not been able to get to that start line and, and of course uh, Alistair has suffered similar fates as well but that hasn't been the case today they are here they are on the start line along with Christian Blumenfeld and it is all unfolding in front of us right now and myself as an athlete that I was injured for long periods and out of the sport sometimes for over a year it's it is so hard being on the sidelines you're watching your competitors out there competing you're seeing the big races happen especially missing these PTO races which have been the biggest races over the last couple of years and he would have been sat at home like unable to get out there training and you just get more and more motivated and more and more angry as well that you're not out there. You're watching the races and you think, that should be me. I should be the one out there like with those guys racing. So I think that's what he's bringing today, that just that passion for racing. And it really kind of fires you up. It really makes you realize what is important to you when you're out of it for that long. And I think this is what is important, these battles, these kind of personal battles as well. And I think it's worth putting you guys at home in the picture. For those that didn't know, he had uh, it's just been a, a succession of injuries and setbacks. And I think it started with an Achilles tear that led to a knee injury. Then he had a crash. Then there was sepsis. And as to your point, sitting on the sideline, watching everything unfold, obviously the introduction of the PTO, the 100 kilometer race distance and the, the competitive nature of this. And it really sounds like his absence has imbued him with a sense of gratitude and he's almost reconfiguring the way that he looks at professional competition. Yeah, I agree. And and it has been a really hard run for him. And I think you have to, you can't, uh, you can really bring you down if you're injured for that long. And I think you have to focus on what you need to focus on. I think luckily he's got, he's got a wife, he's got kids. And I think that gives him that sense of balance and allows him to maybe step back a little bit, get his body right, and then come back to it. So I think he said initially he was really rush, rushing. He pushed that Achilles too early. That's when we saw him drop out of Roth last year. He just wasn't ready to be racing. So yeah, great that he's uh, managed to get himself up there. And historically, he's always grown from the struggle. In the last three years, it have definitely been a struggle for him. So today we're going to see where that growth is. He said in some of his interviews, he used to prepare so that he can't fail. Now he prepares so that he can win. I mean, I'm asking you to be a, like philosophical there, Helen, but look, what's the difference, do you think? I think part of it is the age. A lot's been made that Jan's 41, you know, how is he still racing at this age? Why does he still do it? I mean, he has won everything, so why does he carry on? But I think he really has to prepare now. You have to take a bit more recovery. You have to really know yourself, know what's important, know what kind of gets you to the start line in the best shape possible. And he's been working with his coach, Dan Morang, for a long time now, and they'll know what works. They're going to know, they'll know what shape he's in. Um, so I think. Yeah, it's really being mindful of yourself. I think just that reflection and not go, when you're young, you can just go out there, you can smash it, you can smash it, you can do as much training as possible and nothing really happens and you recover and you race well. But as you get older, you do have to be a little bit more focused, a little bit more specific. Well, on that note, and I, and I don't want to kind of put you on the spot here, but you talk about focus and the injuries, he's kind of been forced into a position, but he's, he's a businessman. He has many other entities that he has to look after. He's... I'm not saying that the desire, the desire is not there, but he's achieved so very much. And he's now more senior in, in his years, into his 40s. So, like, does he need to be even more focused? And will the distractions of life be, have been taking his focus away? Like, how do you see that playing out here I, today? 
I think the distractions maybe add and have given him that longevity. That's why he's still out there racing, because he does have all that other stuff going on. And we're back and we can see Aaron Royal now is just, just leading. Like this is what he's wanted in the last few PTO opens. We haven't seen it. He's he's been at the front, there's been a large group, larger group, but he's managed to stretch out the swim and that group is going away. So this is the perfect swim scenario for an athlete like Aaron Royal. So we can see Aaron Royal, Jan Fredino, Alistair Brownlee, Carl Smith, Andrea Salvisberg. Florian Anger, Thomas Bishop in there as well, number seven. I mean, you were talking uh, about him as maybe someone to look out for. That is a really good position for him to be in, just eight seconds back off the front. Yeah, I think Tom Bishop, he, he's come out this year. He's already done really well in a couple of races. So he's got a bit of race experience already this year. A lot of the athletes, it's quite early for these athletes. It's May and they haven't done a race yet. So I think uh, it's, he's an athlete that could do well just from having that race experience already. Daniel Beckard, obviously an athlete that has been tipped for big things. I think uh, he was put inside some uh, some some videotape content that the PTO put together with Magnus Dietlev. And, and actually, it's Magnus that obviously broke through and had that outstanding race at, at the US Open. But I think this could be the season for Daniel Beckard. I'd, I'd urge you to go and follow him on YouTube as well. He puts together some fa fantastic content, which I'm enjoying following along. But he's there with Max... Newman, Ben Knut as well, and I'm, I'm having it on good authority that the next pack is trailing these guys by about 10 seconds, so it's a really good breakaway, Helen. Yeah, they've really put the hammer down, and we can see it's all strung out, and when an athlete, when those swimmers are single file like that, you know the pace is on. And it's a good gap, we can't see the athletes behind yet. It's a really elite group there as well, there's some strong riders in there. And we haven't really spoken a great deal about Alistair Brownlee, but of course, fantastic to see him back on the start line. And his problems have, I mean, it's just been one thing after another for Alistair as well. We're hoping, of course, that he can go hard until, you know, from the gun all the way through to the tape as well, because he's just such an exciting, aggressive racer. That tends to be the way Alistair races. I've never known him race any other way than hard from the start. So it's always really exciting when you see him on the start line. And, and it has been an up and down year for him, but the last couple of years but there's still some amazing performances in there he's done some really fast times over the Ironman half Ironman distance so it'd be great to see him at one of these races fit and ready to go so all of these boys will be on your left as they bring it in they're coming out the water very very shortly and we will see them dash into T1 and then they have to follow the relevant protocols before they they get on the bike for that, Helen, I think you can talk us through, because sometimes the difference between short course and long course racing, the transition, take, there's certain rules and regs that you need to abide by, and some of the long course racers, or those that have been out for a while, might not get it right. No, uh, we'll see the difference in a short course athlete and an and Ironman athlete tend to be in transition, and just the speed is coming out the swim. If you've done short course racing, you, it's full on. You're out the swim and you're sprinting to your bike and it's really fast. So sometimes there's a bit of difference in the speed, but the athletes might want to put on extra things. Sometimes they'll put on something in transition now, but everyone has to get that wetsuit off, goggles, hat. They have to go into the box next to the bike. If that equipment does not go into the box, they could be hit with a penalty. So we see Aaron Royal there in picture now. Yeah, the two-time Olympian. We'd Sorry. expect him to be fast through transition. There we go, there's Max Newman as well. Jan Fredin is already heading out. That's going to have to be a fast transition there for Newman to get onto the back of this group. Alistair Brownlee heading well. out. You yeah, can hear, you can the, hear the cheers. We've got Kyle Smith heading out there as well. Interestingly, Kyle Smith, training partner of Jan Fredino. I'm wondering if those two might be uh, willing to work together a little bit on the bike. That's not a bad bit of rub to have, is it? No, it's not bad at all. There's Daniel Backgaard heading out. Tom Bishop. So I'm just hearing that the rest of the, the swimmers are not yet out of the water. The next is now out that 40 seconds back. That's a really big gap to open up. That's uh, a long time uh, to be behind. Good swim there from Jason West. He's leading kind of that second group. Blumenfeld there, a minute down, so... 
That's a bit of time to make up. See Ditlev at a minute 10. That's not a bad swim for him. I don't think that's that's too bad for him. He, he would expect to be around a minute. He didn't lose too much time over that second lap. And we're just getting some information that Frederick Funk has an issue with his bike in transition right now. That is a nightmare start to the bike leg for him. Yeah, I did see them doing something to his bike. I wasn't sure what was going on, but yeah, you can see he's still stood there by his bike. There he is oh, there heading he is out, so I'm not sure what happened there. Maybe a flat or a problem with the gears. Really unfortunate for him. Worth saying at this point that we have Race Ranger in play as well, which is going to help with the drafting. Let us know a bit about drafting in this style of racing. So the closer you are to the athlete in front, the easier it is for the athlete. You, you do get an advantage. So today they're using Race Ranger. So it's basically a traffic light system that the athletes have on their bike. They'll see lights on the bike and they have to be further than 20 meters behind. So it makes it a lot more fair. That 20 meter draft zone is a really good distance. Uh, there's less, a lot less advantage with 20 meters and using Race Ranger today is hopefully gonna make this race a lot more fair. And we've heard from a lot of the athletes, they've mentioned it in their pre-race interviews, they're really excited that we're using this technology today. And that is the, the white disc that you might see on the back. There are two discs, in fact, on the bikes. One obviously to pick up the, 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 the I guess they work between one another, and the one at the back, then you're, you might start seeing some, some lights coming out. But what have we got here? Got that transition there. A little bit. Oh yeah, Jan Frodeno just struggling there with that jump onto his bike. See, oh, the no others way. have all run a little bit further up the hill and quite smoothly jumped on, but Jan jumped on at the bottom of the hill. You can see there the shake of the head. He's uh, not happy with himself. Kind of a, a bit of a rookie area there. Even the very best can get it wrong sometimes. Is that a little bit of race rust, do you think? Yeah, I would say so, that you just haven't been in that situation. And even as many times as you practice it at home, you don't have that adrenaline when you're practicing at home. You don't have that rush. Your heart rate is not 180 beats per minute. So it is always different when you get into a race. Apparently, uh, Frederick Funk lost about 20 seconds due to his mechanical issue, but we have it on good authority. It has been remedied. So I hope that stays true for the rest of the bike leg, which I shall just cover for you is 80 kilometers. It is over four laps heading out from the beach that we see here to Sac Casilla. It's a smooth uphill to San Antonio and a fast descent. There is a tunnel in there as well. And there's like a southern roundabout, isn't there, where they start doing a few laps. Yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be a really fast course. I think they're just coming up to start the lap here. Looks like Florian Angert, they're just coming into, uh, into the lead, taking over for Daniel Backgaard. And this is where they will do their laps. They'll come back to this point and we'll get four laps done. Uh, psychologically, when you have a lap system, Helen, what, what does that do for the athletes? Um, it, I think it makes it easier in a way because you can break up the course into sections. You can uh, really kind of focus on certain areas of your race and really kind of push it, push on different laps. So it really breaks it down in your head. I find it a little bit easier to manage, especially um, on the run. When they're out in one big loop, it's, uh, yeah, it can be quite challenging for pacing. But here we see the front group. There's Frodeno uh, sat on the back of that group. And what about getting eyes on other athletes on the course as well when you, when you have these lap systems? Yeah, that's always really handy uh, because you just get a good look. And I think it's that the mind games come into play there. So how far ahead someone is, whether they maybe might make a surge or try and look really good at a certain point, look really in control. Now, the interesting note about Jan Frodeno in this race was that he was actually a wild card just because of his absence. Sounds crazy uh, to think about that. But yes, there were some wild card entries that were determined by the uh, non-athlete members of the PTO board. They were considered out of who could really add something special to the competition. And if anyone can add a little something to this competition, it is Jan Frodeno and Alistair Brown. Oh, definitely. And we see them already. They are in the front group. We're on Max Newman there. I mean, he's had a really good year. He had a great swim and he's put himself in a great position. Jan there.
So there is Jan nicely in aero, but we're going to send it down to Vicky, who's in transition. Jan stood just by Frederick Funk's transition spot here, and we were just watching, and we could see the officials playing with Frederick Funk's bike. It became clear he had a rear flat, and that is such a disaster to start the bike with that. It would have almost been game over for Frederick Funk at that point, but fortunately the officials did notice. They performed a wheel change while he was still in the water, and they spent minutes really trying to get it sorted and get it all set up perfectly for him as he ran into his transition spot they were just finishing off the process he managed to stay calm you could see he sort of looked oh gosh there's something wrong with my bike he probably only lost i reckon around 15 seconds and i think that's probably crisis averted thanks for that vicky really interesting to see what happened there and uh, yeah, unbelievable, the officials spotted it early and lucky for Frederick Funk, he was uh, able to, well, he only lost 20 seconds when it could have been a lot worse than that. I mean, it could have been game over if he'd got there and uh, had to change uh, that wheel straight away. But back to the front group here, see Kyle Smith looking really, uh, really smooth there. And I do think the fact that he is Jan Fragino's training partner, they're regularly training together that we're going to see the two of them. That There could be a team tactics coming into play here. They could be working for each other. Kyle Smith really interestingly started in short course distance triathlon, didn't make an Olympic team, kind of fell out of love with the sport a bit, ended up doing long distance and has excelled at this distance, done really, really well over the last couple of years. Now mixing it up back at short course to try and make another Olympic. So I think we are going to see he's definitely got that speed there. We know he's been focusing on the shorter distance and we can see him at the front there dri really driving the pace. Alistair Brownlee and Jan Fredino with Max Newman pulling up the rear as well. Just to, to you guys at home, we have obviously got cameras here at the front, but if you want to check out what's going on in the rest of the race, head on over to the Professional Triathletes Organization website, and our social team does have a live blog and tracker so that you can pick up and stay in touch with the race for anything that we're not showing you on screen right now. And also a big congratulations to the PTO social team who recently picked up a Sports Industry Award as well. Do such a great job telling the stories of these incredible world-class athletes. Long may it continue. So, yes, they're doing great work alongside us here in the broadcast as well. Currently looks like we've got six there in the main group, and uh, there we're just getting those images of Christian Blumenfeld, who's on the chase. That's Jason West, who's just tucked in there behind him. So Christian Blumenfeld, 109 back after the swim, but... If we know anything about Christian, he can certainly pull up to the front and then run it down. Definitely. I think the positive for Christian Blumenfeld, although we can't see him on screen, is he was in transition the same time as Magnus Ditlev, and Ditlev is one of the best cyclists in the sport. So I think if those two manage to work together, there is definitely a chance of them pulling back some time on the front group. It's, uh, it's so early on in the bike, it's so hard to know, and it's really about tactics and who's going to work with who. Christian Blumenfeld, I mean, he really bets his run. He really backs it. He thinks he's got the, one of the best runs. So we might see him maybe sitting in a bit more and working with um, other athletes that are there. But at the moment, we see him on the front really pushing the pace. So he's not willing to let them get away. And we see Jan Fredino looking to pass here. That's Ben Canuti's passing there. So it's, yeah, moving up to the front. He has 45 seconds to make the pass. Plenty of time. And here is our transition times brought to you by Garmin. And the fastest in transition was Ben Knut. And Jan Fredino, although he had the 102 there, Helen, he kind of uh, suffered a little bit once he got semi out of transition on onto the bike. Yeah, I'd expect to see that from Ben Knut. He's always so fast through transition, and he really likes to hit the front of the bike hard. We see him there. He is being passed there by Jan Fredino, but he's comfortably in that front group. Organised. I, I bet he packs well. Yeah. You know I, mean? <laughs> I think we've got Alistair Brownlee there back in the front now. So he's really hit the front. This is where he wants to be. Like we said, I think, earlier in the swim, he only really knows one way to race. 
from the front and hard. Yeah, she's going back to Ben Canute. Like on his uh, on his website, his headline is with a lot of pressure, there's opportunity. And today there will indeed be a lot of pressure when you are side by side with some of the greatest to ever, ever do it, past and present. He really did want to race from the front, push through the line. That is happening, despite having given up a place to, to Jan Fredino. But I think he probably expected that at some point, but he's right where he wants to be. But we look at the very unique bike of Christian Blumenfeld. He's currently 114 back after the last timing, Matt. So he has lost a further few seconds since that transition. And about this course, Helen, I've heard a lot of the athletes talking about just putting down big power, getting aero and just going for it. Yeah, it's a relentless course. There's nowhere to hide on this course. You've got to have pressure on the pedals for the whole 80 kilometers. And so with that, uh, an 80 kilometer time trial almost, you know, who does that favor, would you say? If it just came down to a time trial, individual time trial, there's no one else on the road. I think you've got to be looking at athletes like Magnus Ditlev. Uh, he's just, just one of the uber bikers of the sport. But there are other people on the course and it does come into play. Although we have those long, uh, we have that 20 meter draft zone, which is a big draft zone. You still have to respond to all the others around yeah. you. If you're kind of in a group and someone on the front surges, you have to be able to respond to that. Christian Blumenfeld, he had just come out to the tunnel section of the course. We saw him just a little while back. He did pass um, Andreas Salzer Salzberg, so he is moving through kind of the tail end of that front group. But the front group currently putting a little bit of time into Christian Blumenfeld. As we go after each t over each timing mat, it'll be really intriguing to follow that time difference and see which way it's going. Statistically, Christian Blumenfeld is the fifth best biker that we have on the field today. Magnus Dietlev statistically is, is the fastest. We also have guys like uh, Cam Wharf as well in the field, but uh, obviously not here in that front pack. But he'll be putting in big numbers. But the other one to look for is Frederick Funk. It's not been the start that he wanted, but look for him to make up some places as this race progresses. But right now, Alistair Brownlee out in front. Yeah, I feel, feel like it's so interesting how this race will play out because I think everyone knows what Alistair's going to do. Go to the front, go hard. And then I think if you want to go all in and win this race, you've got to go with the pace. You've got to go with that hard bike pace and really go for it. But so often on the PTO races, we just see people exploding on the run because they've spent all their matches on the bike. So it's a really tactical game, a really big game of knowing yourself, kind of sticking to your plan. What powers do you want to push? It's, uh, yeah, there's so much going on in your head. It's not just simply getting on there and riding. In a way, what Alistair Brownlee is doing is easier. To the front, go hard, and that's all you have to do. I'd say that's uh, easier than playing it from further behind. And just behind him is young Kyle Smith, the 25-year-old Kiwi. He's raced a couple of times with the PTO, ninth at the Canada Open, 24th at the US Open, are very, very tough conditions. And he, he didn't finish in Ironman Hawaii, but he's been putting his attention on short course again, which is definitely your world, Helen. What can you tell us about Kyle? Yeah, just the fact that I think he's doing both at the moment. He's doing the half distance and aiming to go to another Olympics. We saw him race at a short course race earlier in, um, in March, and he did really well there. So really mixing it up. He's got that turn of speed and yeah, I think he's just aiming to kind of get into the top 10 today. That would be a fantastic result for him. But to do that, he really has to set that um, set that pace. Yeah, very strong swim bike combination. How well can he run against this field? And Tom Bishop, they're losing a little bit of time. But he's someone who's actually a very strong biker. He works with uh, some top cyclists, doesn't he? To try and get his, his aero, his drag coefficient down the best he can. Yeah, Tom Bishop is an interesting athlete at the moment, just currently losing a bit of time to that main group. But uh, it's really interesting. He's not been doing the long distance for so long. So, yeah, we'll see how he play, how it plays through the rest of the ride. Daniel Beckergaard falling out of that lead group now.
Just getting word that Magnus Dutlev, predictably, is the biggest mover. He's made 10 passes so far, but he's still a minute and 34 down at the last timing, Matt. He is coming out to Christian Blumenfeld, and that's interesting. If those two get together and, and can work together, then we may see uh, may see them gain a bit of time back because they're currently losing a bit of time. Just on that bottom corner, see Alistair Brownlee. He's gone around the turnaround now, so he is heading back down towards the town. And it is a really fast course. I mean, I know they've been hitting really fast speeds down here, so it's that ability to get down into the aero position, keep the pressure on the pedals, and not be worried about the speeds you're hitting. Again, putting you on the spot here. What kind of speeds for the uninitiated? What do you reckon they're hitting as they drag race through the streets of Ibiza? Oh, I, do, I know. Um, well, Tom Bishop messaged me and he said he was over 60k an hour for three minutes and he wasn't even trying. So I presume wow. once they're into race mode and kind of they've got down in the bars, they're, they're really putting the pressure on. They've got to be hitting over 70 on the way back down. Good Lord. I'm sure it's on Strava somewhere. <laughs> someone's, <laughs> someone's done the loop and uh, that speed will be on there. But we see Christian Brunenfeld, we did see who was behind him in between Christian and Magnus is Jason West. And he is one of the most feared runners. And I think we know that from Christian Blumenfeld mentioned him in his interview. So Jason West to be in this position at this point, if he's managed to stay with Blumenfeld and Ditlev, I mean, that could be incredible. That would be an incredible ride for him. Yeah, he had a, a great experience winning St. Anthony's Olympic last week tested himself on the bike by riding out front for the race rather than holding back and relying on his run. It worked really well. He credits Catalyst coaching for his improvement and it looks like he's taken that kind of strategy and brought it to Ibiza with him. Yeah, we see a lot more confidence in Jason West on the bike. I don't know if he's going to be able to hang on to uh, Christian Blumenfeld and Magnus Ditlev for the whole ride, but even if he stays on there for a bit, it's just taken him further along the road and it puts him in striking distance for the run. Yeah, he's really looking to become one of the top 10 best triathletes in the world and he's trending in a very good direction with that second at uh, Oceanside. He got the top spots, Clash Miami. We see there in 24th position, so that's Cam Wirth. He's currently last on the course and, and losing a bit of time. Such an interesting character, the triathlete. Well, I suppose the pro cyclist that also does triathlon, isn't it? <laughs> or rather than the pro triathlete that also does cycling. Definitely cycling probably his main job, but it's fantastic to see him out there kind of mixing it up, but doing both races. Yeah, he's got a, a funny tale recently about running one of the most brutal bricks uh, that we've ever seen off of a bike. We see there Ditlev just going, he's just gone past Jason West, it looks like he's there, he's taking that, he's gone into the zone, so he's going to pass Christian Blumenfeld. Well, Magnus Ditlev making up time, the long frame of the Dane, chewing up the tarmac here in Ibiza. That is a big statement. Frederick Funk on the move as well. It's a really big statement this early on. I think this is good for Christian Blumenfeld, but Ditlev's gone past Blumenfeld. He's on the front of the chase group now. There's no one in between him and that front, those front group. So Alistair Brownlee leading the PTO European Tour race. Couple of seconds behind Smith, Royal, Frodino, and then Ben Canute. He is 10 seconds behind the leader in that front pack of five. When he was passed, Blumenfeld, Blumenfeld was 131 back. So Magnus Dietlev is looking to pull him along maybe as he approaches that front pack. There's Aaron Royal. He was our swim leader, currently sitting in third position. Now, two-time Olympic gold medalist Alistair Brownlee is enjoying the depth of talent in triathlon, but even with his resume, he cannot predict who will be today's king of the middle distance. I think in terms of long distance, um, the sport, I think not many people would argue that saying it's you know more competitive than it's ever been. Uh, there's the top athletes standing on middle distance star lines and trying to win the biggest races. 
Um, and I think that's great to be part of as an, as an athlete, racing the best athletes, and it's um, hopefully great for fans to watch as well. I think it's quite hard um, to pick a particular favourite. Um, that's for a load of reasons. You know, this um, kind of middle distance racing is unique actually when a, when a really competitive field turns up because the race dynamics are completely different. Every course and race is, is a bit different. Um, we obviously haven't seen um, Jan Ferrodino race very much over the last few years, so he's a bit of an unknown. Obviously, um, Christian is probably a, a known that he's always going to be really good, so um, you'd probably say he's, uh, if you were a betting man, you'd probably put the money on him, but to actually pick a favourite with um, all, the, all the kind of unknowables, I think is really tough. Can I win it? Um, I don't know. I'll have to wait and see on Saturday. I'm going to try everything I can to, um, to win, obviously. A cagey answer there from Alistair Brownlee, not committing anything, but we know he's at the front of the race. He's doing everything possible in his power to uh, to get to that finish line first. Yeah, he was due to race Ironman South Africa, but pulled out due to a sore hip. So sadly, injuries continue to be a narrative as we enter the 2023 season, but looking strong at the front of the race here in Ibiza right now. Yeah, currently on Magnus Ditlev, who's really moving through the field. He just looks so comfortable in that position. He's really invested a lot of time over the last uh, the last couple of years. He's, he's regularly going to the velodrome to do testing. He's been in the wind tunnel a couple of times over the winter. So really trying to get every aspect of his kit and equipment the best possible. Yeah, he seems to be finding his groove after a, a frustrating entry into professional triathlon. Big win at Challenge Roth, an impressive season, landing him third in the PTO rankings. I believe he's just 25 years old as well. Yeah, unbelievable. He's so young, isn't he? He really just came into the sport, and I think he about seven, I think he said he was about 17 when he started, and uh, really self-coached for a while. Was doing completely the wrong training, taken under the wing by his coach from the tri club in, in Copenhagen and it's still with the same coach and amazingly he's just just gone from strength to strength yeah coached by Jens Peterson Bach and in 2019 he missed the whole year due to a serious accident broke his collarbone shoulder and his right arm I remember actually seeing him just sitting on his trainer all strapped up just still turning the legs over but he said he might never be able to raise his arm again by the doctors. Just having a look at the pace here. And Brownlee at just over 50 kilometers an hour. But Ditlev, look at that, 55 kilometers an hour. And even Blumenfeld is finding some pace as well. Faster than Brownlee. And that translates into miles an hour for you as well. And the old money as Ditlev passes another. He passes Daniel Beckergaard, the fellow Dane. Yeah, that's, I mean, you can just see there how fast Ditlev's moving and that's why his pace is so high. He's making all of these passes, but hard for Daniel Beckergaard as well. He really needs to keep his head in the game when something like that happens and not let it affect you. Keep kind of riding to your own pace because you don't want to get demoralized this early on in the bike. Matt as Dietlev is trying to make up the tarmac to Florian Angert. Some serious bikers out there now at the front. And some moving in as well. As he part, I mean, he's blown by Florian Angert as well in the tunnel. Yeah, unbelievable, unbelievable riding here from Magnus Dietlev. It's just so strong. And you see the results on paper of how fast he rides, don't you? Just you see these bike splits, but it's it's crazy when you see how fast he's passing the other athletes. So he's got a little bit of time before he has any company now. 40 seconds behind the next man. And that will be Tom Bishop that he's chasing down right now. But already a, a standout performer on the bike leg is Magnus Dietlev. And that is Kyle Smith assuming the lead, getting some work in at the front. He is right there in front here at the Ibiza PTO European race. And he's looking strong. 
Yeah, the pace is on at the front. They are losing. They have lost a few athletes on this first lap. They're, they're coming back, and we've got Magnus Ditlev, who is kind of overtaking those on the way up. But still in that front group, Alice Brownlee, Carl Smith, Aaron Royal, Ben Canute, Max Newman still there, Jan Frodeno is still there, and Tom Bishop as well is uh, still on the back of that group. So they have to slow a little bit as they negotiate these roundabouts. I, I believe, I think there are three roundabouts, is that right? So it's not quite a complete straight drag race, but it's certainly not a technical course. It's not a technical course. In a way, those roundabouts actually offer a little bit of respite. They can come out of the position uh, for a little bit, which can be quite aggressive sometimes, that aero position come out. It's not a stretch, but just a bit of movement, then back in again, ready for the next, uh, the next straight to the next roundabout. So Magnus Dietlev is in eighth, but he's not really riding much faster than the lead group. So it'd be interesting to see how that all works. What, what's happening at the, at the front here? Is there some kind of professional uh, courtesy to s assume the front, do a little bit of the work to, to like pull along the rest of that train? I don't think there's a professional courtesy. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be nice if they were all taking turns, probably. They might go a bit faster, although they have got that 20 meter draft limit, so it's not like they're gaining massive advantage, but there still is going to be a slight advantage by being sat in the pack. You'll have some athletes, they have no intention of going to the front. They know they're just staying in the position, they're trying to hang on for as long as possible, and that's what they're doing. But there's some athletes, if the bike is where you need to make your race, then I think it's worth going to the front. We see here Kyle Smith, he's not one of the fastest runners in the field. So if he wants to get there, if he wants to get on the podium, even break into that top 10, top five, he's got to go for it on the bike. But there is that element that we're all working towards the same goal. So let's all kind of take a few turns, but some of the athletes in this group probably won't be able to. So with Alistair Brownlee, do, do you feel like he's, I know that he's an, he's an aggressive uh, athlete anyway, he really goes after it, but given his current form, do you think that he's putting the onus on going even harder out on the bike to see what he's got left on the run? It could be, but I think we do see that from Alistair, whatever race he goes into, from when he's um, first started in juniors um, a long time ago now, all the way up to now, he goes hard from the start. So he will be pushing, but I think if he's got company up there, he's got Kyle Smith who's pulling some big turns, that's really going to help. And yeah, interesting, Yang Fredino sat on the back of that group, maybe not... Um, I'm sure he has got the ability to be at the front, but maybe just being a little bit more cagey, a little bit more tactical. So Denmark's Magnus Dietlev finished 2022 strong and has since been working diligently on his weaknesses today. He gets to put it all together in a top class field. I think uh, throughout the winter, I've worked really hard on my swim and run. Uh, so I really hope to be uh, within striking distance after the swim and then obviously the bike is uh, my strength and I still believe I can do quite some damage on the bike. The course looks uh, pretty good to me. It's not like uh, up and down the whole way and not really technical, just pushing, pushing big numbers on the bike and also some downhills with a lot of speed but not like uh, really technical so you always have to play to push the pedals and be aerodynamic so especially on the bike I think I can make a difference and hope to show also that the hard work during the winter on the run will pay off. Well that hard work is so far paying off for Magnus Ditlev he is moving through the field he's just got to he's only got the front group ahead of him now he's really got to try and close down that gap. And he's taken Christian Blumenfeld with him as well. That's good for Christian Blumenfeld. Just see it on screen now, just a little bit further back, we've got um, Daniel Backegaard there. This is the group that have been dropped by Ditlev and Blumenfeld, though, so they are losing time at the moment. Is that Florian Anger that we can see in the blue? Making up that group of four. As Ibiza comes to a standstill while these guys race through for a huge prize purse of $600,000. Yeah, it's the big money, and, and that's why it's a big prize purse for the, the number one. So I think that's why we see people going so hard on the bike. We sometimes have um, people kind of blowing up because they just don't pace it, because they've got to go all in. There's big money on the line, so they go all in to try and win these races. 
Now, these big races bring about the triathlon royalty, and I believe that Vicky has a, a special guest with her in transition right now. That's right, I'm down here with Non Stanford, Aaron Royal's wife. Non, this is the first race that you've been to since you retired in sort of full supporting regalia. How does that feel? Yeah, it's a little bit strange, especially watching everyone rack this morning, but I don't miss those pre race nerves, that's for sure. So let's talk a bit about Aaron. We know he's an incredible swimmer. He did lead out the swim today. We've seen in other races that he's maybe held back a little bit, working on the basis that it might not be in his interest to go too hard too soon. Today he really went for it. I presume that was his tactic. Yeah, I think he wanted to go hard in the swim. There's some really good swimmers here, so I think it was a case of taking it out, trying to force a, a break, so that they had a, a group of really strong cyclists away to make the you know the life of those Uber bikers behind that little bit harder, and and it's paid off. I think they got out with 60 to 70 seconds on uh, Blumenfeld and Ditlev, so that's huge, and um, they're moving away at the minute, I understand. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's going to plan so far, it's just how deep he has to go on the bike to stay with, with Alistair and Jan. Yeah, tucking himself right into that really uber group of six athletes. As you said, I think we're about 90 seconds up now on Christian Blumenfeld. That's got to play to his advantage. How does he feel about his run, do you think, coming into this? Yeah, I think he's he's fairly confident. He's, he's, he's got a new, new coach this year, so his training has been really different. He's now working with Dan Plews. He's really, really enjoyed that, and the training has been quite different. Um, but hopefully it'll pay off, and, and we'll see. We'll see in an hour or so, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, we wish him all the best. Just a quick word on his swim skills so we know that he loves like beach beach type swims probably not quite enough waves in there for Aaron he loves this kind of swimming right yeah definitely he would have loved it if there was uh, boomers out there as he would have called it he'd have said time in the green room I think he called it but yeah he, he, he really thrives off beach starts being an Aussie growing up on the beach um, but he definitely would have preferred a bigger wave but um, you know he still let out and they still forced that break so I think he'll be happy enough well thanks so much for joining us non i know you want to get back out on the course to give him some splits so we'll we'll let you go and yeah thanks for joining us down here in transition great insight there from non stanford aaron royal's husband So back to the racing here. Yeah, very interesting with the family feel of, of triathlon. I've, through my research, you see so often that it's obviously a very individual sport. It's a lonely, lonely place to be sometimes, but you do need that sort of, for a lot of people, they need that support network around them, traveling around the world, uh, cheering them on, and understanding what you guys go through. Yeah, I think that's why you see quite often athlete, uh, triathletes end up with other triathletes as their partners because not many other people get uh, how that relationship works. And Non Stanford, um, an Olympian, European champion, she's, um, yeah, she knows how it feels. And now she's a coach as well. So the rankings that you see there are his relative rankings versus the rest of the field. So he's the sixth fastest, or coming into this, he was the sixth fastest swimmer, 12th fastest on the bike, and then the 22nd fastest on the run. He is certainly gonna be improving that bike uh, in terms of the, the rest of the field after today's showing. Yeah, he's right near the front, isn't he? And really been pushing the pace. And he took over from Alistair Brownlee quite a long time ago now and has been quite willing to sit there and really drive this pace. Overall, he is 16th in the PTO rankings. Is there anything there where he's working alongside Yang Fredino as their teammates? You know, might be the sacrificial lamb. Yeah, I think so. He could be sacrificing. And I think 
the fact that he's his training partner, the fact that Jan's kind of taken him under his wing, um, looked after him, trains with him. I mean, Kyle's getting an enormous benefit. Yang gets an enormous benefit from having someone maybe faster than him in, in the swim or certain disciplines being there. I think uh, Kyle may feel like he owes something to Jan here, and this is it. This is the day he's getting to prove it. You go out there, you ride hard, and you pull this front group away. I love how it can be so strategic, not just the individuals, but there are these pairings. We obviously have the Norwegians, uh, some of the Danish team as well, but of, but of course, outside of that, there are the less obvious parents as well. We see there Magnus Ditlev is now within a minute of the leaders. So making up some time there. I think, what's that, about nearly 20 seconds that since we last saw him that he's pulled back? Yeah, I think it's that. I think it's about 15 to 20 seconds he's pulled back since the last time in check. Christian Blumenfeld is with him. He's only a minute down on the leaders, so they are together. Florian Angert mm, lost a little bit of time, as has Daniel Backegaard. Ditlev having a good look behind him there. Yeah, I saw that. Looking to see if maybe he's uh, getting, wants Christian Blumenfeld to come to the front and do, do some work. Magnus is like, I'm, <laughs> I'm not pulling you all the way to the front so you can run away from me. <laughs> but still there, Kyle Smith just driving that front and they'll be getting time splits. They'll know what's happening behind them. They'll know that Ditlev and Blumenfeld are moving closer. Transition, uh, sorry, aid station there just before they hit the tunnel, as you saw uh, some careful disposing of a wrapper there by Carl Smith. There are inf there are infringements out on the course for littering, so they have to be careful. Yeah, there's only there's certain areas where you can throw your litter because it just looks wrong, doesn't it? You're just throwing things to the side of the road. But he's, he's allowed to do it in that certain area. It really kind of minimizes the waste and a less effect on the environment around them. Yes, they're big on that here. This is a, a zero waste event, actually, under Balearic law. There's no single use materials to be used here at the event. Obviously, Carl Smith got the memo. That goes into the recycling bin. Carl Smith was third Super League in London not that long ago, been spending a lot of time in short course. He was in Abu Dhabi in March as well, I think. Yeah, so he's Abu got Dhabi the speed. in March. Yeah, he's really he is mixing it up to do that. Um, the super, <laughs> you know, the indoor arena games. It's really short distances, like 200 meters swim, 5K bike, and, and a, I think it's a 1.5K run. So really short distances there. There, that's Max Newman. So still comfortably in the front group. And Max Newman's not someone that's been talked about much. He's come into the race, ranked third in this race. He had a fantastic year last year. And uh, people weren't sure whether he could mix it up with the, with the top guys in this level of field. But at the moment, he's comfortably in that front group. Yeah, fourth in Hawaii. I think that's a strong indicator of his potential. Had a great warm up at Sunshine Coast, 70.3, building his confidence for Hawaii. Since then, won. Western Australia Ironman, so yeah, let's see how he fares in the first half of 2023. He's, he's building a really good resume. Six half distance wins, four Ironman wins. He was the winner at Ironman Cairns for three consecutive years now. Raced at the end of March. And he came first at Hell of the West. But Newman, not necessarily a half-distance specialist. He trains alongside Josh Amberger as well. No, and currently, like, well, he's, he's in a great position because he's sat in second run there with Alistair Brownlee. So that's Frodeno there at the back too. So all in this same group. We've got Smith, Newman, Brownlee. I think that's Aaron Royal. Then it's uh, Jan Frodeno there. Ben Canute probably just um, just dropped back one spot then because Ben Canute is also in that front group. But at the moment, they are being hunted down by Magnus Ditlev, Christian Blumenfeld, who are moving up through the field. We'll be interesting to see where they are at the next timing check. Carl Smith still leading the European Open right now. Yes, Alistair Brownlee tucked in behind him. Aaron Royal. 
make sure there's going to be lots of changes at the top. Yeah, and interesting what Non Stanford said there that Aaron Royal was wanted to this had to happen on the swim to the swim to really drag out and a front group to form, which has formed. But he's also a little bit worried. Has he got the legs to stay with this group on the bike? So that's why you might see an athlete like Aaron Royal not kind of at the front of this group. He's really sat in there doing everything he can to maintain and try and stay in there. So they've covered about 25 kilometers of the 80 so far. I mean, Carl Smith has run out of gears there. <laughs> he's in his biggest gear and he's freewheeling. He can't <laughs> push anymore. He maybe needed a bigger chain ring on the front. Did I hear that Tom Bishop had a special setup for his bike? Yeah, he only had one ring on the front, so that does make it more aerodynamic and I think, yeah, big gear on there to push. But he's currently, he's doing well, Tom Bishop. He's still near the front. He's not, um, he's not lost much time at all. I think this, the, the dynamic is going to change. We see there that gap there. Ditlev is now at 40 seconds, Blumenfeld 46. So that's when the dynamic of this front group might change when Ditlev gets to the front. Tom if he gets to the front. <laughs> yes. Tom Bishop working with uh, Dan Bingham. I hope he can get his legs for uh, some, some serious power to bring it home. Yeah, Dan Bingham is a, has held the world record on the track for the hour record. So excellent at uh, getting that aerodynamic position dialed in, which is what Tom's been working on over the last um, last couple of months. Doing a lot of work on his run mechanics as well. I was listening to some of the podcasts he's been doing and hasn't been kind. The weather uh, back in the UK hasn't been kind to him. But sometimes you just got to push through it. No, it's been it's quite hard sometimes to repair for warm races when you're in the UK. But um, it's not been it's not too hot here today for the athletes. So I'm sure they should uh, should be able to manage it. So so the. That is the top of the lap, so they are now heading back towards town. This is their second lap. We did see Jan Frodeno kind of making a move there on the roundabout. He did try and pass someone. It's ben Canute there, he is uh, at the back, and that's, where you, that's what you said earlier on about um, why the lap courses are interesting. They will have had a good look there at Dillev and Blumenfeld coming the other way, and they'll know just by sight that gap is coming down. Loving Ben Canute's bike as well. I love that colour scheme. Magnus Dietlev has made up about 10 seconds in the last sort of 30 seconds. He's gone from 30 to 30, 40 to 30 seconds behind. But while we've got eyes on the men's race, we, of course, today have the women's race as well, which will be happening in around about 20 minutes or so. With more on that, check this out. So I'm speculating here, but strategy-wise for Magnus Ditlev, is he trying to drop Christian Blumenfeld? If I was Magnus Ditlev, I would want to drop Christian Blumenfeld. Yes, I think he, he's trying to drop him. He might just take him to the front, but when Magnus Ditlev gets to this front group, that's when the tactics are going to come into play. He's going to want to uh, go straight to the front, blast past all these athletes, and the speed he's moving, he has the potential to do that. I just... I wonder who is going to have the ability to go with him. I think Ditlev is now approaching the back of that group. Just in the back, I think we can see that white suit yes, coming up. I think you're right. I did see Max Newman looking behind. I wonder if that's that kind of double take. It's like, is that Ditlev already? <laughs> is he there? Is he coming up? <laughs> well, he's certainly moving the fastest, as we see there with the race pace. And he's moving faster than Blumenfeld. He won't want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Blumenfeld on the run. Hence why, I guess... He's making the efforts on this bike course at the moment. Yeah, he's making that big effort to get to the front, but that is also the plan, isn't it? Get rid of Blumenfeld on the way up. But at the moment, still Alistair Brownlee on the front. It's going to be interesting when uh, they get to the front, who is going to be able to go with Ditlev. So 
Alistair Brownlee leading the European Tour race, the first of 2023. A new location, a new region for the PTO Tour as well. Yeah, European Open and really exciting to be having this race in May. A lot of these athletes are so used to having the big races towards the end of the year, the long distance races, the championships are at the end. So I think it's fantastic that we're having a series that brings the best together early on in the season. Magnus Dietleb, 15 victims already. He's 15 overtakes. That's fantastic work from the big Dane. Oh, absolutely incredible riding. And if he gets this front group and goes past them, he's going to add a few more to that list. I think I'm wondering if that's why we see Alistair Brownlee move to the front of this group now, because if Ditlev comes past, then he's in the prime position then to kind of go with him off the front. But Ditlev, 21 seconds now. He's he's brought it back so quickly. Are you expecting many of these athletes to blow up today? It's such a strong field that the adrenaline must be going just looking across that start line. The conditions are fairly favorable, but all the same, it's a big occasion. It's a big occasion and you have to get it right on the day. And it's so hard. I think he's ignoring all the hype that's going on around, trying to ride at your limits. Um, yeah, just not getting too carried away with the occasion and, and not giving too much respect either to all the other athletes. Although you do respect these athletes uh, before the start, after the start, I think when you're on the course, you have to really go for it. And if you're feeling good, just challenge everyone, really go for it. And yeah, who knows what could happen? Yes, Magnus Dietlev had a, a controversial bike penalty in Kona. And then he said that the, the wheels fell off on the run interestingly but it, I, I feel like it's left a, a bit of a bad taste in his mouth that he's carried all the way uh, since october to to now but it sounds like he's been putting a lot of effort in on his on his run as well but always known for a strong bike but i'm i'm very keen to see how he can maintain that pace he did a great job in dallas can he do it again here in ibiza yeah, leaving a bad taste in his mouth, but also a fire, a fire to come back from that. When you feel like you've been penalised unfairly, there's just that, it's so, it just gives you that anger. And he's, uh, it doesn't come across like that. He comes across as very cool and calm, but you can just hear him talk. He feels confident, the work he's putting in. And yeah, he's going to want to come here today. He's already had a second in a PTO tour race. And can he get to the top step today? Looks like that top four are edging the rest of the front pack a little bit there is of course magnus Dietlev with that signature monochrome white and black kit Yeah, Magnus Dickliff here could be using tactics. They are on the slight downhill now. It's going to be tougher for him to overtake. So when we see the turn at the bottom, that's when we might see him make his move and try and pass everyone. There he's going. He's passed in Ben Canute. Let's see. Magnus Dickliff is on the move, just part, slowly starting to pass for that front group. It's not going to be long before he's up to um, towards Jan Frodeno, Aaron Royal. We're hearing that Christian Blumenfeld has been able to hold on to Ditlev. But big moves for Magnus Ditlev. Seems to be dominating the narrative on the bike right now. Yeah, Christian Blumenfeld is in a brilliant position. I mean, I don't think he would have been too happy with his swim. Uh, he wasn't in a great position there. Magnus Dillard was actually really close to him, so I'd say big improvements from him and the swim over the winter. But uh, Blumenfeld's ride flawless so far. And I think it's interesting as well and probably very good for Christian Blumenfeld is he's not the one he's he's having to do the work because he's sat behind it left but he's not the one leading the charge he is still saving a bit of energy there he's just tucked in behind and really getting dragged to the front and as we have the Olympics looming over the 2023 season Christian Blumenfeld will have motivations or has got motivations to succeed on short course racing but it's just it just fascinates me how he can turn his uh, his skill set to 
all of the different disciplines. Uh, obviously, the race isn't done yet, but I'm, but I'm sure he's going to be there. Uh, we hope he'll be there because it's just going to make for such an exciting race. But yeah, he seemingly can do it all. Yeah, and there we see Magnus Ditlev. That's his rankings. So. 14th in the swim so i'd say he did that but he is first on the bike and, and he's showing that so far in this race and fourth on the run but oh, i don't know it, it's so hard i think he from listening to him talk i feel like he's moved on in the run over the winter it's uh he seems very confident and that's what makes this particularly exciting when you consider this is so early in the season, is it to echo your points earlier? There are a lot of unknowns. Those who train and race in the Southern Hemisphere have had quite an active time. They've put points on the board. Magnus Dietlev, this is his first race of 2023, I believe. So he's got the PTO number two position. That's on the back of a, a very strong 2022 season. And uh, he was actually 19th out of the swim. So falling back a little bit there, but again, like the strength of field is just phenomenal. Yeah, strength of field is phenomenal. And I'd say 14th that swim, but it also depends on time as well. And his time actually wasn't Very that far behind. So he was probably in a good group there too. So I think although the ranking is uh, the ranking's really important, it shows, it gives us a really good guide, doesn't it? And I think he's, uh, I think he would still be happy with that swim. And just to kind of layer that point, it must be so important for a lot of these athletes, particularly the younger ones who aren't quite so experienced as you Fredinos and your Alistair Brownleys, they've got to race their own race. How important is it not to get dragged into a firefight with some of these bigger names? Oh, it's tough. It's really tough. And I think sometimes you just got to go for it. And uh, like we see some of the younger athletes and are going to be in the field and just doing everything they can, trying to get out there competing. And although I say Tom Bishop is not um, really young and even um, Aaron Royal, they haven't been doing the longer distance for that long. They've only transitioned over to it in the last couple of years. So they are still learning as well. Yes, I mean, he hasn't featured in this, but uh, someone that uh, just comes to mind, that incredible finisher, Ironman Texas and Rudy Von Berg, you know, he really got caught in the moment and they had a, a huge sprint, uh, like a 3K sprint, I think he described it. So it can happen. And this is, uh, you know, respectfully, this, this has bigger blue chip names. Yeah, and this distance really plays to it with the 18 kilometer run. We really see the athletes closer together, closer together and really fighting for that finish. We're gonna take a break from the action here on the course and send it down to transition and to Alex. Alex, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, John. Yes, alongside Emma Snow. So we're talking all about the hype, the pressure, the expectation on Jan and your current priorities, keeping your kids out of the buffet. Out there. I mean, it's amazing how these days unfold, isn't it? Are they all right? Are they happy? Are they enjoying it? They're good to see Dad out there doing what he does? Oh, it's amazing. Like, honestly, it's been so long that they actually don't remember a race. I mean, they always hear he's training and we're like, well, we need you to understand what, what he's training for. And um, yeah, it's fantastic. They're at a, a much older age and they're able to comprehend and yeah, see him not just on the TV, which which is, yeah, it's a, it's a really special experience for them and him. And it's very special for everybody to see him out there doing what he does. We've seen him looking quite confident in the media, a lot of sort of presence about him, optimism, infectious enthusiasm. What's he been like in some of the quieter moments for you this week? <laughs> oh, look, it, 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 you know, he's a normal person. He's been extremely nervous. Um, it, you know, I think that's always a good sign. We always say, you know, it means you care a lot. Um, yeah, you, you have your doubts, you know, numbers and people, you know, it's always going on to me about who's doing what session what the last minute and um, yeah, he, at the end of the day, he, he's also, you know, an athlete that, that does worry about his own performance. But I think it, underneath it all, like, he's just so excited to race. Like, it's just been all week, like, I can't believe it's race week. I can't believe it's race week. And, and yeah, when you, when you love it like that, um, it's the most important thing over everything. Currently in sick, they're actually talking of six, 616 days since he last wow. crossed the finish line. Wow. I mean, it's a long time between okay. drinks, as he said. Tonight, what makes him a happy man? Is it the fact he's been out there and, and he will get hopefully get to the finish line, or has it got to be a victory? No, no. Look, honestly, he's just so happy to be out on race course. Um, he just wants to put it all together. I mean, yeah, it, didn't know it was that long either, but yeah, it's blowing the cobwebs out. It's just getting that body back into race mode. Like his head's in race mode, but it's a different story when you're out there and you're up against the competitors and for him he just he's he's in really good shape he's he's really strong he's really healthy he's really fit and i think he just wants to see what he can put together you know and and, and there you've got something to build upon so 
it, it's not about victory today. It's just literally about, you know, going out and putting good race forward. I mean, for sure, that's what he always is aiming for. Don't get me wrong. That's why he's out there. That's what he loves. And, um, yeah, he's a competitor at heart. And he won't leave anything, um, you know, no stone unturned out there. There's a little tell in the end there. Well, a very nice PR answer. I know he wants to be first across the finish line. Has he let you in on who he really wants to win, who wants to beat today? Look, you know, um, it's funny. You, 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 there's so many new faces and, and even, you know, the whole talk around Christian, you know, like they've never raced. And I think that's something that, you know, it's him, it's a challenge. Like he wants to know where he's at against Christian. Um, he's got Kyle, which he's training alongside of, that's, you know, keeping him on his toes in training. And it's not about one person. It's not one particular nemesis, you know. I think your own your own persona is, is the person you need to beat at the end of the day. So it's it's no one in particular. He, he really wants to just put his own good race together. Absolutely. It's interesting because there's so much hype around the three today. Who is the GOAT, whether it's Jan, Christian, Alistair. I just wonder whether, with your pedigree in the sport, the two of you ever pour a bottle of syrup and debate between the two of you which one is the GOAT. Has that been sorted out yet? Oh, he did He did take the first person to win the Olympic gold right. and win Kona. <laughs> Definitely was a, uh, a an aspiration of my own, so I have to give it to him. I think he's stepped up a notch. <laughs> do you feed in, though, in weeks like this with all your experience? and expertise or do you just let him get on with it? Um, I, I think we, we really do talk, I think um, maybe it's just his insecurities more than anything that come up I think in race week and, and like I said you know those sessions of what you know who's doing what and, and, and you can see sometimes how things start creeping into his head and I think um, what we both realise is that you know the sport is so much about the mind as well and I think you know I, I'm not involved in any of his training I obviously know what he's doing but I, I would never you know have a say in that but I think when it comes to uh, race mode and race week and just, you know, taking out the distractions and just reminding yourself of why you're here, what are you doing? And at the end of the day, getting back to your core belief of, of what you love. I've got to finish with this. We've got eight minutes to go until the women get underway. On days like this, do you miss it or are you very happy to leave it to others? Oh, I won't lie, I miss it. I, I look at the setups of the bikes now. I look at some of the athletes I used to race against. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's part of it. Like, I, I love competition. Like, and I think that's why I thrive so much um, and with you, with Jan and, and, and seeing what he does. Cause yeah, I, I live and breathe this sport and I love it as well. Tell you what we'll do. We'll find a babysitter, a bike, a swimming costume and we'll get you on the start line. All right. Give me or a few weeks. Uh, okay, okay. Well, we'll let you go back to the buffet and find the kids. Lovely to chat. Good luck to you and Thank your man. You. Thanks, Thanks. All the best. Great stuff there. So we are in the third lap of the bike leg, and the nine are in the lead group within about 17 seconds of one another as well. As we see Aaron Royal, who I'm not sure we expected to be right there in the middle of that that front pack, but he's riding hard here still in that third lap yeah aaron royal's in a good position uh, in the front group so that's a positive for him he rode really well in his race in gran canaria two weeks ago he's faded on the run was a bit disappointed with that but it's it's early in the season he feels like that was a kind of getting the getting the first race out of the way and hopefully coming here more prepared but alistair brownie there looking uh, really smooth and i think Third lap, they'll know now Ditlev is on the back of the group and what's going to happen on this lap. This is the lap where we could see someone trying to go off the front of the group. And you see there on your screens, we are counting down six minutes until the start of the women's race. They will all be in and around Ibiza at the same time. Very exciting and a real challenge for us, I would imagine, trying to flick between uh, the men's and women's races as the movers and shakers move around. Yeah, and I'm so excited about the women's race too. There is such a strong feel today, but we've been taken up with the men so far. I'm, I'm but so, so excited for this women's race. Like, oh, so many of the top 10 are here. I think it's eight out of the top 10. One of the best fields assembled at this distance. So it's going to be fireworks in hold the women's it, race hold too. Hold it together, hold it together. We've got so much to talk about, uh, both with the strength of the, the men and the women's field. Many, many narratives coming into both races. It's just... You know, all the adjectives, I'm sure, will be flowing as we uh, get deeper into both races. Uh, but just turning our attention back to Alistair Brownlee, I can't help but cast my mind back to the last PTO race that he did where it kind of fell apart for him on the run. But it did for a lot of people that day, actually. And I'm just sitting here thinking, you know, there's some good, some good power being put down on these bikes. I mean, 
be great to get an insight into that just to see how hard these guys are burning and how many of those matches are being burned as well. Yeah, really interesting. And so there is now nine in that front group. But I think, like, looking a little bit further back, the next group is Daniel Backergaard, Florian Angert and Frederick Funk. And they're only a minute 30 down. So, like, just with you saying what happened last time on the run in the Canadian Open where athletes were stopping, cramps going over, those athletes that aren't that far behind, a minute 30, they are within striking distance. They're not out of the race. It doesn't mean that the winners are going to come from this front group of nine. Fantastic stuff. This 100k distance, very, very exciting indeed. And it's kind of a flexible one as well, where you're pulling in short course races. And of course, those that favor the Ironman historically, who's suited better? Is it individual? Are it, there's just so many questions that are still being left uh, to ask and to be answered. And we're getting closer as we, we extend the PTO tour. Yes, yeah, so many questions at this distance, and I think it'll evolve. Like, it's only the second season of the PTO Open, so we've got three this year. It's just going to grow and grow, and we'll get to see who kind of comes out on top and who trains specifically for this distance. Yeah, last year we had the Canadian Open in Edmonton. We had the Collins Cup in Slovakia, the US Open in Irving, Texas. This year, the US Open moves to Milwaukee across the 4th and 5th of August. We have the Asian Open in Singapore as well. And a 19th and 20th, you know, bring a towel for that because that's going to be warm and sticky. So, yeah, opening up new continents, new challenges, but of course, opportunities for these top athletes. Opportunities. And I think I think Alistair Brownlee wished this had hurry happened a few years ago when he maybe wasn't kind of getting so injured. But I mean, when you look back at all of the results he's had, it's incredible. So we're just turning our attention now to the women's race. Time to get excited again, Helen, as we build up to one of the most incredible start lists we've seen in women's triathlon. I mean, look, Ashley Gentle, the queen of 100K there with Lucy Charles Barclays right there. Paula Finley, of course, maybe the greatest of all time in Daniela Reef. Annie Haugat, when you look at that list, Helen, I mean, how can you sum it up? Oh, it's absolutely ridiculous. There's just too many names to note, to note, and we kind of go further down the list, and there's lots of up-and-comers coming through as well. We've got Ellie Salthouse in there from Australia, and then Tamara even further Jewett. down, Didi Diedrich, Sif Madsen, the youngest athlete in the race. There are so many names to call out. I don't know who's going who's gonna to come out on top. Wearing number 206, ladies and gentlemen, PTO rank 6, current Ironman world champion from the United States of America, Chelsea Sonaro! <laughs> Wearing number 205, PTO ranked five from Germany, Anna Haug! Wearing number 204, PTO ranked fourth, ladies and gentlemen, from Switzerland, Daniela Reef. Wearing number 203, PTO ranked third from Canada, Paula Finley. Number 202, PTO rank two from Great Britain, Lucy Charles Barkley. And wearing number 201, PTO rank first winner of the 2022 Canadian and US Opens from Australia, Ashley Gentle.
so the ladies are towing the line there. They will step forward. Few just ahead of that line there, actually. Oh, we might have to just get everyone back. There we go. I think the sand had uh, come over that white line, but we're in position now. The women's race is just about to get going, and we are racing with the women as well. Analysts and fans have been celebrating this lineup as maybe the best ever. Ash Gentle, of course, looking to maintain her top spot in the PTO rankings and her 100% tour record. Can Daniela Reef prove once again she's the one to beat? And of course, Lucy Charles Barkley, an elite swimmer we're expecting to get out there ahead of the rest of the field. So many storylines, a lot to be excited about. And now the women and the men are on the course. It's all go, 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 Helen. It's all go, go, go. And I get those race nerves, even just watching them line up on the start. And my heart rate just goes up. And straight away, you see that silver cap of Lucy Charles Barkley straight to the front. You can see she's on the arrowhead closer to the screen. Yeah, we've got two packs, actually. So we had Ben Canute that was, I think, the lonesome staying out left, but a few of the women have decided to do that. A couple before, sorry, Helen, we got looking out for the orange cap of Gentle, silver of Charles Barkley, Paula Finley's in the teal, Daniela Reef in the yellow, and Annie Haug is in the red, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just saying that I think the favourites all kind of lined up on the right of the beach as they were looking at the beach, and then some of the lower-ranked athletes, but maybe with a good swim, went far left, and they're just trying to get some clear water and get as close to that front as possible. But it's a tough ask when Lucy Charles Barkley's in the race. But we, we spoke about uh, the, the drafting, of course, with the bike, but you, you can get a little draft on the hip and on the toes of, as well in the water, and that is permitted, of course. Yes, that is permitted, and it's so much easier. Like, the amount of energy you save tucked in behind someone on the feet or even on the hip is in, is absolutely incredible but I think the problem for the women is they've got to be able to get to Lucy she is that good a swimmer we've seen a couple of races where athletes have come out close to her we've seen um, Beck Clark from New Zealand and she's got close but it's really tough to get close to her and with the wetsuits today people do have more of a chance but I think this is one of the certainties that Lucy will be out front so just a reminder that LCB is out in the silver cap. This is her first race of 2023. She's proclaimed to be getting closer to her 2021 race shape. Very confident, but still it's slightly unknown how she's going to turn out here in this 100 kilometer race. Yeah, it is unknown. I mean, she's um She's always really open about her training. She's great on social media. She's she's such an she's such an accessible, interesting, fun person to watch. And I lo just love the way she races. She lines up on the start line. She knows she's going for it. I mean, it's the one certain in the women's race today is that Lucy's going to take out the swim hard. And here she is doing that. And she has been up at altitude training. She said she's had a really good training block. And if she is close to that 2021 form, I mean, that was insane. I mean, that world championship she won, the half Ironman world championships. She had the fastest swim, the fastest bike, the fastest run. She, I mean, she obliterated the field. So to think she's getting close to that shape is very exciting. So also in the field is Dr. Els Visser. She has been clinging on to the podium in her last four races, but back in 2014, she was clinging on to something quite different. I was a medical student and I did lots of traveling during my studies. Um, so I did an internship in South Africa and the year after I did another internship in Indonesia. And I was traveling there for three months. And then with one week to go, I just had my dive certificate and I thought, well, let's go on a boat trip and to finish this uh, backpack tour. Um, so yeah, I went on a four day trip and then on the second night, we were in the middle of the ocean and the weather just like changed around. It was like super extreme. And yeah, I was already like super sick from like the extreme weather. And around 11 p.m. it was that the guide, he came upstairs and he said, um, everybody wake, um, put your life jackets on. There's a hole in the boat. We are making water. We are in the middle of the ocean and no one know that we are here. And the boat was so simple that there was no equipment to reach out to people. A really big wave came in and we were all smashed into the ocean. Um, luckily we all had like life jackets and the water was kind of, yeah, the temperature saved our life. 
Yeah, in the end we waited for the whole night and for me it was like really uh, terrifying and I was so cold and there were like so many waves coming over me. When the sun came up we saw an island in the far distance. All the other people said no else don't go for that swim, it's like too far away, the ocean is too strong and you're never going to make that swim. A second night in the ocean I, I'm not going to survive that so the only chance I have is trying to go for this swim. So yeah, I left together with four other people. And uh, after I would say an hour of swimming, our group became separated and I was left with Gaylin, a lady from New Zealand. And you were just like swimming and swimming and swimming for the entire day and just before sunset um, in the end, my feet hit, hit the sand and we were on land. Wild. Oh, just an incredible story. Like, it's mind-blowing and it's what led her to triathlon because after an event like that you just thought you've got to follow your dreams, you've got to go for it, never look back and that's what's got her to this level. I mean, just what an incredible story. Every day's a blessing and nothing that she's going to encounter out there in that water is just pales into insignificance when you consider what she's been through. Although you could say that Lucy Charles Barkley's a real shark out there, it's uh, the biggest threat. She's uh, definitely pushing on and pushing the pace. Um, it's got choppy out there. I just noticed that as Lucy Charles Barkley rounded that boy, you could see the waves out there. So that will suit some of the athletes. The, the, athletes, the athletes that grow up in Australia, like an Ashley Gentle, you're used to swimming in the ocean. You don't mind the waves battering you about a bit. But maybe some of the weaker swimmers might struggle as the conditions out there have got a bit choppier. So we are coming up to six and a half minutes into this swim, which may consequently, due to the conditions, be a little bit slower than what we were anticipating. As we see the silver cap of Lucy Charles Barkley, the current PTO number two ranked athlete. She didn't think that she was going to get anywhere close to that in 2022 after the surgery that she had in rehabilitation, but she absolutely crushed her recovery and still managed to post some excellent results at the back end of the last season. Uh, her season last year was absolutely incredible. I mean, she had, I mentioned earlier, that amazing performances, just so many performances in 2021 to talk about. Then to come off, such, she had such a bad injury. She was out for such a long time. She came back with a bang. She won the World Track and Long Distance event. Then she got into, um, then she did third in the US Open. So it was such an incredible comeback for her. And I think she's definitely taken the time over this winter to really build a solid base because last year she was just racing off very little kind of winter training. She just didn't get that in with the yeah. injury. Yeah. And it was a career threatening injury as well to her hip. So we're going to take a look over at the men's race and it's Max Newman who is now leading out the men on the bike. Yeah, that's a big move there from Max Newman. We've got Max Newman, Kyle Smith, Alistair Brownlee. They are in a group of three. They have 20 seconds over Magnus Ditlev at the last check. So, yeah, it's all happening at the front of that race. So, as I said a little earlier on, our social team are hot on this race as well. So, if you've got a spare tablet or phone to put up by the side of your screen so you can listen to us of course but you can check in with what's going on elsewhere in the field there is a blog that the social team are, are working on and of course you'll have the tracker as well to keep a keep an eye on your favorite athletes See there in the women's swim, there is a couple of people around Lucy Charles Barkley. It's always hard from the angle from the beach to see what that gap is, but the women do seem to maybe having a bit of trouble sighting. There is, they're going off in different directions, so someone is obviously on a better line than someone else. We'll, we'll know when they come in for that Aussie exit, and the athletes get a good look at each other and see exactly where they are. Oh, there's Ditlev as well. He's passing. Uh, that's he's passing Aaron Royal. And Aaron Royal's out the saddle, Ditlev just turning those legs over. Yes, yeah, so smooth, in control. And he, ha But he has got a gap now. There is open road in front of him to that front group of three. It's not a very big gap, but there is a gap there. So things definitely hotting up on the bike as the conditions get choppy out on the water around some of the beautiful beaches here in Ibiza breathtaking scenery around here lots of secluded beaches not 
here though at Figueiredo's Beach where we start this course. This isn't where we finish, we finish a few kilometers along. So we've, uh, we, we've split the crowds. We've got some here down with us where we're located actually, close to the swim starts. And just a reminder, it's a two lap swim. So you see them going back into the beach. It's an Aussie exit. So those that don't understand what that is, it's a, a, a dodgy little dash across the beach. Hopefully you keep your footing before you uh, run back into the water. It makes it incredibly hard because you're in your horizontal position and suddenly you're vertical and sprinting and then back into the water and swimming. So it's a really tough uh, ask for the athletes. And I mentioned the social team. They've been uh, running and they've been keeping it very close uh, to their chest as well. The Mystery Pro Initiative, who we see pop up on the socials every now and then, and they've made their predictions. I say they, I'm not sure if it's a he, a she, or, or many. Uh, the predictions they have for the women. So Lucy Charles Barkley, he, she, they believe, will be top spot, followed by Chelsea Sodaro and Ashley Gentle. I mean, all of those women are undeniable. Uh, is that how you potentially see it? I mean, we can, you could see it that way for sure. I didn't do my predictions for this race. It's just too hard. There was just too many women to choose from. And we see they haven't put a podium down for Danielle Lariff. And that is such a big, big call, isn't it? Nine-time world champion, not on the podium. Yeah, difficult to pick this one. And I know we, we've said it a number of times before, but you made such a strong point earlier. The fact that this is May, this is the start of the season. People have ambitions. But for many of the races, we, you know, but this is a big one. The tour opener, it's, it's gone on a lot of excitement from the athletes themselves, as well as the, the triathlon community at large. And uh, we're, we're really getting a good idea of, of what's to come for the rest of the year. Yeah, and I listened to some interviews with Holly Lawrence, and she said, why has she come to this race? Because she could have, she lives, uh, she's based over in Boulder in the US. She could have stayed in the US and did a race, but she's like, I want to race the best. And the nightlife. She wants yeah. to come here for the night. <laughs> maybe the too, partying right? afterwards, maybe <laughs> there's a plan afterwards, after party somewhere. But she's just, they're all driven by wanting to come out and race the best in the world. And this is what we've got here today, even though it's, it is, like they say, a little bit earlier in the season. I think it's fantastic so lucy charles barkley surfing into the beach as we see her exit the water and she'll run around and get straight back in being careful of her footing yeah she's opened up a good gap already hasn't she the two athletes behind her i mean she's back in the water and swimming when those two are coming out that's lucy's first who are those second two athletes they're not any of our colored caps could be some an athlete like Fenella Lambridge. Uh, we've got oh, Lottie Wilms and Rebecca Clark. So two of the best swimmers in the field. Actually, they're the only two swimmers that have ever come out, apart from Taylor Nib, who's not here. They've only ever come out with her. So that's, a, that's about right. But now we've got a big group coming out. This will be where some of the other favorites are in that larger group. 111 pace as well for Lucy Charles Barkley. India Lee is 40 seconds back, as is Fenella Langridge and Sara perez Sala. Do you know, that is a great swim for India Lee. I mean, to be in the, in a group with Fenella Langridge, Sara Perez, Pal Sala and Holly Lawrence. I mean, that's uh, the swim of India Lee's life. That's amazing if she can stay up there. Uh, Louisa Baptista then coming out in eighth. Ashley Gentle a minute down. That's not too bad for Ashley Gentle. Not maybe the swim pace we saw in some of her other races, but she's uh, still in a good position there. Annie Haug at 111 down. Tam Tamara Dewitt as well. She's in that main group. That is a key. I think she is one of those feared runners out in the women's field today. Oh, 100%. She's been making all the headlines recently with her efforts full-time professional now as well that's uh, that's recent so we're going to be seeing i would imagine uh, real big improvements and big gains in her performances yeah we would expect so i mean she's got that full focus on being a professional triathlete now but and we saw those gains she made earlier on in the season where she swam in a really good group a lot of people maybe thought that was a bit of a fluke uh, maybe she she was a one-off the field one was strong but so far in the swim she's put herself in a good position and Daniela Reef is on the back of that group as well, so also in a good position. And the races in the past few years where we've seen Daniela not be on the top, because she's normally either on the top or maybe quite far down the field, she 
is the swim where she's come unstuck. But for her today, she started off really well. She's in that main group. She's with Paula Finley. She's with Chelsea Sodaro. Emma Pallant Brown's in there as well. There are just too many names in this field. What kind of psychology is there when you're a, a Lucy Charles Barkley who's leading from the front? You know, there's never, there's never ever anyone ahead of her in the water. It's uh, it's not many athletes have the chance because they're just not as good as Lucy to actually be in that position attacking off the front. It takes a very strong mentality. We just see in the men's field there, we've got Ditlev and he's he's right up there. He's right up to that lead group of three and it looks like he's going to be attacking past them now. Yeah, he had to come off the gas there as he tries to, looks to make his pass. But going back to Lucy Charles Barkley, I don't think she's ever been anything other than first out of the water in her professional triathlon races. No, I don't think she's been a thing. She did so, do some short course racing. I think maybe one of them she wasn't, but even then she makes an impact. I mean, that's the versatility of Lucy Charles Barkley. She's done everything from Super League, really short, intense racing, all the way up to the iron distance. And she does incredibly well at every, um, every kind of distance. And you actually shared a, an interview with me where she was hoping to pull some athletes with her in the swim so that they can get a gap on those that are particularly strong, not just the bike, but but more specifically the run. Yeah, it was a really interesting interview because I've always thought she'd just rather go off the front for the whole way, that individual time trial. But I think today, if she does have a few athletes with her, then maybe if they can put in more time to the runners that they fear, like Tamara Dewitt, Annie Haug, it would be ideal to get that group away. But I also think that shows Lucy's got a lot of confidence in her run because if other people are around her, she's got to outrun them. And I think she feels she can, the shape she's currently in. So looking out for the orange cap of Ashley Gensel, the teal cap of Paula Findlay. Daniela Reef is in the yellow. Annie Haug is in the red. Chelsea Sodaro in the white. So if you spot those, but it is the shiny silver cap of Lucy Charles Barkley that is way out in front. She rides the waves, looking to come back into the beach and get into T1. I'm just having a note that the top four men are about 15 seconds ahead of the chasers. Yeah, that, that top four is currently Kyle Smith, Alistair Brownlee, Max Newman and Magnus Ditlev has joined them. And the athletes that are currently kind of following from the last timing check, we've got Aaron Royal, Tom Bishop and Jan Frodeno. They are about 10, 15 seconds behind that lead group currently. Christian Blumenfeld is at 30 seconds back, but in the group with Jan Fredino. Yeah, well, there you go. You wanted to see uh, Fredino and Blumenfeld race, and currently Blumenfeld will have eyes on Jan Fredino. See how long they are side by side and how that translates as they pass through T2. Exciting stuff. Obviously, we've spoken about it before. We've got three Olympic champions, the last three Olympic champions, all on the course together with the men. The first time they've all raced one another. A very exciting lineup indeed. And a lot will be written after this race. And so far, we're getting what we want. All the top three, <laughs> those top three, those Olympic gold medalists, they're all in the top eight. They are there, they are together. It would be fantastic to see them hitting the run at a really similar time. Super exciting stuff. Uh, but with that, you, you've got a bunch of other athletes that are looking to steal the limelight from the, the big names. So everyone has been talking about those, those three, but guys like Magnus Dietlev can just take the rub. They can steal the thunder of this European Tour race and really stamp their authority and put themselves in the, the minds of, of the fans as the ones to really be watching as we get deeper into 2023 and beyond. Yeah, I, exactly what you just said. And they are the ones that have come in a little bit more under the radar, which is amazing that Magnus Ditlev comes in under the radar. But we're talking about all the Olympic gold medalists, but he has the ability to completely upset everyone this season and win every race, the form that he seems to be coming in with and how we've seen him ride so far. And there always seems to be a, a real outlier. 
there's someone else that's going to feature in this that we perhaps didn't expect to. Someone who we were speaking less of than even uh, the likes of, of Magnus, maybe 18 months ago, who might just make a have a breakthrough performance. And, and that's just exciting as well, particularly at this middle distance, which has such a lot of room to grow. It really does have so much room to grow. And yeah, I just it's, it's thrilling to see these athletes up there really battling. So early, I mean, we're into the into the bike quite heavily now. So early thoughts on how you think that Jan Fredino and, and Alistair Brownlee are shaping up? I'd say as expected, both swimming and riding well. And traditionally, because they've both had injuries, they've been lower leg injuries, they would still have had the ability to probably swim and ride as much as they wanted. It's going to be the run where that form really tells. But the fact that they're up there really driving the pace, I think shows that they've They've definitely got that fire there, and it, it's just all going to come down to the run. But they've put themselves in the best position to win. We've, they've put themselves in the best position to have this kind of battle that we've all been talking about. And under 15 kilometers to go to transition for the men. We are just privileged to have Alistair Brownlee and Jan Fredino, both racing here, both in the top 10 at the moment. Alistair Brownlee pretty much at the front there with Jan Fredino 25 seconds back. Helen, that was kind of what you expected. Of course, Alistair Brownlee just notorious for going out hard at the front. Yeah, and Alistair Brownlee was down to race Ironman South Africa earlier this year and it was in great shape. I mean, we'd seen all the posts, he was in flying, he'd had a big training camp in Spain, was doing really well, and he actually pulled out last minute with a niggle in his hip. And I think that must have been so frustrating for him because we felt like he was in that really good shape. We were going to see a good performance. So I suppose the question is, has how much running has he been able to do since then? Was it a minor blip? Has he been back into training quickly? So it's going to be exciting to see. But even if he hasn't had the run prep, an Alistair, unprepared Alistair Brownlee can still win races. He's that good and he has that mental strength that he can get out there and still win. He can absolutely obliterate fields. And I'm looking at the, the tracker here. It's on your screen. Brownlee has made his move. I'm not sure if it's the move, but he's certainly made a move. And he has reassumed the front of the race once again with Carl Smith uh, dropping in behind him. You've got Newman, Ditlev, Bishop from the UK, Aaron Royal as well, and of course, Jan Fredino is still in that pack, but nearly 30 seconds back off of Brownlee. Yeah, and then Christian Blumenfeld another 10 seconds back. But this would be, they're on the last lap now. This is the last lap they're heading out to the turnaround. So this is the slight uphill section. So if Brownlee was going to make a move to get that extra kind of 10 or 15 seconds, this is probably the best place to do it. Back in the water and Lucy Charles Barkley, as expected. A signature swim from her, just under 23 minutes into the swim. She looks to bring it back into T2. She'll keep that boy on her left. And she'll go through the chute and she'll leap on the bike and take to the streets of Ibiza. Yeah, she's taken a slightly different path to the two athletes behind, which was Beck Clark and Lottie Wilms at our first time check. So one of the routes, she, at least she's aiming straight for that yellow boy and will then head in, whereas Lottie and, and Beck are just slightly wider. But I don't think any one path is faster. It just, I'm just noticeable how much choppier it's got. We will see um, slightly slower times, I think, just comparatively to the men, because it has really picked up. It's been a tougher swim for the women. And it was about 21.3 degrees Celsius, uh, the measurements, just before the gun went off for the men. So I think they had an optional wetsuit, of course. The wetsuit gives you added buoyancy, so everyone opted for it. I think we, Lucy Charles Barley could have swum non-wetsuit and probably still let out, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just the speed that she has. But uh, yeah, you, you wouldn't go non-wetsuit if, uh, if everyone else is wearing a wetsuit. A significant disadvantage. We're going to take a pause from the action here. We're going to send it down to our colleague Vicky, who's in transition. 
Yeah, I'm here with Reese Barkley down here in transition. We've not got long now before we see Lucy come through. Reese, you've been doing a little bit of pacing up and back. Is it nerve-wracking waiting for your wife? You're an athlete yourself. What's more nerve-wracking, the, the, the supporting or the racing? Uh, for sure, supporting is far more nerve-wracking than when I race myself. Uh, yeah, I've been pacing up and down. I think Lucy's just coming out of the water now. So, yeah, she's had a good start. Um, Wetsuit swim, so it makes the, uh, the group much closer together. But, yeah, it looks like she's off to a really good start. She's still got a decent gap, and I guess that really is business as usual for Lucy. We were expecting that. So nothing to see here, really. The wetsuit swim, does she mind that? Um, I think she prefers a non-wetsuit because it makes the gaps bigger. But she also swims very fast in a wetsuit. So, yeah, I think it's... Um, it's, it's probably early, too early in the season for non-wetsuit swims, but for sure later on it starts warming up. It'll be wetsuit swims all round. Well, just behind you here, we can turn and have a look and see Lucy coming into her transition spot. Let's just see how she deals with this. So just a small fumble of the suit there, but that was pretty smooth. Pretty smooth all around there. Just a little, a little bit of a fumble there. Yeah. Will she be pleased with that, do you think? Uh, I don't think she'll be thinking too much about that. She'll just be concentrating on getting up the road and settling in. Probably thinking a little bit about putting on some nutrition that she's lost in the swim. Um, and settling down. Probably that's the most nerve-wracking point coming from swim. Uh, onto the bike so the adrenaline will be pumping and she'll just settle down into a rhythm now and hopefully have some good legs on the bike. So she's spoken about how of course she's an all-round athlete now but there are certain gun runners that she doesn't want to start the run with. She'd like a little bit of a buffer on. Yeah. Has she got a tactic here? Is it just flat out or is there a certain element of working the hills or the downhills? Has she got something in mind? To be honest I think Lucy's strategy on this distance is just flat out from start to finish. You certainly don't want to be coming into T2 with the likes of Annie Haug. Uh, Tamara Jewett is a phenomenal runner. There's so many absolutely amazing talent in the women's field right now. You, you probably couldn't call the top 10. Um, so yeah, Lucy's game plan will literally just be go as hard as she can and just see where that ends up. Well, she's token a little bit about blowing the cobwebs, but I've seen that glint in her eye and I think she's got a good result in her today. So we'll let you get back out and cheer for her and we'll hand back over. So Lucy exited the water 24-19, but her husband Reese there is saying that T1's the more nervy transition. Is that the same for everyone? Uh, if you're wearing a wetsuit, yes, because you've got that stress of getting the wetsuit off. I actually thought Lucy's wetsuit came off really fast, which is good. Sometimes you get the feet stuck in, it's just a bit of a panic. But she was really smooth and calm, even though a couple of things went wrong. I think she really kept her cool. But now she's onto the bike and just doing what? Lucy Charles Barkley does and that's really pushing the pace and those athletes behind they have to work very hard to get to her that group is um, you know a minute 30 down there's two athletes at 30 seconds pretty much 30 seconds and a minute 30, it's, it's a big gap already and she's got well 20 seconds to number two uh, Lottie Vilms like, is, is that enough do you think that she would have wanted to have seen more than 27 seconds as she was coming out the water or is she, has she got eyes on particular athletes that she was looking to get? I think it's particular athletes. The athletes that are going to make a move on the bike. The athletes like Paula Findlay, who is about 2.16 down. We've got to look a bit further down. Chelsea Sodaro, Daniela Reef, Annie Howe. They, they're 2.45 down, so there, there we see are. them in transition. It's, it's, you know, it's nearly three minutes. I think they're the athletes Lucy wants. Uh, well, Daniela is the athlete that Lucy would like to know where she is for the bike section. And what a pairing that is coming out of transition, Annie Haug and Daniela Reef. Yeah, some of those athletes lost a lot of time over the second lap. You see Lucy must have really pushed the pace and the choppy conditions. There were the athletes that lost big time chunks over that lap. So look at that, Annie Haug and Daniela Reef, Reef like essentially 2.45 down on Lucy Charles Barkley. And then Tamara Jewett, another 45 seconds behind 
Annie Haug. Yeah, and that's what we see. She was she was up there in that first lap, but really slipped down. So that's, um, I think a lot of athletes would be very happy to see that. The Tamara Stewart has gone down that five. They do get that time check, but the athletes that we'd see want to see probably in the making a move on the bike would be athletes like Holly, Holly Lawrence and Paula Finley. And it's going to be interesting how all of these groups kind of come together because they're, they're very spread out at the moment. I think that was probably expected for Tamara Jewett to be that far back at this stage. This is obviously the weaker part of her race. And we know that she can certainly uh, bridge that gap, but it is deeper into the race that she does that. And Lucy Charles Barkley will be looking to put as much tarmac between her and the likes of Tamara Jewett, Ashley Gentle, and all the other strong runners that we see that will be putting on there or tying the laces a little later on. Yeah, with, with the lead that Lucy Charles Barkley has, I mean, heading out into transition, she's got, you know, yeah, it could be one of those days when no one catches her. This is a really good start for her. And just putting some eyes uh, further along on the bike course and the men. And Alistair Brownlee is still out in front. Carl Smith in second. Max Neumann, Newman, apologies, in third. Magnus Dietlev in fourth. And that is a, a pretty close group together. Then a 30 seconds behind that, Thomas Bishop. A few seconds back on that, Aaron Royal. And then 10 seconds behind those guys, Jan Frodeno. So it's opening up with the men. It really is, yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's all happening at the front of the race here. And as we see the women here, we see the chasers, Lottie Wilms and Beck Clark. They are the two athletes that within, they were the closest ones to Lucy Charles Barkley. Now, Rebecca Clark, she's from New Zealand. She's already got three races done this year, so maybe that gives her a bit of an advantage coming into this race. Maybe that's why we see her having that good swim as well. She's kind of got that race out of her system, but a really good start for her. And it'll be just looking maybe to work with Lottie Wilms and see if they can uh, kind of keep within touching distance of Lucy Charles Barkley. And also look for the people coming from behind. Who's coming from behind? Are they being able to, going to be able to work with them when they catch up? Look at the difference there. We've still got a couple of athletes coming out the swim, so there are some huge gaps. Yeah, that is a big old difference. Obviously, tough, tougher conditions out there in the water for some over others. Yeah, some of the athletes are really struggling there, but not at the front. Here's Lucy Charles Barkley dialed in into a position, and she'll just be looking to drive forward. I think benefit of Lucy being out front is that she can get to the front, she can just get down onto her bars and she knows what she's got to do. Whereas all the athletes behind, they're all with others, they have to almost jostle for position, who's going to take the lead in the group at a certain time, you have to think about the passing, there's a lot more thought process that goes into it. Whereas Lucy's away and clear, she doesn't have to think about it, she can just get her head down. And there is Lucy Charles Barkley out in first, maintaining that gap of 27 seconds to Lottie Vilms. I think Fenella Langridge there coming out in fourth position, that's a really interesting one. Fenella in Hawaii Ironman World Championships last year was rode up to Lucy. I mean, she maybe didn't have such a big gap, but she had that bike strength. She rode up to Lucy. They rode a long portion of the bike together. So she's an athlete we may see be able to make that difference and jump over. So Lottie Wilms is in good form. She raced the 70.3 Geelong back in March. She was third on the podium there. So she has already got some experience this season. Yeah, Lottie Wilms as well. She did do the last two PTO Opens. So the best was 12th in the US Open. So she has got the experience at this distance and also the experience with the big occasion because it's, you know, it feels big when you're down there. There's a buzz on the carpet. It's a really professional looking transition. So I actually think the more of the PTO races you've done, the better able you're going to be able to be to deal with the situation, the, I suppose, the spectacle of the occasion. Yes, she's very active as well. I think she raced uh, 10 times uh, last season. So she's uh, she put, a, put together a, a very strong schedule. She, she was a, a DNF at Challenge Wanaka, the half distance race uh, earlier this year, but she was on the podium for Ironman Western Australia back in December. So a lot of podium places, I think three for three now. 
I mean, here we see they're back to the men. We've got Kyle Smith, still that group. Kyle Smith, Alistair Brownlee, Max Newman, and Magnus Ditlev. So Magnus Ditlev hasn't made the move and gone past the other athletes, but he is still in that group of four. But they look like they've put oh, they've put a good amount of time into the into the chasers. And I suppose the big one on there is Christian Blumenfeld, who is now a minute down. Didn't expect to see that because we saw Christian Blumenfeld pretty much get to the front group. I thought once he was there, he wasn't going to let anyone get away, but really hasn't been able to hold that pace and has drifted back. Well, he is still very close, just a few seconds away from a lot of people's greatest triathletes of all time, Jan Frodeno. They were close to one another in the studio earlier this week and it was a, an interesting conversation i felt at times like yan given his uh, physical stature almost looked like he was kind of like the big brother at times and uh, he certainly is not shy in coming forward you know the, the the senior veteran campaigner letting everyone know that he's going nowhere yeah, it was a really interesting dynamic between the two of them. And I feel like, and Christian said, like when he first started, Jan Frodeno was the one on the, he was in front of all the magazines it was back then. He was the one that everyone was looking about and talking about. So it's a very long way to go before you sat in a room together, kind of giving back and forth banter. Really, really interesting journey there. One thing that we haven't spoken about with, with Christian, I'm sure we'll get into it more, is just the scientific approach that that is more than the most others him and and gustav eden along with their coach just seem to really rely on that it's uh, it's a i guess every percentage differences i'm probably not explaining myself very well here but every percentage counts but they are really leaning into the science and looking at breaking down barriers just to prove uh, that doing it their way the norwegian method i think it's been coined yeah it's just churning out the most incredible results. Yeah, the Norwegian method and, and the results are incredible, aren't they? With Christian Blumenfeld, I mean, Olympic gold medalist, um, Ironman world champion, Ironman podium, 17.3 world champion, all within, I think, 18 months. I mean, it's a ridiculous amount of results in such a short space of time. And Jan Frodeno's done it, but it's taken a longer time. So it's just, just different the way it's been done, but they have that down to the Norwegian method. That's how he's managed to do so many different good results in such a short space of time over such different distances. I want to know Helen's method. You reeled off all of his achievements without looking down at your paper once. Very impressive. <laughs> yeah, well, Christian Blumenfeld's achievements, they're quite easy to remember now, but I think as a fan of the sport, that's why I mean, I used to compete, but now a fan and, and watching it and watching the short course, I mean, I've watched him winning the Olympic gold medal in such a dominant performance and he can do it in a lot of different ways but I admire that ability to calculate when he's racing and know what his capacity is know what his limit is and we see he's a minute down now but it could I'm not sure if it's planned but he'll know the ability what his ability is on the run what he thinks he can pull back on Magnus Ditlev or yeah it's always the calculating and the tactics all coming into play and it's, you really respect that in an athlete yeah and how important is is the the tactical side, the strategic side, because as we know it, it, in triathlon, things can go wrong, particularly the bike. There's a mechanical element to it as well. And you have to have that mental fluidity to be able to change things up. Yeah, you have to be able to cope with the pressure, keep calm. And I think we saw that earlier with Frederick Funk. I mean, he was he was just standing there waiting for his bike to be fixed. I mean, you the just you just want to be throwing things around the transition area, <laughs> wouldn't you? It's just so I think you have to have that ability to remain calm, deal with every scenario, kind of deal with the we used to call it dealing with the what ifs. What if this happens? What if that happens? Having a plan, kind of knowing where you're going with it. I think that can really help that mental preparation before the race. So Smith has taken the top spot from Brownlee. It's been interchangeable for most of the bike leg so far. Ditlev at the back of that group. Very interesting to see what his ambitions are on the bike to the run. He's talking very confidently about his run. So maybe that's just allowing him to settle rather than really going for it here in the bike and making a significant move. 
Yeah, I keep saying like I, that quiet confidence, and I think he's really happy with the speed his run has, how much his run has come on over the winter, and he's put in a big effort to get to this front group. I mean, it, he was he was over a, he was a minute thirty down at the start of the bike, so he's had to put in more effort than the front group. So it's probably a wise move to maybe sit there, consolidate, maybe make sure he's got all the nutrition he needs, he's in the right place, rather than kind of trying to blast past. And this is what we talked about earlier: is people maybe spending their matches and going too hard too early. It looks like he's really timed it well. And we're just getting note before we turn our attention to Lucy Charles Barkley that the pace of the front group is dropping off a little bit because the chasers are starting to eat into that gap as Lucy Charles Barkley looks to come out of the tunnel, remembering that it's a four loop bike course. So it's a battle for fitness in 2022 for the former 70.3 world champion. And despite exceeding expectations, the former PTO number one wants her place back at the top. Dallas was a difficult race for me. Quite a lot of things went wrong in the race. Obviously, there was the whole water bottle saga, which um, I actually don't want to think about. I don't want to repeat. I actually do not have a rear bottle cage on my bike anymore. So this cannot happen, which is great news. I definitely had the injury behind me after racing in the World Triathlon long distance. That was kind of brush off the cobwebs, get back into racing. Um, and Dallas was on the way to Kona. So I had another big race to think about. But actually, Dallas was brutal. The heat was like nothing I've ever experienced so to actually have all those things go wrong then be able to cope with the heat and still make the podium at the end um, I was happy with, with that result but I definitely wouldn't, wouldn't want to relive that race for sure. I've had a taste of world number one it felt like it was quite short-lived and then I got injured but actually after last year's injury to come back and still get back to world number two was pretty amazing but I always do like to strive for more so being that close to the top always makes you really really hungry to get that top spot so I feel in really good shape I feel like I've had a good block of work and this is going to be the first race of the season for me so I'm trying to not put too much pressure on it but I'm someone who does love to race and I'm hoping that we're going to see something good that's going to set the year off well. I mean Ashley's been phenomenal over the 100k distance she's undefeated at the moment so she's definitely setting the bar for what we need to achieve in this distance and it's nice to kind of have that carrot out in front to try and chase but I think there's a few people that could win this race so it's an exciting time for our sport. Focus, focus, focus from Lucy Charles Barkley and Helen. When she was just recounting that Dallas race, I was on commentary for that one. And uh, Vicky was sitting next to me. We couldn't believe what we were seeing with, with the bottle. Oh, I know. I mean, I'm glad she hasn't got it here today. For it those just... that was it, explain what was happening, because it was painful to watch. Well, Lucy Charles Barkley had her water bottle on the back, so a rear water bottle, and she was trying to do get it under the saddle, and she just kept missing. She just couldn't get it in, and uh, unfortunately dropped it, and it was... Uh, Oh, it was painful to watch, wasn't it? Yeah, because she was struggling with it and almost juggling the bottle a number of times. It was a very horizontal cage that she had. And that is that is obviously gone now. And we actually see uh, Race Ranger in place there, a reminder about that system, which is in play here in Ibiza. That is to enforce the, the drafting. It is a traffic light system. I think that Helen knows the, the colors better than I do. Is it, there's a, it changes color as you get closer. So when you're red, that's you got to go, you got to pass. Yeah, there's a light system. So if you move in and you see the light in front of you flashing red, you have to move out of it. And blue, you're getting close, yellow, you're fine. So there's a bit of technology going into it, but it's a really good tool for the athletes to have to make sure this race is as fair as possible. Yeah, great to see that. It's a long time coming, uh, Race Ranger technology. I know that the guys from New Zealand have been working on that for a, for a very long time, and we're excited about the impact it's going to have on this uh, non-draft racing that we have here, particularly the PTO. That's India Lee we see there on screen. So she's currently um, 
sat in, I think she's sat, oh, she's in second position. Yes, yeah, so she's a minute 12 down. So she's pulled back a little bit of time on Lucy Charles Barkley. So excellent ride in there from India Lee. She had a great race earlier this year. She did Ironman um, Lanzarote 7.3. She was second there to Annie Howe. She was a long way behind. Um, she was a long way behind Annie Haug, but she still had an incredible performance. It's just Annie Haug's performance was absolutely off the scale. Uh, yes, to say the least. She just uh, just keeps on getting better. Uh, so here is the transition times brought to you by Garmin. And uh, there's a name that's not on there. Lucy Charles Barkley. You said it was a smooth transition, Helen, but she doesn't feature in the top ten. Uh, I think smooth as in that she didn't panic, sure. but there was a few yeah. things that went wrong. She of couldn't course, quite yes. clip up the helmet. The um, She got a little bit stuck with her race suit, but I mean, she didn't panic and she was very good at that. But yeah, we see there Anne Reichman had the fastest transition, but pretty close together. But you can see that I know it doesn't have a huge impact, but you just don't want to give away five or ten seconds. And look, T2 now for the men. This is going to be very interesting indeed. We're talking transition. Who gets it down the smoothest? And uh, again, we have to consider, you know, keeping a tidy transition here. Everything goes in the box. 40 seconds ahead of the chase group. There's Ditlev there just putting his bike in. Kyle Smith heading out. First out, Kyle Smith. Good transition, see that short course practice. Ditlev just struggling a little bit with that shoe. Gone with no socks, interestingly. Some of them have socks on, some don't. Max Newman as well, just a little bit slower. Kyle Smith really got a good few seconds advantage there. Very fast through transition. And forgive me, I don't, have I we seen Brownlee? Yeah, yes. Brownlee's there, just in front of Smith. Oh, he flew through. Yeah, I'm not sure if he's ahead of Smith or he's, he's passed him already, but they were they were both pretty close. Maybe that short course background coming into play where every second really does count in transition. And there is Christian Blumenfeld coming into transition. He's got a bit of work to do on the run. He's going to know he's got to pull back that gap. They've got 40 seconds up the road. See there, that's Aaron Royal just getting ready. Tom Bishop sat down. He always sits down in transition. That's not something wrong. It's just uh, says his hamstrings cramping. Picture on your left, already in the streets of Ibiza, the old town, wonderful sights. Expecting lots of, well, we see there already, lots of support for these top athletes. And for Denno and Blumenfeld running out together. <laughs> side Perfect. by side out of how would Love she do? It. Exactly what we wanted. I'm not sure it's exactly what they all wanted, but we did hear earlier this week that Jan Fredino was jesting. I'm just, I'm gonna wait around for you on the run, Christian. I'm not sure about your times. I th I think it's gonna be a you know a good race for me. Yeah, Smith here is he's managed to get back up to Alistair Brownlee. Interesting to see whether he's going to sit on his shoulder or, or try and make the pass, but he has uh, just gained that couple of metres and moved up. Alistair Brownlee doing exactly what he did in the Canadian Open, though, leading from the front. Not sure who that is in the background coming up hot on their heels, but uh, maybe one of the Ibiza revellers. Of course, the party island of Ibiza, you know, a real mixture uh, of uh, residents this week as there's a, a full week of, of sporting activities here on the island. But of course, the nightclubs are open. The parties are well in swing. And I can tell you from the hotel that I stayed at that uh, people are, are going out quite, kind of late and early in the morning. I'm showing my age. Yeah, the athletes are not that up early this morning for, for racing, not um, out partying. Maybe they save that till later. They were crossing the those coming in last night in the hallways, I'm sure. Yeah, a couple more athletes here coming into transition. Christian Hogenhaug there. He's a teammate of Max Newman. They're in the same BMC team. And then in the corner there, you can see the front of the race. That's still Alistair Brownlee, Kyle Smith at the front. It might take a little while for some of the athletes to try and reel them in, if they, are, if they can, that 40 seconds. There's Daniel Beckgaard in the green, Frederick Funk in the blue. Oh, they've lost a lot of time. Yeah. They were kind of within that minute 30 for quite a long time on the bike, maybe the first, well, nearly the first half, but really have lost a lot over 
the second. They've got a long way to go if they want to run up towards that that podium. Is that more significant for Frederick Funk as well, who's typically defined as a, a really good biker? Yeah, defined as a biker. See there, Florian Angert as well. They're both there together. So I think they'll be a little bit disappointed with how the ride has played out. And there's Jason West. So he's a really interesting one. A lot of athletes were talking about him before the start, considered him a threat, but it's a long way to come back from. But his, with his run splits, he, from where he is, he still has the ability to run towards a podium. Just to let you know that uh, Max Newman is about 10 seconds behind uh, Alistair Brownlee and Carl Smith. That as was, we see Himmerich. That was quick. <laughs> Jason West there, like we said, they're very uh, thought of. Even Christian Blumenfeld mentioned him as the in his interview as someone that he was uh, maybe considering would be a threat to the podium. So the run course is 18 kilometers. This first section, they don't repeat. They wind kind of through the old town down towards the port. Then once they reach the port, they have six laps of 2.5 kilometers. So there is a lot of opportunity to get a look at the competitors. And I could really see the mind games coming into this as well. Yes, the beautiful old town of Ibiza. Lots of culture and history here. Yeah, maybe a bit of a surprise to see Kyle Smith right up there with Alistair Brownlee. Yeah, we'd, uh, we'd expect Alistair maybe with just, just his history, just the amount of medals, everything he's won, to maybe not be so high up on the run, but Kyle Smith there really it's starting well. Yeah, well, that's the form guide on Kyle Smith. So in and amongst the fields, he is the 22nd fastest. Uh, the bike, he's, you know, here, he's come out second and, I mean, his form was showing 12th, so we know he's a, a strong swimmer, but uh, he's defying the odds today, and he's running alongside the world-class Alistair Brownlee. I mean, he might be pinching himself at points on this race as well, just to be thinking the, the company that he's keeping out there. And Alistair will drag him around if he can, if he's got the legs for it. Yeah, and, and Carl, like I mentioned earlier, Carl Smith is making a bid to make another Olympic team, so he's definitely been focusing more on the short course. So not sure he'll definitely have a bit more speed than maybe he's had before. But he also could have put in a, just a really good um, amount of training over the winter, and he's really come off a solid block, no injuries, and that just means your run form comes up, especially for these younger guys. It's not even about kind of just putting in a good winter. You're just generally improving year by year just by getting a bit older and a bit more experienced. Look at that, 20 seconds now those two have put into Newman and 28 into, into Ditlev. Just a reminder, those of you at home with all the technology, then you can go onto the Professional Triathlete Organization website and you can pull up the blog where our social team will be keeping tabs on the women's race and also we'll have the tracker as well so we we can only show so much here on the on the tv so brownlee is now leading that um he's pulled away a little bit from kyle smith put in a bit of a big surge and what's interesting is uh, that yeah that gap has opened up quite quickly our tracker just keeping up with the timing mats So right now, it's going to become more obvious, but I think we're going to have all three Olympic champions that are on the course sharing that frame. Yeah, and talking of frames, look how different the frame of Christian Blumenfeld is to Jan Fredino. Oh, it never ceases to amaze me. I know, such different, you can be any shape and size in triathlon. It's uh, it's really not one size fits all. And I think any route into the sport as well, you don't have to start at age eight. There's so many stories of athletes picking up later in life. It's uh, really is a different path for nearly every athlete here. I, I guess I've always looked at Yian Fredin as that more nilotic build that they have that. That's what you need. You need to be long and, and wily to try and cut through a, a long distance triathlon. But then Christian Blumenfeld, the barrel chest that he has, just, just cuts a very different picture, but just so very successful and deadly out there in all parts of triathlon. 
this is really promising from Alistair Brownlee. I said there was a few, there was always a few question marks over where his run form was because he pulled out of Ironman South Africa. But so far, looking really good. Is putting in time. He's, I think he's put in about 10 seconds into Fredeno and Blumenfeld already. So, yeah, a good start. And I mean, I love Alistair's run form. That shoulders back, chest forward, and he just flies along. Looking super focused as they make their way around this course. Six laps. Yeah, they're going to get very used to doing this lap six times. It's two and a half kilometers each lap. So it's, it's like a short course triathlon distance lap, that is, so but just done a lot more times. It's going to be very interesting to see how the athletes cope with it, if they like that kind of thing. I think I find it would be... Um, yeah, mentally easier maybe to pace it, uh, thinking, you know, this lap that's going to happen. Or even if, you, if we get into the scenario where they're together and tactics come into play, what time they'll surge at the start of which lap. Very uh, interesting to see how it all plays out. Sort of back left of your picture, that is where they will be finishing. So the turn that you saw Alistair make, he would have then darted left down the chute. And of course, today he'll be hoping that he's the first one to do that. Certainly out there leading the race, and he's putting in more time on Smith. Eight seconds. And putting in time to Ditlev as well. But the one thing I'll say about Ditlev is, from watching him at the US Open, is just how well he paced his run. He really is the master, even at the hanging back, he doesn't rush things, he really takes his time and makes his move. So although we see him maybe losing a bit of time at the start of this lap, it'll be uh, his pacing might come into play later on in the run. And again, on the aesthetics of it, because he's so tall, the effort looks very different to what it does of Alistair Brownlee. He looks fast, but it's deceiving when you watch Ditlev do his work. He just sort of chews up that tarmac, whereas, you know, sometimes, Brownlee looks like a Harrier jet, especially in the red. Yeah, there we see it, that, that loping style of Magnus Ditlev. He just always looks like he's out for a jog, whatever the, <laughs> the speed he's going. But he's, uh, we know that he's good at pacing. We know that he can have a strong finish. So we wouldn't want to count him out, even with, with losing just this little bit of time at the start. And we know that his team are very, very confident about his block of training and the numbers that he's been putting out over the winter. Alistair Brownlee's comfortably so far in the lead, but we know with his past form it doesn't mean anything at this point. We have seen him stop um, and pull out of races when he's been way in the front. So uh, I'm sure Alistair Brownlee hoping today that everything he can keep everything in one piece and, and get to this finish line. He's going to hope that the commentator's curse isn't in play today as well. But it is the narrative. That is what all Brownlee fans are worried about. The last time he raced that PTO, he was looking like this early on, but things did sort of fall apart. And he certainly fell back in the race. But that was a different time, a different season. And the opportunities are ahead of him. Oh my good Lord, what is happening? That's what, God, yeah, I hate that's those mobile just phones. Be... That is crazy. <laughs> yeah, just didn't even know that there was a race going on there and just walked out into the course. Well, that would have been unfortunate, but... Um, might have put a few extra and beats onto Alistair Brownlee's heart rate. <laughs> just I shot so. up a little bit more. Certainly did mine. <laughs> yeah. Well, it looks like survived. It's still going. No damage done so far. Few. And at this point, Alistair Brownlee has run 20 seconds faster than the other two Olympic champions that are on the course. Good support there through Ibiza for our top triathletes. As we go back into the women's race, bottom left, Lucy Charles Barkley, but Paula Finley, known for her strong bike. She's making moves. She is making moves. She's now one minute 29 behind Lucy Charles Barkley, but she's made up a good, I think it's over a minute now. So Fastest really, bike split. yeah, she's really moving well through the field, passing people all the way up. I mean, she's, she's such a good rider for Finley. I mean, she was the Canadian time trial champion last year. I mean, that puts it 
shows just what level she is at. And the bike, I feel like that's where she's so confident. She's so confident in her ability to get on the bike and just put the power down and reel people in. So just under 1.30 behind Lucy Charles Barkley in seventh position. But with the skills and ability to make up that ground, such a stacked field today, it really is. Ashley Gentle there, she loves a PTO race. She's in eighth. She's 10 seconds behind Paula Finley, who she has raced with a number of times now. I think that's really promising for Ashley Gentle as well. The, the fact that she's had the ability to go with Paula, because they were out the swim a similar amount of time between that two and three minutes down. So she's been one of the athletes that has managed to hold on to Paula Finley's race pace and get near, nearer to the front. Speaking of race pace, Paula Findlay with uh, the, the fastest bike at the moment. We see Ashley, who we were just talking about, slightly slower, but they are both faster than Lucy Charles Barkley at this stage. There's Paula Findlay, so she's passing all of these athletes. They were out in front of the swim in front of her, so we've got uh, Bet Clark there, Fenella Langbridge is up there, Sarah Perez Sala. So she's going to be the one to, uh, Paul is going to be the one to pass now. So it is a little bit tougher in this position. It's what we mentioned earlier. Lucy Charles Barkley out front doesn't have to worry about any of this stuff, but the drafting, kind of moving into the zones. She can just put her head down and go. But if Paula Finley manages to pass all these athletes and get into second position, I think she's got a really good chance of closing down that gap to Lucy Charles Barkley. And the bike closest to screen is Ashley Gentle. And she has eyes on Paula Finley. They are a minute 29 behind Lucy Charles Barkley. Lottie Wilms still up there. She's dropped down a bit after the swim, but still in a really good position. And that swim might have set her up for a strong bike ride. Always very visible on course as well in the green. Love that kit. They got 56.6 kilometers, so a long way to go on the four lap course for our women in this extraordinary field of the most talented triathlons from across distances. How will it shake out as we're already seeing some are going faster and they're starting to make their ways up through the fields, or the field I should say. Lucy Charles Barkley out there all on her own at the moment. Yeah, Paula looking really smooth. She didn't have a great start to the year. She raced in Oceanside and was really disappointed with her performance, but did race last week in St. Anthony's, which is a shorter distance race, non-drafting though, like we have here, and had a great performance. So I feel like she's gained a bit of confidence from that. And sometimes it's quite nice to get that bad race out of the way at the start of the season. It's done, she can maybe shake it off, come here with kind of not putting too much pressure on herself, which sometimes really helps an athlete race well. And here, of course, is Alistair Brownlee slowing down. Oh, no. He really wanted to make sure he got that drink, and that's really smart there. He doesn't want to lose that nutrition. Yeah, good pace for Alistair Brownlee as we pull back and have a view of the port. Would have lost a few seconds there by making that stop there. I mean, he'd slowed to try and grab some nutrition. I don't actually know if there was anything in it. It looked like he shook it and threw it. So um, I'm not sure what went on there. So hopefully he manages to get something later on in the course if he has missed something. Are there specifics that they're looking for as they go through? They're like the different types of uh, hydration or, or carbohydrates or something of that nature. Would he have known what he was aiming for? Yeah, I think he would have known what he's aiming for. I guess his personal preference and some of the athletes might carry something in their suit if they specifically want to take anything. I think in these shorter races, the predominant amount of nutrition is taken on the bike. But he definitely did was aiming for something there. He wouldn't have stopped unless yeah. it was uh, he really wanted it. I think he's still got something in his right hand. Maybe not. Oh, well, he's uh, still going at a fair clip. Yeah, he's, he's moving really well. Currently moving the second fastest on the course. I think Jason West, who is quite a lot further back, is running the fastest, but Alistair is only 10 seconds off that pace. 
that they would be one of the lapped athletes that's not someone who's kind of getting up close to Alistair yes. Brownlee because because this is a six lap course we're going to have so many athletes on the course so we will try and pick out <laughs> which ones are where that's Max Newman there he's in second position he's having a great race he came in ranked really high but I think a lot of people have ridden him off um, just that he's oh, he only races well down in Australia but he had that performance in Hawaii last year and he's come here and shown that he really can perform on the big day and when everyone's there 22 seconds behind Alistair Brownlee at the moment. We've got Kyle Smith there. He's still in third position. I'm just looking at some of the pacing as well. And it's 4.10 that Alistair Brownlee's running and Max Newman was four, just over four minutes a kilometre. That is some pace. So he's really trying to make up that ground on Alistair Brownlee at the moment. Yeah, that's he's definitely moved faster through that run section. It's going to be, it's just going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. And we just, I think that big unknown with Alistair Brownlee on his uh, his actual form. But there's Christian Blumenfeld coming round. So he's managed to drop Jan Frodeno. Is that right? Yeah. yeah there's Jan Frodeno. So there, Christian's opened up a big gap. Christian looks on the pacing, looks like he's going the fastest at the moment, sub four minute kilometers. Dietlev is uh, at 4.06 as well. So just to give you an idea of who's moving quickly and might be able to uh, shake things up. as so we take a look at the harbor. Yeah, Chris, so Christian Bloomfeld moving really well. He's still one minute, uh, 18 seconds down on Alistair Brownlee. So Alistair Brownlee still has a pretty good buffer, but there is uh, there's still a long way to run. There will be uh, keeping his eyes peeled as he makes his way around these smaller streets for yeah, someone hopefully. getting in his path. Hopefully no one else in his path. And hopefully no one else passing him, isn't it? He wants to stay out in front now from this point. Looking super strong at this point of the race. And Christian Blumenfeld has eaten up 13 seconds on the leader. So he's really going for it. I think we'd expect a really even pace from Christian Blumenfeld too. I think he'll find a pace that he needs to hit. He can stay there. And we know from previous races, he's got that ability to pick up and really have a big surge a at the end. A sickening pace, I think. Yeah. yeah a disgustingly <laughs> sickening pace that doesn't seem uh, humanly possible. And speaking of what doesn't seem humanly possible, West there with the fastest pace right now. Blumenfeld just behind him and then Alistair Brown has picked it up he's going at a fair clip as well he is leading the race of course oh we go Magnus Ditlev he's past Kyle Smith and Ditlev now is in third position so Kyle Smith just had a great start there maybe just fading slightly but it's mad if he can keep this pace. I don't think he would have been coming in aiming for a podium today. This is the kind of race, if he came away with a top 10 or top 5, he'd be incredibly happy. Well, Magnus Dietlev showing his confidence, showing that work he's been doing over the winter, his team that he's put in place around him. He spoke about how he's been able to focus on the running as he becomes a more popular athlete. And, you know, good luck to him as well, getting more sponsorships. But, you know, more money, more problems, if you like. But he's found a way of bringing those close around him to take care of the stuff on the periphery so that he can get back to focusing on what he truly loves to do, and that is swim, bike, run. The work that he's put in on a swim, but looks like the run as well is really paying dividends as he is becoming a hot favorite out here for the podium and some maybe. Mate, could he go one better? than what he did at the US Open and take that top spot. Back to here to Alistair Brownlee at the front. We can see in the back, we've got Max Newman there. And he seems to be holding a very similar distance. Alistair will get a good look at this turnaround coming up where they are. So we've got Matthias Peterson in the middle of them. He is uh, one of the athletes that is a lap behind. So we're looking at the red suit behind there of Max Newman. 
coached by his brother, which is really interesting. Like they've had a really close relationship. His brother still works, I think, full time, but he coaches his brother on the side. It's a really close relationship, really sort of lovely story of how they uh, came through the COVID pandemic and the aim was just to get to Max riding, running even better than he was. Lovely stuff. Talking of brothers, the Brantley brothers and Alistair still out top. His name forever should be in capital letters for all of his achievements. And he is having a fantastic race so far. We obviously don't know what's going on behind the curtain, but he's looking good at this stage. A lot of the column inches being dedicated to Jan Fredino and that man, Christian Blumenfeld. Of course, there's a long way to go yet, but Alistair Brownlee must always feature. He must always feature. When he when he's on that start line yeah it's just you don't know which alistair brownie you're going to get do you the the injured version or the one that's going to win everything but today so far all that's good for alistair brownlee oh, just with christian blumenfeld there we just get it's just so familiar now that running style just sitting there on his shoulder maybe missing uh, gustav eden today the the other top ranked a norwegian athlete who isn't here who won the PTO Open in Canada, their training partners. So maybe a different dynamic without his, uh, his buddy in the race. Yeah, he's trying to clock up the points so that he can get to Paris. Whereas Blumenfeld already had those points in the bag. So he turns his attention to 100 kilometers today and beating the other two Olympic champions on the course. I'm sure that'll be a really big feather in his cap. He is one that is obviously motivated by lots of different challenges. And when you've achieved so much, you know, it's nice to identify these separate challenges, right, Helen? So just give you, you know, get that adrenaline going a little bit harder. Yeah, and I think the greatest of all time battle is talking about the men. It's it's Jan versus Alistair versus Christian. And you'll get people from all different camps telling you why that person should be there. But it all comes down to this great racing that we see all three of them on course. Blumenfeld is ahead of Frodeno at the moment. Can he get there all the way to Brownlee? It's, uh, but this is what people have wanted, these three on the start line together, and everyone's waited a long time for it. And whoever, whichever athlete you think is the GOAT, it's just fantastic to see them out there racing. And just across sport, it is rare that you get such an esteemed field together. I think the obvious comparison might be boxing, where boxing fans will complain that they never saw the top guys of the moment ever truly get to face one another at the appropriate time in history, maybe. But here we have the last three Olympians all on the same course. There's apparent, well, if you listen to the, the, the Norwegians, the triathlon has changed quite a bit, but if you listen to Jan Fredino, he doesn't think so, so much. But this is a big move here from Max, Max Newman. Yeah, he's really closing down that distance. It was hovering, wasn't it? It was hovering around that 20 seconds, but he's, re he's closed it down so quick, put in a big surge to get to the shoulder of Alistair Brownlee. Will he stay there? Will he go straight past? What a move this is. Max Newman running side by side with Alistair Brownlee. They are the front runners in the race. The legend has company at the front. And it'll be interesting to see how this affects his race now. Was he expecting to see Max Newman? on his shoulder. Does it matter? Yeah, it's hard to know, isn't it? I think um, I think Max Newman wasn't like one of the big names coming in, but he's had that really strong, consistent results and probably not one of the big names, maybe because he just doesn't put himself out there as much as some of the others. He's not big on social media. He's not got his own YouTube channel. So there isn't just as much information about him, but he's come here. He's really prepared. And there we see there his stats, fifth in the swim, 16th bike, third on the run. Is it looking like a real threat at the moment? 2022 are a few indicators of what he might be able to bring into this season at both, uh, you know, full iron distance and at 70.3. But he is underlining that at the moment by this performance today, Helen, as he strides side by side with Alistair Brownlee. Well, in fact, it's not any longer side by side. He has taken the lead. Yeah, he's made the move. Brownlee, it's hard to know whether Brownlee slowed or he's, uh, he, Max Newman's just put, really just picked up the pace. It looks like Brownie may have slowed down a little bit there. You see he's holding his hands, he's got that nutrition we think he might have missed on the, on the first lap. 
but it's important for Alistair Brownlee now to kind of, I suppose, get his head in the right space. He's out front, he's leading, which is where he loves to be. But he's also now, he's got to kind of reset and kind of stay in the game and be aware of who's coming from behind, if anyone's going to be coming from behind. I think we can bet that Christian Blumenfeld is coming from behind. Well, this is a heck of a run here from Max Newman. Max Newman is sharing the same kind of pace as Christian Blumenfeld. So uh, keep that in mind. But the man from down under, who's coached by his brother, at just 27 years of age, still has a, a lot of time left in triathlon. He's having a heck of a race today. Up to fourth now, Christian Blumenfeld. He's just picking everyone off, isn't he? And this is what I was saying earlier about, I just feel like he's so calculated and scientific. It's like, you see him check his watch regularly. He's just check the watch, what's the speed? Check the watch, what's the speed? And you get them, you imagine that inside his head is like, right, I'm at this lactic now, or I'm at this threshold. He, he's always kind of working out. But then also we see him race on incredible emotion and, and drive. And when you see him cross the finish line, it's, he's not like a calculator. He has that incredible emotion. Yes, Blumenfeld going full send now, eating up the streets of Ibiza to close in on the front runners. What a race he's having. And we see, Charles Barkley yeah, there, out the saddle. Still out front. I mean, just looking at the last timing check, she's still got over a minute to Lottie Wilms. Paula Finlay still moving up at a minute 20 now. Ashley Gentle's there as well, so that's that's the big threat to the women. I think they want to know where Ashley Gentle is. They want to know where Tamara Dewitt is as well, Annie Haug, but at the moment they are a bit further back. But the biggest threat to them on the run over the last two PTO Opens has been Ashley Gentle, and she's close. Yeah, Ashley Gentle has put in some monster runs. We know she's done it before. Can she do it again? That's a little assistance there as he takes the corner for Christian Blumenfeld. He's had a lot of support here in Ibiza. I think he was a little surprised by that at first. Oh, I love the video of him running on the track. Yeah. So he went down just to do his normal kind of pre-race pre track session that he does within the week. And you've got all the locals just on the side of the track cheering for him. And they're just so incredibly happy to see him there. And it's such a treat for all of us to have this kind of company with us in both the, the men's and the women's field. And for the athletes as well to have the supporters on course. You can see there as Christian's running down, there's, there's athletes, there's, there's people watching, spectators both sides of the course, really kind of getting into the race. And this is a multi-sport festival this week. There's been races going on all week, duathlon, aquathon, cross duathlon, cross triathlon, it's all been going on. So it's so great that those athletes, real people who love the sport are here watching it and supporting. Yeah, the PTO European Tour has partnered with the Spanish Triathlon Federation and World Triathlon. And there's Paula Finley. So she's just making the fast thing. She just passed Sarah Perez Salah, that would be, and just gradually, gradually working her way up to the front of the field. In front of her now, she's got India Lee and Lottie Wilms. They're the only people separating her and the front of the race, which is Lucy Charles Barkley. Always a strong ride from Paula Finley, the 2022 Canadian Road Champs TT winner. She won in St. Anthony's last week, so she's in good form. I think that's an Olympic distance race. Face huge pressure back in Edmonton at the PTO Tour Canada, had an emotional second place result. Great day out for her back home. Oh, amazing day out there, watching that finish of her finishing second. And also, if you get to watch it, go back and watch the half Ironman World Champs where she finished second. Absolutely incredible performance where she was, um, oh, she just had it the best day, like really, really phenomenal performance. And I think that's the kind of form she'll be looking to replicate. She's the athlete, she can perform on the big day. She really can. She just brings it out the bag and really goes and nails that performance. And it's a storied career as well for Paula Finley, who was an Olympian back in 2012 as well. Yeah, she was. I mean, she was the best in the world and she had some really bad injuries before London Olympics and it was a really hard time for her. She didn't have many results over the next few years and 
it's so good to see her come back in the last few years and, and just smash it. She's at the front of races winning and she's such a popular winner. I think because people know what she went through in those years where she just wasn't sure whether she should be doing triathlon, where she fell out of love with it a bit. So just love seeing Paula Finley do well. Yes, uh, this tri life that she uh, shares with Eric Lagerstrom as well. They do such a great job of documenting their journey. Uh, they continue to give back to the triathlon community as well. Very easy to pull for both of them uh, because of their, their performances out on the course, but of course their contributions in sport as well. Yeah, of course. Also, Sarah Prasella just coming back past now. So this is, uh, I suppose, where it gets a bit more congested on the course and the athletes really have to be careful with they don't want to get any drafting penalties so sitting back and, and uh, making sure they drop back at the right time and this is where um, Paula Finley would ideally just be passing people and just keeping on going and, and not having to worry about any of this going on but Sarah Presella feeling strong and willing to retake the lead from Paula Finley. And what I found uh, quite interesting from Paula as well was how she was just so modest when the PTO team started ask, asking her about how, how she would fare today. I mean, I know that she was one who identified it's early in the season, but she certainly didn't put herself up there as one of the winners. Um, but it, yeah, always very humble. Always very humble. And I think she undersells herself sometimes and that she just, she can come out on the big day and really deliver. And she's really moving well. I mean, she was just, we did see Sarah Perez salad uh, passing her there but um, she's made up 30 in the 30 kilometers we've ridden she's made up one minute on Lucy Charles Barkley so she is really moving well Sarah Presella now is in second though leading that chase Lottie Lottie Vilms India Lee still up there Ashley Gentle still there Rebecca Clark Holly Lawrence as well so Holly's pulled back a bit of time but hasn't managed to go with this uh, this hard pace that Paula Finley is setting Finney had a torrid time of injuries. I think she had a pelvic stress fracture. And she's overcome so much to get back into this kind of form. A form that she said really does peak later in the season, towards the summer. But maybe she'll surprise herself and everyone else today. Yeah, I think so as well. I think she's she's downplaying it a little bit. And I so say she did have that bad race at the, well, in her words, a, a bad race at the start of the season in Oceanside where she really wasn't happy. So maybe she's kind of going off that form, but I feel like she's uh, probably in a, in a better place now, especially after that win at St. Anthony's last weekend. So we've got a, a special guest now who's with uh, Alex at Ruth Astle, partner of Alistair Brownlee. Over to you, Alex. John, thank you very much indeed. Yes, Ruth is alongside the clipboard with the split times is on the floor. We're peering anxiously uh, at the television alongside. As you came over and we said hi, you were just like, this is incredibly tense and rather unpleasant to watch. How are we feeling? Yeah, it's much more stressful watching, definitely. Um, I'd much rather be out there racing than being in this position because there's nothing you can do. And like, he obviously has it under control, but it's very stressful trying to watch. And he has got it under control. It's obviously it's changed a little bit in the last few minutes, the last few sort of uh, lap times, etc. How are you? How are you feeling? He's getting on out there. Yeah, I think he um, he maybe went out a bit hard on the run, <laughs> but that's his style. And I think you know he was just so happy to be back on the start line. The last two years have been pretty up and down. Um, so yeah, I think he was just happy to be at a race, to be able to start, to feel fit and healthy. So I actually think today just finishing is a massive win. Anything else above that, obviously, he always races to win. So um, yeah, he'll be a bit upset. He's no longer leading, but see where he ends up. It's Alistair Brownlee, so the obvious answer is that he has, but has he got what it takes at this point, given how I suppose some of the challenges of training coming into this? Yeah, I mean, I think he would say it's not his ideal training prep running up to it, with obviously how he had to be careful post South Africa, but um, yeah, you know, he's Alistair. He's all, like, if he turns up 80%, he's probably fitter than 90% of the guys here. It just so happens that this field 
some of the other guys can also do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, what a race. We get to watch actually like all the best racing each other. Unbelievable. We're quite near the VIP tent as well, so we'll get you a drink as you head back out there. I can see split times on your yeah. whiteboard. At what point do you just scrub that off and say, put your foot down, it now comes down to heart? If I try and do that, I'll definitely get shouted at. Let's not, let's not do that. <laughs> no. We're going to let you go. Thank you so Thank much, you. Ruth. Best of luck to you Thanks. and the man. Thank you. I always have such sympathy for the families, and particularly when you guys are in it as well and you know what everyone's going through and there's nothing you can do about it. No, nothing you can do about it. It's always worse watching uh, than actually being out there racing because once you race, start race, the nerves go and the family there, we saw Emma Fredona with her children there watching and yeah, you've still got the nerves, you're still carrying that tension. So Max Newman's still leading. He's, we're over halfway through the run now and he's got yeah, 40 seconds on Christian Blumenfeld. It's wow. going to be touch, if they carry on with the same pace, it's going to be touch and go whether Blumenfeld can get there. Mag <laughs> Magnus Dietlev is right there as well. 47 seconds behind and about six seconds behind Christian Blumenfeld and Alistair Brownlee down in fourth. It's hotting up here on the white aisle. Big prize money, big bragging rights. What a position for Max Newman to be in. And I think this is a big change. He's, he's used to leading races in Australia. There is smaller fields out there. He did Hawaii where he was very much the chaser. But I think this is, this is a different mentality. This is tough. He's leading the best in the world. He's out front on his own. It is a shift. You really have to kind of be careful how you think about it and really stay focused and stay in the moment. You don't want to get too carried away with what's going to happen in a kilometer's time, two kilometers time or the finish. So many things have to come together for you athletes to perform to your very best on the day. And sometimes it can even be the company that is on that start list. It can really pull the very best out of you. I think that's what we're seeing today from, from Max Newman. Yeah, I think so. That He's really risen to the big occasion. Um, he's traveled over from Australia, so I'm not sure what, when he arrived. Uh, that would have, but it seems to have coped with that kind of transition really well. I mean, I, I think it goes without saying, but would this be his biggest ever achievement in triathlon if he was to come away with the top spot today? Oh, yes, undoubtedly, this would be the best. I mean, that fourth place in Hawaii last year, that was a really big step up in, and an incredibly fast time. But this is different. This is uh, the short distance. This is maybe not he, what he's most suited to, and he's really making a move. It's been a really confident race so far. Yes, to think that this might not be the distance that he's a specialist at. Well, he might be, I'm not sure they were his words, by the way, but he, if they are, he'll be rethinking that, certainly if he can hold on to this kind of pace. Yeah, and at the moment, Christian Blumenfeld isn't pulling back much time. It's only a couple of seconds from the last timing check. So, yeah, will Christian Blumenfeld start to panic? <laughs> will, he be th will he be thinking he could have reeled in Max Newman? Does it, I think he's got ice in his face. Does, does Christian Blumenfeld panic? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't look like a panicker. <laughs> Aid station for Max Newman. He's taking whatever he can. So we're just getting word that Christian Blumenfeld has pulled 14 seconds out of Max Newman on the run, but he's we see there just under 40 seconds behind him so he's going great guns and i guess we're going to get to a point now i'm very bad at this maths part but will he run out of road in which he can actually take that top spot yeah i think he will know how, what he's got to do and uh it's whether he can make a move and whether he's saving anything for kind of one of the last laps where they can really push on i don't think he's going to want to save it to the end it's typically not his mo to want to go and have a sprint finish but he much rather is that position of surging from maybe a kilometer or two out really applying the pressure but at the moment he's not the one in control max newman at the front is in control and setting a really fast pace that christian blumenfeld is having to respond to lap number five here on the run and it is getting hotter here in Ibiza. Christian Blumenfeld is on the chase, isn't he? He's got to make up that time to Max Newman. He's running out of time to do it, though. That 39 seconds, 
is going to feel like a long way in not that much time. We haven't got that much time left to do it. Running around the World Heritage Area of the city, Paseo Vera del Rey, the nerve center of Ibiza, beautiful historic square, surrounded by the walled town of Dort Villa. Statue of an Irish-born general, actually, who fought in the War of Independence of Cuba, stands there. So there's such a blend of culture, architecture, and, of course, superstar DJs. Of course. <laughs> Not sure if they're out watching the race. They probably should be. It's, a, it's an exciting one. And just looking further down, we've still got Brownlee there in fourth, Frodeno there in fifth. So even if um, Jan Frodeno is not happy with this, um, I think just to be back racing, and he's been in the mix for most of the race, I don't think he's going to be massively disappointed if he can hold on to that position. Yeah, looking a bit further down as well, number seven there, Jason West. So he's managed to pull back some time, but I don't know whether he's going to be able to get close to the podium. He's still got just too much left to run. Always very fast on his feet. But the picture there of Christian Blumenfeld. What can we see from his facial expressions? Is there, is there anything that we can garner from how he's looking at the moment? Because his form looks very solid. I always think he just looks like he's going hard from the start. He has that kind of pain face from the start. So it's always there. He's always just in the moment, just really pushing the pace. And I think he's closed a few more seconds from what you see on your screen if you've got your tracker up as well. Sub four minutes per kilometre pace. And that is faster than Max Newman at the moment. Yeah, Magnus Dittler still hanging tough there. He's still in third position. It doesn't look like there's anyone coming from him. The next person would probably be uh, Jason West that would threaten Dittler's position. But at the moment, he looks pretty solid in, in that third. Blue, in fact, it just always looks like he's sprinting, like a fast turnover, those arms out wide. Yeah, the 70.3 world record holder in 2019, which beat his previous record that he set in 2018, the first sub seven hour iron distance athlete as well in 2022. 2022 Ironman 70.3 world champion. I mean, the list goes on and he will soon be breathing down the neck of Max Newman, who's been in some company there with Alistair Brownlee, but he's got the new guard closing in on, on in him now. Yeah, Max Newman's played this race really well. He was right there in the swim. He just stayed in contention all through the bike. And now, uh, yeah, just executing with a really strong run performance. That's Frederick Funk there, just about to be lapped. And he was one of the athletes we were talking about as could have been one of the contenders today. So uh, just not having the best day. Blumenfeld feels like he can run down anyone in the field on his bike. He's got written, it hurts more to lose. So he will put himself through the pain. We know that he can do that. He's going to turn himself inside out, isn't he, to get back to Max Newman. He's closing 100%. it down. It's a few seconds every time check, but it's uh, there's not that much further left. It's, it's whether he's got that big surge to put in and really kind of make a mark and, and pull him back. Just 4K to go now in the men's race on this run. Max Newman still looking strong, but Christian Blumenfeld is in the second spot. 36 seconds behind the serious brains of Olav Alexander Boo, his coach. They've been working on every aspect of this game from a very scientific angle, dialing in absolutely everything, more than we could even attempt to try and explain here, and I know I certainly couldn't do it justice. Yeah, we can't. I don't know if we want to go into lactic <laughs> blood testing and heart rate zones and uh, Stool ana samples, anaerobic yeah, thresholds. Yeah. There's there's so much that goes into it, and uh, yeah, it's just it's that whole scientific approach and how much that confidence that gives as well. Because obviously there's that approach, but that gives him this bulletproof confidence that we're doing the best thing in the world. And I think if you believe that deep down, that this is this is groundbreaking. No one is doing what we're doing. It gives him a mental edge coming in. Yeah, I think people at home who are perhaps new to triathlon need to understand the level of sports science that these athletes have behind them. He's 
Christian Blumenfeld is not the only one. Most of these folk have a doctor, someone who's got a master's in sports science, something like that. They're like engineers, biomechanical engineers. It's fascinating when you dive into it. So much goes into this running form right here and being able to put down these sorts of performances and to think that they're eking out even more performance, it just blows your mind. And just looking at the time checks there, Jan Frodeno's moved into fourth position. Brownie's just slipped back one more position. Yeah, looks like Alistair has kind of uh, cooked it quite a bit. And we saw, as um, his partner Ruth Astle said, maybe he, uh, maybe he did go out a bit fast, but <laughs> I mean, just obviously yeah. carried away with the occasion, but it's gonna be, He's just got to try and hold on now and really try and solidify his position. Uh, but it's hard when you, he probably hasn't got the run training in he, he needed to for this event. Yeah, but a lot of question marks. We obviously don't know, but there's around his training, how well prepared he was, of course, uh, wasn't able to make a, a start line earlier in the year. So it didn't look good in that sense. And maybe he just went at a pace that he would like to achieve, see how long and how his body can hold up for. Yeah, I think it is that, and, and that racing mentality, that doesn't change. He's going to push himself as hard as he can for as long as he can. So yeah, I don't think there's uh, you can't change that. That's in him. I think that's been there from the start. That wasn't going to change, but it's still, a, it's still he's back racing. It's better than being sitting on the sidelines. Yeah, 100%. Uh, I caught an interview with him talking about his first ever experience on a cross-country run where he was like so far down, not quite last, but absolutely loved it and made it his life's mission since he was young to be the very best. And that he has, he's penned a book with his brother. He has letters after his name. He has a number of cabinets full of trophies and I, accolades. And I think for Alistair Brownlee, he put triathlon on the map in, in the UK. I mean, oh, winning 100%. that Olympic gold, his brother coming in third, it just, uh, yeah, it, it made him a household name. But the leader, Max Newman is running a deadly pace out there, but Blumenfeld is faster right now. Ditlev, slightly slower than the front two at this count. Yeah, Blumenfeld's running fast. I think what's going to be interesting is when we get to the start of the next of that sixth lap, what that gap is there, and then we can kind of work out the pace. How much faster does Blumenfeld have to run per kilometre? And that's the kind of sums that these athletes will be doing in their head. It's like, right, if I hold like 310 or 330 pace per kilometer. I was thinking more in a short course terms where they're running about four minutes here. If I can hold this pace, what's he gonna hold? Will I be able to stay in front? But it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's a calculating game. Some mental gymnastics being needed to be done. And that's why they've got these uh, credentialed uh, coaches as well, who I'm sure have all and kinds of tools to be able to work this it out. It takes your mind off the pain as well. <laughs> you're in a lot of pain at this point. You're really suffering and thinking that we can see Max Newman just grimacing there. It's uh, you are, you just got to get through it the best you can. And sometimes that kind of thing can, uh, can help. Final lap, 27 seconds ahead of Christian Blumenfeld. The time you see is the last one at the timing, Matt. And it is all about biting down and turning those legs over. What an outstanding performance here from Newman. Here in Ibiza, the first leg of the PTO tour. A fantastic destination attended by truly some of the world's best in both the men's and the women's field. A stunning backdrop for a wonderful race. And there is the man, the number one ranked Christian Blumenfeld. And I think this is so it's so cool for a fan. We're getting to see him run at full pace, pelt as well, because he's he's chasing. You know, if he's off the front and he's got a few minutes, he doesn't have to run to his full ability, but he's chasing. So we're seeing like this is the best Christian Blumenfeld can do. He's really putting everything out there. So to really try and get back to that first position. And I read a, a uh, 220 triathlon article about his coach hiring a voice coach for Christian Blumenfeld. He reckons it's improved his VO2 max and he belongs to a choir. Apparently he can, he can belt out a tune and it's, he's getting even more powerful with it. But it just goes to show you the areas that that team are looking to exploit. 
to try and get any kind of marginal gain. Yeah, that no stone unturned approach. But at the moment, Max Newman is beating that approach. He's well in front. He's still got to last, uh, heading up on that last lap. He had a 23 second lead or 26 second lead, I think it was. So it could be close with the speed Christian Blumenfeld is moving. Blumenfeld talks about the pressure the level of expectation but he has to adopt that training mindset to deliver his race and also looking to deliver their best race lucy charles barkley every time we come to her i feel like she's just exiting the tunnel there yeah i know she's in the tunnel and she's still um she's still ahead one minute 16 ahead of the chasers that chase group includes sarah perez Sala, paula findley ashley gentles there lottie films is there vanilla language India Lee, it's a big group, Rebecca Clark, and then there's the gap. So we've got Lucy Charles, seven in the main group, and then there's a bit of a gap to athletes like Holly Lawrence, Daniela Reef. Yeah, that was just a, a quick check-in, if you like, with the women's race. And there they are, Lucy Charles Barkley. She has gapped everyone by a minute and 16. And then you see there until you get down to ninth place where there's a two and a half minute gap. So eight, seven chasers to Lucy Charles Barkley on the bike. This is it. Can, can Lucy Charles Barkley do it? She's done it before. She's led the swim. She's led the bike. She's led the run. She's looking set to stay away at the moment. It's whether those women can, can work together. There is a big group of them. Can they use each other? Can they kind of take the turns, really try and work their way back to Lucy Charles Barton? But this gap hasn't changed for a while, or it's only come down a little bit. Ashley Gentle is very, very fast on the run. She is a minute 22 behind. That is another exciting prospect that we have in the wings. But in that smaller box, we see Christian Blumenfeld tearing around the streets of Ibiza. He is 19 seconds behind, but there is only 1.5 kilometers to go before we will see the champion here at the PTO Tour Europe. Oh, 19 seconds, that's that's a lot in one and a half kilometers. That is a really, I, I've said- Can he do Chris, it? <laughs> I said Christian Blumenfeld has a good finish, but that's a big finish. That would require Max Newman to blow, I think, and Christian Blumenfeld to have really? the best 1.5K. Oh, yeah, I don't want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't make me call it. Well, he's achieved many great feats, but it looks like we have a new star in the making. Newman out there with 19 seconds. Matt Newman from Australia. He, he lives in Brisbane. Brother Mitch is his coach. 27 years old. He's had a good, he's had a good season down under. Yeah, really good. The last good. race, he was first in hell of the West. Hell of the West. He was first at Ironman Western Australia, fourth in Kona. There we can see him. He's in the distance. And this is the beauty of these laps. Well, at some point, are we? Hopefully, we're going to see them cross one another. Uh, that's when you have to look good. <laughs> yeah, you do. We <laughs> really will see good. it. There's the Whether turn. They've got the glasses on, so they won't be able to see in each other's eyes. But they'll have a little check of each other's form. Oh, it's going to be close. Oh, it's this is tense. That is super close. Really close. And Max, I mean. <laughs> For a guy like Max Newman, I'm sure you've got a superstar in Christian Blumenfeld running you down. Like, again, does your heart skip a beat? You know, does, does it, does the competitive in you like dial in a little bit more, the devil come out? I think you're, you're running scared, but you've, you've also got to back yourself. You've got to keep positive in your head. You've got to keep positive. You can't give up for a second. You can't let that thought come in that it's Christian Blumenfeld. And second would be fine. Second's still a good play. You just can't let it come in. You have to keep focused on the finish. Max Newman has a, a really good resume. Six half distance wins. He's got four Ironman wins as well. So he's proven over both distances. As we've said, did a, a brilliant performance in Kona uh, last year. Loves it in Ironman Cairns. Yeah, and, and the races he's had down in Australia, 
they have been ridiculously fast. I mean, we're talking small fields, so maybe it's ignored a little bit, maybe it's not focused on or dismissed because it's just one of the kind of earlier Australian races or earlier New Zealand races, but they've been really fast times. And, but that means he needs to have confidence in his own run and doing this, running out front, dis despite what everyone else is doing, I'm on my own path, I'm on my own race and I'm going to achieve. Yeah, and I think he's picked up the pace here. He's looking really strong at this finish. There's a grimace now yeah. across the face of Max Newman as well. I think he's putting in time. Maybe he's gone part, maybe he's dropped to Christian Blumenfeld a little bit. Well, this is exciting. Out. I think it got down to 19, but now it's gone back to 20. I mean, it's only a second difference, but it it's shows how strong, it shows how strong Max Newman is running out front. And there's Christian Blumenfeld right now. It is between those two. Ditlev, a minute and 34 back. Max Newman looking fantastic as he twists and turns. He's coming down the chute. He sees the finish line. He checks his shoulder as well. It's an outstanding run for Max Newman. I beat the rocks for Max Newman. A wonderful day out. Do we have a new superstar in middle course racing? Christian Blumenfeld turns the corner. He'll see the shoot now. Well, he's beaten Jan Fredino. He's beaten Alistair Brownlee. It's a fantastic race from him. Didn't quite have enough turf to make up the time on Max Newman. But he goes over to congratulate him. A fantastic performance by the Aussie. Yeah. And of course, Blumenfeld was going to be there. Unbelievable. And I mean, I think Christian knew at that, probably that 19 second time gap, he's like, no, this isn't coming back. And uh, you could see he'd slowed down there to appreciate the crowd, give some high fives. But Max Newman, what an incredible performance. Wonderful stuff. Yeah, and see the emotion on his face when he when he came across that line. Pure joy. That's what you live for. That's what you live for as an athlete. Those days where you just everything goes right, it comes off, and you just it's worth all that effort you put in, all that hard work, all those hours. The biggest win of his career for Max Newman with the backdrop of Ibiza, the first European tour race for the PTO. Our hat goes off to you, sir. Brilliantly put together across all the disciplines, but that run was something special. And there is our remaining podium placer, Magnus Ditlev. The great Dane is bringing that through. Yeah, such a strong performance for him. I think a really good swim. He just made the moves on the bike. He really, you know, he caused that group to all come together. And it just didn't quite have the legs there to stay with him on the run, but uh, still an incredibly solid performance. Fantastic race for Magnus Ditlev. And we might be expecting a sprint finish here from Fredino and Jason West. It's Fredino over the line first. Fourth Great position. to have him back racing. Fourth position for him after 616 days away. And it's been a privilege. Yeah, a privilege to have him back and, and a good start as well. I mean, we all wanted him to be at the front and be there racing, but after that long off, incredible to come back and what a good finish. And, and Jason West there as well with another incredible run, fastest run split, two minutes quicker than Matt Newman, get him up there in fifth position. And take it in folks when you see Jan Fredina because he's not going to be around for very much longer. So it's been wonderful to have him race here at the PTO European Tour. And we hope to see him a few more times, of course, in 2023. And I believe that's Alistair Brownlee who is uh, making his way down to the finish line. There he is. It was a hard race for Brownlee who led for the lion's share as he crosses the line. Congratulations to him as well. It's been a tough campaign over the last period of time for Brownlee. A uh, constant battle, I think, constant battle with the body. The mind is there, the mind is willing, but his body keeps getting injuries. But 
uh, probably not a bad performance considering the build-up, but we never know all of that that information before the start. So lovely to have uh, everyone's got their family there at the yeah. finish. Wholesome stuff here at the finish line for Jan Fredino, joined by his family, his children. I love their glasses as well. It's good. Got to get the kids in those glasses. Looking very cool out here in Ibiza. It's been a fantastic build-up. It really helped drive the this event, the, the back and forth between one another. It's been a really enjoyable one to follow, and the racing's been fantastic as well. Daniel Beckergaard crossing the line. Uh, Florian... Oh, no, sorry, is that Ben Canute there? Ben Canute, a little surge to bring his race home as well. Yeah, solid there. Top, another top eight there for Ben Canute in the sort of decent result. I'm sure maybe would have wanted a little bit more. See the athletes just, a lot of them just collapsing over the finish line. Oh, Kyle Smith. Well, he hang on really well. He had a great, that great first few kilometers, didn't he? But a really strong finish there for him. Yeah. Breaking into that top 10. Yeah, it'd be good to hear from him as well after this race. His, he was right out there for the longest time as well. A major player today, like really driving the front of the bike and really put in a lot of work. So uh, really good. And it paid off. You know, he got that top 10 today. Yeah. We've got the fastest legs here. So Aaron Royal was the fastest on the swim, 22.39. On the bike, no surprise, Magnus Ditlev with the... Uh, 148.56 and Jason West had the fastest run. 57.03. So, very fast run here. Well, it's been a, a brilliant race for the men. The setup was mouth watering. The idea of having our last three Olympians racing one another was something that we didn't think for so very long we would get to see, but we got it today. And boy, they delivered. But Max Newman is the man of the hour. He comes across the line to take first position. And boy, am I excited to hear from him now. He's down at the finish line with Alex and Vicky. He is indeed the inaugural PTO European Open champion. Stands alongside. I'm not actually going to repeat what you said as you cross the finish line because we are a very much a family show. But what I will say is it seems to mean quite a lot. Give us a little reaction to today. Yeah, I hope, I hope there are no microphones at the finish there. But um, no, I just, I just think uh, you don't get many chances to to race these guys. You know, like they, there's what made triathlon and. Uh, it's just a privilege to go up against, you know, Jan, Ali, Christian. They literally made the sport for us guys. So, um, yeah, it's quite, quite emotional. But, um, yeah, it's, I love racing. And uh, to race like that with Christian breathing down your neck is um, it's just literally what you live for. So um, I couldn't have asked for more, really. Just to give you a moment. And to sort of collect your breath, I actually just had a word with your girlfriend Holly, who I'm afraid to say is in floods of tears. She can't talk either. Tell us a little bit about the emotions of this for someone like you. You're talking about racing and now beating some of the greatest names in triathlon. Yeah, we we literally just like me, my brother, my girlfriend, and it's not just literally our family, a family project almost. Our masseuse, um, Wayno, <laughs> shout out to Wayno, um, and that's literally. Literally hit no no bullshit signs. Family just show, a, family show, Max. <laughs> family show. A, just a power meter and uh, bloody hard work and uh, being smart. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just uh, this is for uh, just going back to the basics. None of the crap, just the basics. No, yeah. No shit, really. OK, we are once again a family show. I'm going to have to apologise to our younger viewers who are joining us. Sorry, but Vicky, I it. I mate, you, 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 it's your day. I would love yeah, to say you, you can, can do say what you want, but we've got to keep it within the boundaries. Vicky. Max, you've alluded to it already. Racing against three of the greatest athletes, possibly the greatest athletes we've ever seen in triathlon, is something that not many people will ever get to do. We're not sure we're ever going to see them together again. What was it like, those final few kilometres, leading the show and knowing you had Christian 20, 30 seconds behind you? Did that come into your mind, that I'm leading Christian Blumenfeld right now? Oh, 100%, the, the entire time. Um, you know, you can never... 
you never, I never expected to ever be in, uh, winning. Um, you always want to win, but um, you never, you never say you're, you're going to win. It's just, it's just, you're just being an idiot if you did that. So, um, I mean, you can put yourself in that position. There was a couple of moments in the bike there where I saw Christian and Jan were struggling a bit, and uh, yeah, Kyle and uh, Ali really pushed the pace in the bike, and. Um, yeah, I, I, I raced my own race and uh, paced it well on the run and um, have a lot of fishing at the end. Well, yeah, I mean, you've had some amazing results in the past. Of course, we can't look past fourth in Kona. But for some reason, and probably it's as you said, because you're a real small outfit, a family affair, you sort of fly under the radar a little bit. I don't think that's going to be happening anymore, Max. I think you've just announced yourself onto the world stage. Yeah, no, I just hate Instagram. I, uh, <laughs> I never post. I despise it, but... Um, yeah, look, you don't have to be putting your training up. You don't have to be saying everything you're doing every day to be the world's best sort of thing. So, um, yeah, we keep it small. We keep it exciting, uh, fun, and, uh, yeah, that's just what we do. In terms of the game plan today, when you mapped out how you wanted it to go, how closely did you stick to it? And was there a point at which you began to think, hang on, this is now exactly where I want it? Yeah, um, when we had a little gap, um, I struggled the first two laps of the bike coming up the hill. Uh, Ali was really pushing it quite hard there. Um, and then my legs came good at the, the last two laps. And uh, yeah, um, you can never tell how much the gap is on the bike because it's really, it's really hard to tell. But I think we had a minute at the end of the run, uh, end of the bike. And uh, yeah, I sort of paced it the first two laps. Christian wasn't sort of coming back too much. And had a, I had a rough lap. I think I lost 20 seconds in one lap. And I thought this is going to be a rough last lap. But um, yeah, I held on and uh, went deep and didn't quite collapse, but I uh, wasn't far off. <laughs> you held on, you yeah. crossed first. You have beaten some of the greatest names, as we said, in triathlon. Congratulations. You are the PTO European Men's Inaugural Champion. Well done, Max. Thank you very Good much, guys. You. Thanks, well PTO. So congratulations once again to Max Newman. He bags $100,000 and all the bragging rights here in Ibiza as well. Coming in at number two was Christian Blumenfeld and filling up that podium was Magnus Dietlev. We have people's consensus goat, is he? Uh, maybe, I think so. Jan Fredino, number four. Jason West with a blistering run in at five. Alistair Brownlee, the legend, in at six. Daniel Beckergaard, a great race from here at seven. Ben Knutz in eighth. Carl Smith, ninth. And Aaron Royal in at 10. And front to back, it was a very, very strong field. Some really big players out there today, making up 17 finishes. A fantastic race around the streets of Ibiza. But Max Newman will be the man of the moment. A lot of people will be stalking his Strava pages. It doesn't sound like he puts an awful lot out there on the socials. I know I struggle to find out much about him. But I'm afraid he's going to have to open up a little bit more because we want to know his secret, especially when you go out and beat a field like that. Okay, so a massive race from him. But there's another man that's uh, been catching the attention of a few people. It's Christian Blumenfeld. Let's hear what he had to say. Thank you, John. Yes, Christian is alongside. A man of your reputation and of your extraordinary ability. Is it congratulations on getting home or is it a bit of a commiseration that it isn't quite the top step today? It's a seasonal opener, we can call it, and it's something to build on. It's nice to be on the podium, but I feel, it's a, little bit, I feel a little bit like in Edmonton, in the Canadian Open last year, where yeah, you, know, you, you do want to touch that tape, you don't want to see that guy 20 seconds ahead, and sort of coming into the finish shoot just in front of you. But yeah, it was a great racing from Max in front. Uh, and yeah, it was a seasonal opener, and. Uh, it's good to be back with a new year. Hindsight's a wonderful thing, coulda, woulda, shoulda, but do you look back now, and I know it's only moments since the race is finished, is it, was there a moment in the race which, with hindsight, you wish you could probably have changed it? Yeah, I think uh, maybe it was halfway through on the bike when Mon I think it was Alistair who were pushing the pace up front through the roundabout and the way up again, and uh, the group split it up, and I could either gone then, or when uh, Magnus was bridging up later on, so uh, uh, I was maybe, yeah, holding back, or I could have tried maybe to follow with him and put in a search there, and uh, uh, but I was sort of hoping that the same would get, happen to the front guys as it happened in Edmonton, where people were really feeling it on the run. 
So I was uh, still uh, playing my card on the runner and uh, I was gambling a bit too much with the uh, mucks up front. Okay. And you seem to be so close to the front all day but just never quite getting there. How frustrating was that when you sort of get towards the end of the race and you're like, I'm so close but I just haven't quite made it there? Uh, I think it shows that maybe just a little bit more of like those speedy sessions uh, that we'll get uh, through the next couple of uh, weeks. Like I have two more races this month and uh, I think I will sort of respond quite well on that. So even already next week when I'm heading to Japan, I will bounce back from this race and get a little bit closer to sort of the race pace and uh, I will get it more naturally then. So, but, but the base is good after a long winter. And you've done two of the PTO Tour races now. We take the Collins Cup outside. Two second place finishes. It you hurts. Got, it hurts. You know, you know a I want that like top you. step. And, uh, whew, yeah, You're going to have to come back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, Asian Open, Singapore. And there I'm, I can't, I can't complain on the speed there because I'm coming straight from the Paris test event uh, two days earlier then. So the leg speed should definitely be in my yeah, body for them. I, I just want to ask you on a broader scale. I know it's, as we said, it's just moments since the race finished, but it's a small consolation that you've led Alistair and Jan home in the battle of the big three. But just talk to us about this event and how much it means to you to have the biggest and the best on that start line. And, and I suppose the profile that we're now seeing of events like this outside of the world of triathlon. Well, I think that's what's driving us every single day in training, like uh, to race against the best. And uh, uh, even in Hawaii last year, I had a really tough battle with Max. And I think I underestimated, under, underestimated a little bit uh, on the bike back then as well. So uh, for next time, I really have to put him up there as one of the <laughs> big guys uh, when he's standing on the pontoon. And um, yeah, uh, but I think in terms of the, the three of us, me, Ali and John, we, we all lost to Max. And uh, yeah, it's about getting that top uh, step of the podium. Well, I tell you what, triathlon viewers have certainly won with watching the three of in action. Well done, Christian. Thank, Thank you very much. Good on you. Well done, mate. Brilliant. Well, it's been really interesting listening to those interviews. I think, first of all, Max's line that stuck out for me, it's what you live for when talking about having Christian Blumenfeld breathe down your neck. Yeah, <laughs> it's a strange thing to, to live for, isn't it? But I think it's the thrill of the race, the thrill of the competition, that, that person hunting you down and you've just got the mental games that come into it. It just doesn't happen often in life. And it doesn't happen. You could race it 10 times a year and 10 times a year for 10 years, you might get that once or twice. It's just that thrill. And uh, you could really see that in his interview, couldn't you? That's just that emotion there. Yeah, clearly got into the flow state. Fantastic race from him. And, and then, of course, Christian Blumenfeld started by saying, you know, it's season opener to kind of just get that in there, which is true. And uh, but then already saying I need some speed sessions and looking to bounce back. But again, the thing that cut through is how much this one hurt. Yeah, it hurts to lose, isn't it? That's what he said. That's what it's on his on his bike. And uh yeah, I think it fires him up. He doesn't like to lose, but, you know, he's not the athlete that has... He doesn't win everything. You know, he has lost mainly to Gustav Eden <laughs> in the past, but he <laughs> has he lost races. he spent a lot of time with him as well, yeah. so it's a constant reminder. <laughs> but he does come back really strong, and I think it's exciting that we're going to see him later on in the season racing these races, racing this distance. Uh, it's exciting to know we, we're getting him back again. Yeah, and he noted that it's time to put Max up there. Sounds like they had a duel in Hawaii. Yeah, they were because it was it was uh, Gustav Eden first, Sam Laidlow second, um, Christian Blumenfeld third, and Matt Newman was coming from behind. He was that one that came fourth. So, yeah, it was that battle there. And like I said, Matt Newman just wasn't talked about. And whether that is just because he's, like you said, he's not a big fan of the social media, he's not putting himself out there. But I think you're right. He might have to start doing it a bit more now. The the pressure might be on to get some more information out there. Yeah, and this is what's wonderful about the sport is there's there's always someone else right there's always going to be someone else and today that someone else was max newman yeah really special story there and uh, yeah 
we can never predict. We're all talking about the big three and someone else snuck in there. Some, some other great performances out there as well, but uh, Magnus Dietlev has been earmarked for greatness for a while. He's obviously, you know, compounding on his previous seasons again. It's the, to echo Christian's point, you know, first race. So the, the winter's work is done and they're try, still trying to find out where they're at. But again, I mean, he did what we thought he did. Did, did he impress you enough on the run? I don't think the run, w the run was where he maybe was a little bit weaker. He came out a lot better in the swim than I thought he would because he wasn't far behind Christian. His bike was so impressive to put down that bike and the amount of power it takes for him to close down that gap, get to the front of the race. And that's why we might have seen that bike, that run fall away. Sorry, that just that, he just didn't quite have the edge, but he had um, put in a big effort on the bike. So we will be seeing the... Uh the medal ceremony very soon for the men. Of course, we'll be checking back in with the, the women's race too. Uh, whilst we wait on that, Helen, you've been around this sport for a very long time. I think you have personal relationships with some of these greatest athletes as well. You have um, Alistair Brownlee, Jan Fredino, now Christian Blumenfeld. You know, give, give us a, a sense of how special that actually is really special to have them all together in one race and although they weren't all on the podium it was uh, yeah what a day for triathlon fans but back to live racing now and there's lucy charles barkley but hold that thought because uh we're now with magnus dietlev on the on the finish line We were going to speak to Magnus, but he's actually gone to the podium, having had a, a good afternoon of it. He said he was a happy man. We'll hopefully catch up with him a little bit later on, but the, uh, the top three are on their way to the steps. I think Alex needs to get faster. He just needs to get a little faster. Magnus Dietlev is just that bit too quick for him, but uh, hopefully we'll be catching up with a few more of the finishers as we uh, round off the medal ceremony. As we see Lucy Charles Barkley on a slight gradient there on the bike. She's still a minute 33, but look who's in second place. Ashley Gentle. She loves it at the 100 kilometer races. And that is a promising position for her and her fans. Followed by Paula Findlay as well. One thing to note, Ashley Gentle was not at full fitness and that this wasn't just a, a form thing that we saw off the back of a race she did on the east coast of spain but I, I don't think that she's been as well as she would like to have been coming a few snivels coming into this race so although she's in a really good position now hopefully she can you know just uh, run through whatever it is that's lingering yeah it's always a bit of a risk she's had that international travel a couple of races and you know, you push your body, you put your body on the edge and you do pick up colds and different things going on. And we, we weren't sure what was happening this week. But at the moment, like she looks, she's right up there. She's a minute 30 down. She's in the best position she's ever been in a PTO race. She's never That's been this point. close to the front. So really exciting. And let's see what happens on the run. It is getting increasingly exciting for the women, particularly with that battle between Lucy Charles Barkley and Ashley Gentle. See Daniela Reef there in 11th. Emma Pallant Brown, who had a win the duathlon uh, here, actually in Ibiza this week. Yeah, but that's our lead group there, isn't it? Finley, Wilms, Lee, Clark, Gentle, Vanilla Langbridge there as well, and Sarah Perez Salah. Oh, she's dropped off a bit. She was with that group, but has just uh, slipped off the pace. But there's still kind of that that group that's chasing. But Lucy Charles Barkley's extended her lead. That gap did come down, but it's gone back out now. Any it's, surprises in that group for you? Uh, I think India Lee just having that fantastic swim. I've heard she's been in really good shape, and and she showed that earlier in um, earlier on this year in 70.3 Lands Rotti. But yeah, she had a great swim, and she was having the race of her life last year at the 70.3 Worlds in the front group and had a penalty. So. I think this is a bit of redemption for her. She's in the front group this time. She wants to get out there. She wants to show what she can do because she just didn't get to show it last year. Training in Loughborough, I believe. Now, as I say, staying close to home. 
in preparation ahead of this one? Yeah, I'm not, I don't know. She's been based in a few different um, kind of triathlon centres around the UK, but that's where she currently is. It's a great centre there. She's got some great training partners. I think one of them's Kat Matthews, so um, who's also, you know, a top class athlete at this distance. So, it's, yeah, it's really good shape coming in. I think Fenella Langbridge, another great ride from her. Rebecca Beck Clark as well. I mean, she's always a good swimmer, but she's really put herself up there. And she stayed in contention in this bike when some of the other athletes we might have expected to be up there, like Holly Lawrence, have slipped off the place. So a great ride there from Beck Clark. What a backdrop, what a setting to a wonderful day of racing here at the PTO European Open. The men's race has finished. New stars, old stars, legends of the sport all on the course. The women are still out and we're excited to see how that shakes out as they uh, hop off the bikes and start running towards the finish line. But creeping up on us now is the men's medal ceremony. That's a nice, it's a nice bit of scenery behind that as well. Nice boats. Is one of those yours? <laughs> That'd be nice. I did go down there the other day to have a good look at the run course, and yeah, the boats are good. <laughs> they were very nice. Maybe some of the athletes, if they've earned enough money now, they can uh, go for a cruise <laughs> round, uh, round the harbour on a higher, higher yacht. Senor yeah. Off they go. Party on Jan Frodeno's boat or something uh, to, to wrap up the weekend, maybe. Great stuff. Well, we'll send it down and uh, let's have this medal ceremony, shall we? Let's uh, give these guys their moments. Gentlemen, welcome to the medal ceremony of the 2023 PTO European Open. Presenting today will be Vicente Mari, Presente Conce Ibiza, Marisol Casado, World Triathlon President and IOC member, Rafael Ruiz, Mayor of Ibiza, and Chris Como, Chair PTO. Enzese Lucar, y ganador de la medalla de bronce. In third place, and the winner of the bronze medal, representing Denmark, Magnus Dietlev. In second place, and the winner of the silver medal, representing Norway, Christian Blumenfeld. In primer lugar, y ganador de la medalla de oro en el PTO European Open 2023. In first place, and the winner of the gold medal at the 2023 PTO European Open, representing Australia, Max Newman. Ladies and gentlemen, and now, please join us for the champagne celebration. Ladies and gentlemen, run and hide. Some champagne coming our way. 
Congratulations to all the winners of the 2023 PTO European Open. What a fantastic race. Magnus Ditlev in third, Christian Blumenfeld in second, and our champion, Max Newman, Australia. Well done, boys. Congratulations. What an epic moment here to finish this race in the beautiful port of Ibiza. And ladies and gentlemen, right now, we are going to continue with our race day since the pro women's race is still in progress. So we will go back to the finish line and welcoming our pro female athletes. And the race finish. Fantastic race there by the men, but the women are still very much out on the course and it is a hugely competitive field today, Helen. A, a wonderful lineup, eight out of the 10 top uh, PTO, top 10 ranked ladies are racing as we see Lucy Charles Barkley and Ashley Gentle, one and two, Charles Barkley out in top spots. I think there's about 144 between them. Yeah, it's it's pretty close. And Ashley Gentle is, I think, within striking distance. We don't. She doesn't need to be at the front of those races. We've seen from the last couple, she has that running ability. I think in Dallas, she ran four minutes faster than the rest of the field. She was that much better. So, yeah, she's in a great position, and she's with a great company there. Paula Finley chasing her down. Lottie Vilms, India Lee, Beck Clark, Fenella Langridge. It's yeah, it's a really good field, but. Lucy Charles Barkley just pulling away from all of them, as she does. Yeah, she did back herself to come out on top, uh, which is wonderful. I don't think it should be uh, looked at in any other way than, than confidence and the preparation that she's put in has given her that kind of confidence. And we're seeing now as I she's powering away on that bike. Yeah, I love that. The confidence to say, yeah, I'm going to back myself. I think I can do this. And I think with Lucy as well, she's really happy at the moment. She's been on a great altitude camp and she was able to take her family, her two dogs with her, which for her, if she's happy, she's got those home comforts around her. I think she really thrives and she's come here really confident and really ready to execute a good race. So Ashley Gentle is the is holding the top spots in the PTO rankings at the moment. Lucy Charles Barkley just behind her, a surprising number two, I think, if you'd have asked her and everyone else at the beginning of 2022 after she faced major surgery. But she's just so resilient, uh, such a great athlete, and obviously listens well to the medical team to be able to put, it, put herself back together and get back to racing. As I think we see Paula Finley on a pass here. Yeah, that's Paula Finley moving into the lead. Now, there is a good group of them, so you feel like they might be shuffling around a little bit, uh, maybe sharing that lead in different sections of the course. We see that that's interesting. N ninth and tenth, we've got further back Jocelyn McCauley and Anne Haug. Now, that's a really strong pairing. It looks like those two are working together. They have brought down that time gap. It was over three minutes. Great stuff. There's a bit of a different energy between uh, Ashley Gentle and Daniela to uh, Christian and Jan. It was, Ashley was almost saying, it was like, I'm privileged to be in the company of Daniela Reefens and some of the other women on the course today, but she, she 
does now believe that she deserves to be in that conversation. Yeah, well, you see her. She's right up the front here alongside Paula Finley. She's, yeah, putting herself in the best position in these races. So Lucy Charles Barkley is leading out the PTO European Tour race on the bike right now ahead of Paula Findlay and Ashley Gentle. And it's a select group that's made that, that cut because there is a few athletes that were around them in the swim that haven't managed to hold on to that pace, that, that chase group pace. But no one is matching Lucy Charles Barkley's pace at the currently. And these are her, her stats, her rankings. She is known as the best swimmer in this field. She is the fourth best biker in this field and sixth best runner. And that gives her an overall second, I'm assuming, to uh, Ashley Gentle. Yeah, the last time check was about a minute 45, but um, yeah, one minute 45 back to Ashley Gentle. So she's pretty close and with that strength of run, she could get there. Head down in that aero position, just churning out the kilometers. Yeah, it just looks so smooth and consistent. I don't think her body position has changed from the start of this ride. She just locks in. You can see there she's working hard, that head movement. Just really, just that's Lucy Charles Bart. She's such a familiar figure at the front of the race. On her new Cube Arium C68X. A beautiful rig. Paula Finley there, she's in second. So we do see Ashley Gentle, Paula Finley. They're, they're definitely changing around that lead during these laps mainly using each other to try and keep within distance. When Lucy was being quizzed about her strategy for this style of racing, this middle distance, she's she kind of alluded to the fact that she's always been intense in her training, always fast, not kind of typical for someone who's done so well at Ironman. So she believes that this is that's the perfect kind of setup and approach for the 100 kilometer race. Yeah, and I feel like Lucy Charles Buckley, her background, she's, I mean, she's a, such a good swimmer. She just missed that Olympic qualifying back in London 2012. She wanted to continue as a swimmer, but just felt a bit burnt out by the whole situation and took up triathlon for fun, thought she'd enter an Ironman for fun. And uh, obviously has found out she's very good at it and uh, become one of the best in the world. So, but yeah, that intensity, that ability to apply yourself hard, that just comes from that swimmer's background, that swimming mentality. and. She's just brought that to the sport. Yeah, I think I'm right in saying she went from ex-swimmer to triathlon novice to double world champion within a couple of years, which is absolutely bonkers. Uh, but we have a partner of one of the triathletes in transition at the moment, or on the finish line of, of Ashley Gentle, and Eric Lagerstrom is down with Vicky. Yeah, oh, down at the finish line here with Eric, who is, of course, Paula Finlay's partner. Eric. I feel like you must be the busiest man in triathlon. Not only do you race yourself, you're here supporting Paula, you're a digital content creator for your That Triathlon Life brand. How do you fit all that in? Uh, it's a pretty delicate balancing act and I think we handle it pretty well, but uh, I think a lot of triathletes have a little bit of time between training and I just kind of, instead of laying on the couch, I'm laying on the couch with a laptop. Brilliant answer. So. We talk a bit about Paula, of course, she's out in the race right now. And you said to me just before we came on air that you, she, you're really pleased with what she's doing right now because normally she goes to the front and drags everyone along, but she's playing it a bit smarter today. Uh, that's how I'm choosing to interpret it, I hope. We, we talked about it and I, we were talking about it last night. And I said, you know, if you get to the front, please just don't drag everybody through the entire race. Like, it's okay to be in second wheel, see how it goes. So hopefully that's what's going on. And the other option is that maybe she's not feeling as good, but... I'm going with option one. We hope it's option one. And she is right now about 146 down. She's in that main chase group behind Lucy Charles. She's got Ashley Gentle for company. But of course, we've seen Paula on her day. She can take on anyone. Do you think she's feeling that? I don't know. It's hard to say. It's uh, We still feel like it's a little bit early in the season for a race of this caliber. It really feels like we're at World Championships right now, but it's, it's not September. Um, so she was pretty stressed, feeling like, oh, I'm not ready, I haven't put enough training or anything. So it's hard to get a read on like where you're actually at, but judging from how it's going so far, I think 
she must be feeling at least a little bit okay. I always feel that Paul is quite quiet, softly spoken, and doesn't seem to have that huge confidence in herself. But when she's fit and ready, when she's been able to be uninjured, her run is an absolute weapon as well. And has she managed to go through the winter, the off-season, without injury problems? Yeah, she has. Uh, the only thing that comes with that is you're a little more tired than usual, and I think she has done well sometimes off of, like, being injured and like building up this huge bike strength and then like the run is a question mark and there's no pressure versus right now she's been training well she's fit and she's ready to go from what we can tell and and that comes with it a little bit more expectation and it's it's harder than if you're like no idea what's gonna happen out there i'm just gonna wing it and you've just come over from the states you've been in flagstaff which is at altitude and that can often impact you a little bit when you come down to sea level some people fly immediately some people feel a bit flat has paul been feeling okay this week no <laughs> <laughs> She's been feeling, feeling pretty bad. Uh, we, we came down 10 days ago. We actually did a race in uh, St. Anthony's uh, Triathlon. It's like a legendary race in Florida. We both felt terrible there. Luckily, she was still able to win that. Uh, but ever since then, we, we came over and we've been trying to get over the jet lag while getting the altitude thing. So I raced yesterday. I actually felt okay just randomly right on time, and I'm hoping that's what's up with her. Just Sometimes that's what it is. You feel terrible the night before, and then the day of, it comes around. Well, the hope... That is what's happening for Paula today. We'll let you get so. back out there to track her on course. Thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot. Yeah, sorry about that, Paula. I just passed your man over to Ashley before then. But, uh, yeah, great to hear from Eric talking about the training and the, and the build-up. And, yes, I'm glad I'm not the only one who suffers when they travel across time zones. No, it's, it's really tough. And I love the, I think just the mental aspect comes into it of how you're feeling that week. And you can be like, oh, I'm feeling so tired. I'm feeling so tired. And you can't let that drag you down. And because how you feel in the week or the days leading up to the race doesn't always affect how you perform. It, in fact, very rarely affects how you perform on the actual day. So, but you really have to try and cancel all that out, ignore it, and just kind of focus on, on the race on race day. And hopefully Paul is able to do that and deliver a good performance today. Just had news that we have a, Chelsea Sodaro has uh, pulled out of the race, from what I understand, unofficially. So we'll, we'll give you more on that uh, when we get it, as we focus in on the, the top riders at the moment. 7.6 kilometers to go to transition. Nice spot in the field for strong runners like Ashley Gentle. Yeah. She is uh, a minute and 51 down now on Lucy Charles Barkley. Yeah, Lucy Charles Barkley seems to be accelerating over this last lap or so and really pulling, um, putting a bit more time into that chase group. But it is a, it's a strong chase group there with Finley and Gentle in there. Also Fenella Langbridge in there, India Lee, and India Lee's got a good run on her too. Lottie Films as well. She's already had a few races this season, so that's down in Australia. So that's maybe been a big start, good start to her season. Kind of shaken off that first race thing. A lot of athletes, this is their first race. Yeah, Ash Gentle down into fourth. Interesting thing with her and Paula Finley both suffered like heartbreak with the Olympics, but really found their mojo with uh, longer course racing. Yeah, it, it is like that. I think for Ashley Gentle, it's been, as someone, I've known her for such a long time, and I think I wasn't at that World Championships. I think she was 16 when she won her first World Championships medal back as a junior. So she's been in the sport for so long and seen so much. But her last Olympics was, was pretty brutal. She came out of COVID. She wasn't able to go and race internationally, pretty much went into an Olympic Games blind. And I think she was pretty battered and bruised by that whole experience mentally. And it's been so good to see her come out and just find her distance. This just suits her to down to the ground. She's really come out and shown. And I love that um, interview where we heard her talk about she just got that buzz back. She got that fire back in her stomach. And even if she hadn't have won that race in Canada, she just, it was so good to feel alive and love the sport and love racing again. Yeah. So yeah, fantastic stories there. And it's good there's kind of a distance for everyone at triathlon. Yeah, it would appear that way. Just going back down the field and we've got Daniela Reef not riding well by her standards today. No, she's further down. She's currently sat in, I think, 11th position and is losing time on the leaders. So really not what we normally see from Daniela. And I think that's the way it's been over the last few years. She is 
one of the greatest of all time. And you sure. can't discount that. But over the last couple of years, she's either on or she's off. And, and we don't know which Daniela we're going to get on the day. But she was definitely motivated for this race. She was really thrilled to be out there and taking on the challenge and competing against all of these. This is such a strong women's field, but really doesn't seem like it's her day today. Annie Haug is doing a little bit better. She's in 10th, but she's she's going good guns at the moment. Yeah, she's riding really well. And she's got, she did have um, Jocelyn McCauley with her, who is another excellent rider. So that would um, really help her in pulling, pulling back that time. Jocelyn McCauley raced Ironman Texas just a couple of weeks ago. So I'm not sure how her run legs are going to be after yeah. with an Ironman in them. And she's just coming off the back of a running injury, but still has those incredible bike legs to put down a fast time split over the 80k distance she's just outside that lead pack at the moment by about 30 seconds Let's check out the race pace then we see that it's paula finley who's the paciest if you like ashley gentle and then lucy charles barkley so it's pretty tight there it is pretty tight yeah really um all very similar speeds like, and say that gap to Lucy Charles had has been it's been up and down it's been about that it's got went down to 120 it's been up to 145 it's been hovering in that mix so we would expect similar paces and sorry Anne Haug isn't with Jocelyn McCauley anymore sorry but that one uh, that one wrong Daniela Reef is next to her so Annie Haug now has managed to get close to um, Sarah Perez Seller also oh, and Jocelyn McCauley there is a bit of a gap between them Yeah, fire up your PTO website and head on over to the blog. The social team are doing a, a kind of written broadcast, if you like. So the bits that you might not see here, they'll have you covered. They also have the tracker there, too. So you can see how this race moves around. And it's not long now till the end of the bike. We see the distance to go just dipped under that five kilometers. And I think this is where there's a mind shift. You, you have to stay focused on the bike and keeping pushing to the end, but you automatically start thinking a little bit further forward and maybe thinking, how are my legs going to feel on the run? And maybe start thinking, making sure you've got that last kind of nutrition and hydration that you need while you're on the bike, because it's easier to take it on the bike than it is on the run. Just going back now through the group, we've got Fenella Langbridge, there's Beck Clark in the red suit. And there is our leader, Lucy Charles Barkley, who is aiming her bike towards town and the transition zone. Well, she'll park her cube and she'll put on her runners and take to the streets of Ibiza. And that's where things get really interesting. Yeah, I can't wait to see how this run plays out. It's just exciting to see these, these great runners in the field, the, the runners that were a threat, that gentle Annie Haug, they're moving forward, they're in the mix. They're not too far away from that front. So Lucy Charles Barkley just gobbling up the tarmac as she brings about the bike leg, her bike leg to a close. Just a kilometer to go now for her. She's starting to strip off the Velcro. Let's get her feet ready. Yeah, the feet go on top of the shoes, just anything for it to save an extra couple of seconds in transition. You don't want to be running uh, through transition in bike shoes. Yes. <laughs> it would not be the most comfortable Skating thing to do. Skating through transition on bike shoes. Yeah, every second counts, I would imagine, at this point. I think every second counts when she knows the caliber of runners behind her. She really doesn't want to give it up. And like we saw in the men's race, it can come down. It can get really close and every second yeah. is going to be important. There's Annie Haug on the bike. Great to get a shot of her. So she's currently in ninth, but she's had a really good ride. And you were talking earlier about her form as well. So she's always someone that you've got to keep an eye on. Oh, always. I and mean, we know she's got a good run. And the two races she's had already this year, fantastic runs, but incredible bike performances too. So Lucy is in transition. She 
she'll be hoping for a smooth process through T2. Quite nice to be the first one in. There's no other bikes there. Quite easy to find your spot. <laughs> Doesn't it look tidy yeah. as well? <laughs> Very tidy. Socks on first. Yeah, she's got a bit of room. She's got a bit of a buffer to the others, so I guess she can put on the socks, but it is a personal decision. Some people don't bother, but she uh, has made the decision. She'll be more comfortable. And out she goes. Great bike there by Lucy Charles Barkley. She maintains her lead. And she's had no one see. She hasn't seen anyone the whole day. She's only would have seen the athletes on the turnarounds, but they've always been over a minute behind her. It's been a lonely ride. Has indeed. A lonely race when you consider the swim as well. Yeah, she's been on her own pretty much since the first 20 metres of the swim, I guess. <laughs> and no one's uh, been in within touching distance. She's desperate to get back to the top spot. Yeah, she really wants that world number one back. She had it for a short time. She really enjoyed it. <laughs> Would like to have it back. And she's going to do everything possible this year to, to get it back. One of the most popular triathletes, men or women. She has a fantastic job of, again, documenting. Looks like some of her peers do, but she's got a very strong YouTube channel. It's a fascinating insight. I think it's her sister who's behind the camera there. So you see that the guard is down and you get to, you get to know her a little bit better. Yeah, it's, she's really open and really fun on there. You really do get a good insight into what it's like to be a professional triathlete. Get to see her set up at home with the sauna and the ice bath as well. Very jealous of that <laughs> setup that she's got. That's Paula Finley, Ashley Gentle, they're racking near each other, being kind of two of the top ranked athletes. India Lee there. Lottie Burns, Beck Clark, they're all in. It's funny how there's just a different process. So people, it, it, what they attack, tackle first. Yeah, it's very different. And I think it's, it's something that you would practice um, definitely in short course rating, them mentally kind of going through it, what list of what order are you going to do things? Which way is you going to do? Like helmet off first, shoes off. So yeah, you do cut down your own kind of routine. There was a really big push from Annie Howe there. She's really closed that gap over the last few kilometers of the bike, and she's almost right on top of that chase group. You see that really fast. So they were the times coming into transition. Biggest challenges there to Lucy Charles Barkley, Ashley Gentle, just for coming off winning the last two PTO Opens. Annie Haug, she's going in in ninth position, but only two minutes down. Her runs have been devastating this year. I don't think we can discount Paula Finley either. She's, she's shown she can perform on the big day. She's already got a second at one of the PTO Opens in Canada. So it's going to be a real battle between these women. Yeah, Annie Howe's run in Lanzarote smashed some of the men's times in the professional ranks. Yeah, it was really impressive. And her last race in Gran Canary, which was just two weeks ago, I th the run was a bit short, so that the time is, is maybe not as relevant as a overall time. But she was less than a minute behind most of the men. It was an absolutely incredible run. And I think that what's different there, she, she won by such big margins, so she wasn't under pressure. She could have eased back if she wanted to. So I'm really intrigued today. Is she going to run better with someone to chase, or does she run better where she can just run her own pace, her own fast, even pace? So she's really been pushing it the last few races. She's won, but she's won by such a huge amount. Yeah, very exciting stuff. Let's see what she can put together. And the final leg is Emma Pallant Brown and Daniela Reef just coming into transition. They've come in together. Emma Pallant Brown, she's she's had a great year already. She's she's only she went to do a triathlon but got sick and couldn't compete. So she's done half marathons. She's done bike races. She became world duathlon champion last weekend yeah, for the third time. Um, so she's got good run shape. She's maybe a little bit further down than she would have liked, but she's used to being in this position. She's used to running from behind. 
Daniela Reef, not the bike she would have wanted. I think she would have wanted more. She really hasn't been on a A game for the bike today. Let's see what she can pull back on the run. It's a real star-studded cast though, isn't it? Even as we get into double figures coming through transition. And we've got Holly Lawrence there coming in in 13th position into transition. She's a world champion, half Ironman world champion as well. She's she's always in the mix, Holly Lawrence, and it's, it's unusual to see her over five minutes down. But the, these women can use each other on the run, maybe work together. They've got a good group that might make them a bit faster and be able to get back closer to the front. Big points, PTO points to go on the board. Really good prize money as well. And that is why it's attracting. I think she, did she just yeah, lose something? Yeah, Daniel just there? dropped something there. I'm wondering if that's going to be a. Would that be a penalty? We'll, we'll find out anyway. But um, it was completely an accident. She would have picked it up if she'd known she dropped that. She wouldn't want to lose any race nutrition heading out onto the course. As we see Holly Lawrence there just getting her shoes on, getting prepared for this 18K run. Yes, yeah, so I was just taking a look at my um, infringement sheet, but I. Nothing different. I can't really see anything but unintentional littering in transition. No, I think unintentional, I think you'd be fine. There's Anna Reichman there coming in. It's Holly heading out. That's Tamara Dewitt coming in. And she can run. She can run, but she is a long way down. Six minutes. I mean, she's a fast runner, but six, min so, six minutes is a long way. Yeah. But she, she definitely has the potential to move her way up through the field. We could, we could be looking at her to break in, well, definitely into the top 10 from that position. Maybe even top five with the speed she's running. So Lucy Charles Barkley, Paula Finley, Ashley Gentle, that is your current podium, if you will. Very, very strong field indeed. What you see there is very likely to change. Yeah, even just by the Lucy Charles Barkley's running, she looks really good, she looks in form, but the speed we saw some of the others run out of transition, I think there's a few coming from behind that are definitely moving, are going to be moving well and really making inroads into this field. It's Ellie Salthouse just coming in. I think she would have liked to have been a bit further up there because she is really strong all round. There's Barbara Riveros heading out, four-time Olympian in triathlon. It's getting warmer here in Ibiza as well. Like we can feel it from our position. Yeah, I think the women definitely had a bit tougher going second today. They they really are hitting like the warm part of the day on the run. Choppy in the water as well, by yeah. comparison. <laughs> yeah. And Annie Haug is making up time already. She's climbed to fourth place. She's run 15 seconds into everyone else. A minute 49 down on LCB. That's so. uh, that's so impressive, isn't it? Over such a short space of time, and this is what has been waiting to see whether she can run even faster when she has somebody in front of her. But currently, Ashley Gentle in second, India Lee in third. Gentle's pulled back a little bit of time, not a huge amount yet, but we haven't been running for long. In five seconds. With uh, Annie Howe, in five seasons, she hasn't been outside of the podium spots other than her Collins Cup appearances. That's ridiculous. I mean, she's targeting, I think, uh, the favourable races to suit her skills, but she's so consistent as an athlete. Absolutely obsessed with triathlon as well. Yeah, and I think it's, you say picked races to suit her skills, and she's based herself in Lanzarote all over the winter, so she's done two races there. She did Lanzarote Ironman, then she nipped over to do Grand Canary. She's based herself in the Canaries, and that's worked for her. But I think the amount of experience she's got, she knows what works by now. And I th she's got to be looking to try and get back onto that, uh, back on top of the podiums this year. The podiums at the big races. Right. Yeah, lots of points available at these big races. Lots of money on the line as well. And I believe that Annie Haug has run herself into third place. Lucy Charles Barkley out there in front. 
And it, this is where it's tough, isn't it? She's been out there all day, and then you just have a target on your back the whole run. Everyone is coming from behind for you. You know it, and uh, it's tough. And I think, as we saw in the men's, Max Newman, especially of that last couple of laps, he's thriving on that. He, he knows Christian's coming for him, and it's, you're just running scared. But at this point, early on in the run, it can maybe feel like a bit of pressure, just that everyone's kind of bearing down on you, especially knowing how good some of the runners are from behind. And like uh, we saw her husband Reese early, I'm sure he's out there giving us some time checks, letting her know where where everyone is, where the big movers are coming from. Yeah, so Lucy Charles Barkley knows that she's she knows she has to have that mental fortitude and it's been refined over the years of coming out of the water always first. Like just eyes down, looking ahead. And then it's, you know, it's down to her to start feeling the breath of her competitors as if they get close. And yeah. it looks like Annie Haug might be the one to watch because she's closing in on Ashley Gentle. Already moved up to third position. She started the bike, I think she started the run in ninth, so a big, That's big move so incredible. far. Incredible. And just remind us how this run course works as well, Helen. Yeah, so it's an 18 kilometer run. They started at transition and they've kind of wound through the streets to the old town. And now they're going to complete six, two and a half kilometer laps. And then they're going to finish not by transition, but over here on the port. And those of you that weren't watching the men's race, I mean, how dare you? Where were you? Go back and watch it because it was fantastic. But you saw many opportunities where these athletes would pass one another. Yeah, lots of passing opportunities. And I think that's where the mind games come in. You have to look good. You have to be strong. Use those gaps as well. Like, you, like use, like, gauge where the people are. And I think you could use that for your confidence. I mean, it's really, it's really mentally challenging when you go around a turn and say, oh, last time I passed them by here, and this time I passed them further out or I passed them closer. So you really have to use the markers if you're not getting all the splits out there. So Lucy Charles Barkley imbued with this sense of I want to be the number one again. That potentially career-ending hip injury now in her past. She's come out a stronger athlete for it, both mentally and physically. Being out for nearly a year was, it really hurts her, but in Chamorin, it gave her a lot of confidence when she won the WT Long Championships. Yeah, and I, I think, as well with the pacing, we might expect Lucy to lose a bit of time over the first few kilometers because she led the whole bike ride on her own. So maybe you'd expect like a kilometer or two for her to either get into her stride, get into her rhythm, and then those gaps might change. But it does seem like the pace that Annie Haug is catching, that she could close down that time. But I would expect to see Lucy kind of improve as the laps go on as, as well. This first lap after being out front on your own, we may see just a little bit slower. I mean, to me, she already looks more comfortable, much more in her rhythm. The photographer almost in her past. <laughs> yeah, she's been up at altitude as well recently, putting in a camp, hasn't she? Yeah, she did a long camp for her, four weeks up in Font Rameau. I think, as she said, it's paid off really well. She feels like she's coming back to that form that we saw her in at the end of 2021, where she was right, the most dominant world champion over the half Ironman distance we've seen. And there is Ashley Gentle. now behind Annie Haug. Yeah, Annie Haug's made the move really early on. She's moving really well, isn't she? Ashley Gentle too, looking good. I think that's India Lee there in fourth position. It's having a really strong performance. But yeah, a Annie Haug already into second position. They haven't been running for that long. <laughs> that's crazy. Well, she's been showing just how good she's been running in the Recent appearances as their 3K into the run. That's Paula Findlay. Yeah, Paula's lost a bit of ground to the pack she came in with, but she's still got time now to find a rhythm. She's got good gaps to the athletes that are behind her. Anyhow, Will's already opening up a gap. 
Uh, I don't like to talk about athletes' ages because I feel like it shouldn't be a limiting factor, but she is the oldest athlete in the field, anyhow. Um, but she doesn't feel like it's an issue, so I feel like I'm 25. I don't even consider my age when I'm thinking about what I'm doing, which races I'm choosing. So there's a really refreshing attitude there. Yeah, and she's uh, proving that it can be done as well, time after time. It's just the, her commitment to the sport, so very impressive. 2020 Triathlete of the Year, still going very, very strong. Looks like she's going to have a great season in 2023 as well. Lucy Charles making the turn there. I mean, they have to do this a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of laps to do. Still got good support out there on the course. I think it'll just be growing as well. I mean, there's so many athletes in town due to the, the week long of events that's been on, multi-sport events. So there's a lot of fans out there who really know the sport. They know who all these athletes are. They haven't just kind of turned up and thought, oh, there's something going on. They, yeah. they really enjoy this and, and get behind the athletes. I'm pretty sure it was a piece of content that the PTO put out, but there was a, a couple that came over from mainland Spain when they learned that Lucy was racing today and uh, they were both talking about their, their health challenges and how they've been inspired by Lucy and how much it meant to be able to come over here and meet her. And that's the impact that these athletes are having. I know that a lot of them want to like, really spread the, the, the good word of triathlon and bring the younger generation in as well, but I, I don't think they always realise just the kind of impact that they're having on the wider population, when they show how resilient they are, when they can come back from serious injury and, and, and still perform at the very highest level in the most ridiculous sport, like triathlon as well. Yeah, a ridiculous sport, isn't it? And, and so one of the toughest sports, so it does inspire. It really does inspire other people to kind of take up the sport and, yeah, want to be like their idols. So we are live from Ibiza, the White Isle, the party destination as well. Many millions visit Ibiza over the course of a year. I think there were over four million visitors last year. Very popular destination, and it is the destination, the choice destination for these elite athletes. And we're going to send it down to the finish line. Uh, Vicky has a guest. So I'm down here with Bjorn Giesemann, who is, of course, the coach of Jocelyn McCauley, currently running in 10th-ish position. What do you make of that? It's perfect. Um, honestly, I, uh, if that would have been the scenario you told me yesterday, then I definitely would have picked it. Uh, she had a pretty well swim, like... In a packed field like this, 15, 20 seconds behind the group in front is always bad. So therefore she probably could have been even better at the, on the bike especially. But she made her way up um, out of the group with Daniela Reef and, and together with Annie Haug. So therefore, perfect position. If she can be near place 10, I'm absolutely fine. So I spoke to her this morning just as she was setting up in transition and she was almost a little bit emotional talking about missing her family back at home. Is that something that you as coach also have to, to work on? Are you, are you psychologist as well as coach trying to talk her through it? I, I don't know if I'm, if I'm a psychologist, but sure, if you care for her result today, then you have to take it into account. And then the solution was yesterday to just talk about it and tell her that she's not a machine and that it's totally normal that if you are six weeks on the road just being five days in between at home that you can struggle with that one because you're always priority is always more to be a mom than to be a professional triathlete that's pretty normal and therefore yeah we chatted about it and i think it's going to be fine today and she's showing that it's going to be fine so therefore good yeah you have to look after the whole person well thank you for joining us down here we'll get back out onto course thank you yeah, great to hear the more human side of the athletes there. They're not just machines, and uh, Jocelyn McCauley, she's a mum of two, so of course missing, uh, missing her family, but she's still putting in a really solid performance out there today, and uh, as her uh, coach seems happy with her and where she is on the race. Serious support networks needed by all of these athletes. It's interesting, we've got a much younger crop of athletes coming through to the longer distance triathlon scene, and... They don't have children, they have fewer responsibilities, and you can see their commitment to the sports 
But of course, there are others, uh, particularly in women's racing, that either want to have families or, or now have families. And there are things in place now to assist with the longevity of, of women's racing as well in triathlon. It's, yeah, it's, it's very interesting how it all works. Yeah, it was really interesting. I think highlighted probably by Chelsea Sodaro, unfortunately, um, DNF today, but the maternity policy with the PTO that freezes your rankings for an extended period of time really helps women who obviously want to be pro professional triathletes and mothers. So great initiative there. Lucy Charles, that gap is now less than a minute. And how often is she going to be able to check in with that? How is it? Will she know at this stage that Annie Howe is closing in fast? I will think, she have many spotters mm -hmm. out there? I think visually she'll see it on all of the turns, so she'll That's kind of have point. a little check. Yes, but I, I think, um, but yeah, it, to go past, like you know, her husband Reese, who's who used to be her coach, she's now coached by Dan Lorang, But Reese is still heavily involved with her program, and, and he races alongside her as well in, in several races. So I think seeing him and maybe him giving a time and check and just that little shout of encouragement he might know those cue words that kind of relax her get her into a rhythm what are those words that he can say that no one else probably knows that are going to help her in that moment so really although she's seeing the time checks i think more importantly just that shout from a friend or a coach who really knows what it means to you in that moment do do lucy and annie haug share the same coach or have i got that wrong yeah they do have the same coach That is interesting that they both uh, share the same coach. But uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see how that one shakes out. Now the former Olympian and 2019 Ironman world champion has seen a lot of racing, but Annie Haug is excited by the current competition to bring out her best. My goal for Ibiza is just to, to get on the limit of my performance. I mean, the women's field is like amazing at the PDO. I think everyone will show up because it's just a unique opportunity and you have to be on top of your game to even have the slightest chance of making a podium there. I absolutely love the really, really hard run sessions on the treadmill. That's what I absolutely love because I don't know why, but running comes a bit naturally to me. and. I just need a few hard sessions and then I immediately feel um, yeah, like a booster in my performance and it's just amazing. So uh, time flies by on the treadmill and I just enjoy it. I think goals you can achieve easily and don't have the same values like races where you really have to dig in really, really deep and have the strongest feel possible, then a victory is so much, so much better. Maybe that gives us a little bit of insight with the crushing it on the treadmill and, and actually enjoying that. Yeah, I think she just loves the run and she really thrives there. And we talked um, briefly about um, her coach as well. And uh, she's had the same coach since she first started triathlon. They've worked together for a really long time and, and he knows this. He knows what gets the best out of her. And, uh, yeah, incredibly tough, just digging as deep as possible. And both of these these ladies have the unteachables, we say in sport as well, the stuff that technically you can't develop. It's it's the grit, the determination, and the, the minerals to really deliver the hardest of races. Yeah, we see that with Lucy Charles Barkley, just the way she'll go from the front, no no prisoners, just, just take it on. And then with Annie Howe, like the way she comes from so far behind sometimes, and just like she just mentioned, digs in as deep as possible to overcome. Incredible. And I think you're right. I don't think you can teach that. That's something you're born with. And sometimes, quite often, that we see with uh, these elite triathletes, they're not the best when they're young, but they've got that determination. And that pace of Annie Haug is crazy, particularly when you put that side by side with Lucy Charles Barkley. She's really eating up that lead. She is, yeah, she's she's really pulling it back so quickly. She's within 40 seconds now. Gentle's bringing back time on Lucy Charles Barkley too, but not quite as fast. But we get a really good idea from those paces there what's happening within the race. And it's, I think it's worth still saying that at, 
a lot of these competitors, they just haven't felt this 100 kilometer distance a great deal. So the pacing, uh, how the, the pain, the, the tactics, the strategy, I think everyone's still sort of trying to work it out. Yeah, there's there's been a few opportunities, but I don't think there's many athletes that have done every race. It just yeah. they just haven't. So, yeah, really every race is learning, and the strategies are going to be different. How people prepare, and what they're going to put their focus on in the year. But as this series grows, I think we'll see more and more athletes just putting their focus on this distance. It's yeah, when I look back to Edmonton with the with the men, you just saw a, a bunch of guys getting serious cramps, but then you go to Dallas where the heat was just so intense that it's hard to sort of use that as a yardstick but we haven't really seen a lot of those sort of problems here in ibiza now throughout the broadcast we've pulled up the mystery pros predictions the mystery pro has been causing a lot of chatter in the triathlon community no one knows who he or she is and their predictions for this race was that lucy charles barkley would be on top of the podium followed by Sodaro and then Ashley Gentle. Well, Mystery Pro, there's a few that's looking, not looking good at the moment. There might be two out of three. Might be. <laughs> might be. We'll uh, have to see how this plays out. But uh, yeah, very interesting. I'm not sure if Lucy Charles Barkley is uh, is on for the win yet. She's, she's, but she's so tough and she'll just dial into that um, distance and go for it. But yeah, it looks like he's right about Daniela. It doesn't look like there's going to be a podium for Daniela Reef today. Oh, I said he, didn't I? I don't know if it's a he. <laughs> I don't think anyone actually knows who it is, he or she. Whisper it, do you know? No. I've been trying my best to, to find out, and they, those who might be in the know just keep on throwing us down, throwing us off. It's a he, it's a she, it's, a, it's they. It could be many of them, so but who knows? We'll find out. But they are he, she, they are ruffling feathers in the community. But Lucy Charles Barkley won't care a hoot about what the Mystery Pro has been saying. She is dialed into her race and she'll be looking to fend off the charge of Annie Haug, who is now about 30 seconds behind her. Ashley Gentle under a minute behind her and she can certainly run as well. Prove time over at this distance or the two races, I should say. She is the leading athlete at the PTO races. Yeah, the leading athlete. And I think that comes with a bit of pressure coming in. She, yeah. And I think that's why we saw Ashley maybe downplaying it a little bit. She looked just, anyhow, just looks fast, looks strong and fast. And she's got eyes on Lucy Charles Barkley. Yeah. They, they, <laughs> did, they, did they look at each other then? I think with the glasses, you can't really uh, tell if anyone's looking at anyone's eyes. You, it's easier to have a good game face there. But she's just closing her down just looks fantastic and she? she's bouncing along the pavement yeah and i think that's uh, it's prob i'm probably i'm pretty certain that lucy charles barkley saw her and I, I think she could see the pace that she was streaking down yeah i think a quick glance there at the watch today how has she caught me this quickly but annie Haug is really pulling back very fast she's going to be within 30 seconds very soon and the speed she's closed down the gap she had we're going to see her passing at some point well this is fascinating 11 kilometers left it's about well, so i think we're under 30 seconds now that anyhow gets 23 seconds behind yeah that's oh, incredible and interesting we just saw the timing for further down and Emma Pallant Brown is now in sixth position so she, and I think three minutes down so she's run back and in a huge amount she's too. Flying. Yeah fantastic. She must be moving fast on course as well. Running almost at the same pace as Annie Howe that's how fast Emma Pallant Brown is moving from behind. She just had a lot bigger gap it's whether she's going to be able to get oh I don't know if she's going to be able to get up to the podium but she is uh, she's definitely putting everything into it to try and get there. Haug cooling down. Oh, you can see they're just slowing down. It must be warm out there. She wouldn't be slowing down that much to get on that water if it wasn't. She's really taking care of herself, making sure she uh, gets to the, you know, gets to the finish in the best shape possible. I think that's what's hard about the longer distances is that 
you can't just get caught up in the racing because you have to make sure you've got all the nutrition right, you've got all the hydration on that you need, because if you don't do that, your race can fall apart in the last couple of kilometers. And is she now more worried about what's, what Ashley Gentle's doing, Annie Howard? Yeah, I mean, yeah, she can't look back. She can't. <laughs> she doesn't want to look behind, does she? She wants to focus forwards and just moving as fast as she can forward. But I think she'd have to be mindful behind that Ashley Gentle is within 30 seconds. India Lee and Paula Finley make up the top five. I've got a feeling that that's going to shuffle. That's an incredible race with India Lee. I mean, we expect to see Paula Finley up there. She's a regular kind of in the top five on the podium. But India Lee, this is a big breakthrough for her to be this high up in the field. I've heard she's in good shape. I heard she's been running some PBs earlier this year. Um, she takes part in cross country events as well. She does a really big range of kind of cross training as well to support her triathlon work. But yeah, really good breakthrough for her at the moment if she can maintain that position. Yeah, I think she came seventh at the UK Inter-Counties a couple of months ago. She does some cyclocross races as well. Oh, this is a moment here, isn't it? Daniela Reef about to be lapped by Annie Haug. Wow. And it doesn't, it don't want it to take away from Daniela Reef. And I love the way that even if she's having a bad day, she doesn't pull off. She, she's yeah. that tough. She, she gives the respect to the race and she always gets out there and finishes no matter how she feels. But it's uh, yeah, not the Daniela Reef we are used to seeing today. And Annie Haug doesn't sort of get the same recognition. I mean, obviously the achievements aren't, aren't quite uh, on par yet, but uh, she's, she's flies under the radar a little bit more so it's from her side of things it's you know it's wonderful to to see them both still competing on the same field and you know just marching ahead and looking so strong yeah i think annie Haug does fly under the radar but she's she's a quiet person she just loves getting on with her racing she doesn't really shout about it but she has been sensational all of this season and it's it's hard to put into words i mean she she won by 13 minutes in her last race i mean she could have she could have stopped for yeah. a, and you know had a cup of tea like on the finish line if she wanted for to sure. she's that far ahead here we go annie Haug with charles lucy charles barkley in her sights she is closing down the gap there's only a few strides between them now. Is this a pivotal moment in the race? Will we see Annie Howe just kick on from here? Or will Lucy Charles Barkley try to respond? We have about 10 kilometers to go before we hit that finish line. And it's an acknowledgement from both athletes. But Germany's Annie Haug marches forward into the lead. Oh, love, like so lovely to see that respect between the athletes as well. Like that gives me goosebumps. Just that respect that these women have for each other, just out on the course. And Annie respects how Lucy races, and Lucy respects just that run they have. They also have the same coach as well, so I presume there's a, that little kind of. I know they don't train together, but there is that kind of acknowledgement that that we're both kind of uh, together in this. And let's look at it again, as Annie Haug elbows out. She closes down on Lucy Charles Barkley. And there's the acknowledgement. Yeah, just straight past there. I think Annie Howe, she's just running one continuous fast pace. She's not um, really putting a surge to do anything there. She's just got onto the run. She's running within her pace. It's just so fast that no one at the front of the race is able to go with it. There might be athletes further back running that fast, but they're, they're nowhere near here, near her. I'm in this with the grace of, graces of respect, but she has decimated that field since she's come out of T2. Just completely run it. Was, she, was it ninth that she, she came through T2? Yeah, I think it was ninth. It was a good two and a half minutes down as well, maybe, Gosh, maybe slightly fantastic. more. So, yeah, incredible, incredible running. But Ashley Gentle as well, she's also running well. She is reeling in Lucy Charles Barkley. She's just not doing it at the speed that Annie Haug is doing it. But this is still incredible running here from Ashley Gentle. Yeah. Another incredibly strong performance and I think under pressure performance because she's coming in here as the two time <laughs> two time winner the favorite everyone's talking about her so I think she's coped with that remarkably well too yeah and possibly a cold or similar as well uh, coming into the race but we don't want to sort of labor on that because she's putting in a, a fantastic performance at the moment as we look at the race pace and look at Annie Howe wow 
And there's a, protected, a projected 102 split for Anna, Annie Howe, which is the same as Alistair Brownlee. So she's doing it again. She's putting in the same kind of times as the men in races. But I guess the next question is, is Ashley Gentle going to catch LCB? I think she will, yeah. I think she's got enough time. Um, she's gradually reading in. We can see from those pace times there, she's running a good 10 seconds per K quicker. So I would say, yeah, she's got enough time. And I think the, with Ashley Gentle, we know just from previous races, she goes to the line. She puts everything in there. She tries to get everything out. And she's got someone to chase. I think she's doing it. I'm committing to a prediction. <laughs> it's my first <laughs> commitment to a prediction today. Good for you. I guess uh, Annie Howe, the, the question will be whether she can maintain this kind of pace because we know that Ashley Gentle knows how to pace the 100 kilometers so very well. She's won impressively. So she's got that internal monitor. So we'll see how this one plays out with about nine kilometers to go. But Annie Howe just blistering out there on this run leg. The sports woman of the decade in Beirut. My German colleague over here might be growling at me through my pronunciation. I think I did okay. So many notable wins. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting it on. Yep, I absolutely butchered. <laughs> uh, I absolutely butchered the town in which she's from. Uh, you did better than I would have done. <laughs> I don't know about that. It sounded pretty bad what was coming through my, my headphones. So, uh, no, I didn't mean that, Annie. Sorry about that. I will uh, do my homework better. But she's a Bavarian ambassador of sports. She just gives back to the community there. And I think locally very much recognized as the sterling athlete that she is. I'm sure they're all cheering for her as well. It's a big support for her back home in Germany. And of course, there's Anna's huge support for triathlon in Germany. Just so many great achievers over the years. Continue to be right at the top of the game. Yeah, all the time. And I think, and what's unique for Annie, she, she came into this sport quite late. She didn't start until she was 27. So we're saying earlier she's maybe one of the older athletes in the field, but Ashley Gentle's probably been doing triathlon for longer, like when you put it into that context. Yeah. So she came from a really multi-sport background, did loads of different sports. So I just she's just found what suits her, hasn't she? This is what suits her, just running hard, running incredibly hard and fast after swimming and biking. Yeah, so those younger viewers and, and listeners to this, Annie Howe didn't learn to swim until she was 20. So no pressure, but there's few excuses. <laughs> yeah, she's, uh, it, and uh, that's quite unique. And I mean, the swim we would say is her weakest discipline. I and mean, she's, she's increased, she's improved her bike massively over the last few years. She's like, that's on an upward trend. Yeah. You see that her run has always been solid, but her swim, I think that's been her weak point. But at the moment, she's so strong on her bike and run. She's able to overcome that. and. She's always working on the swim as well. It's always a work in progress. Yeah, she almost doesn't need it. But if she's running like this for this distance, but of course, always looking for that improvement. Yeah, now 20 seconds ahead of Charles Barkley as well. And the interesting one, there's the 28 seconds between Lucy Charles Barkley and Ashley Gentle. So Gentle's got someone to chase and Lucy Charles Barkley, incredible motivation, obviously, to hang on. And I think if you've ever watched Lucy Charles Barkley race, she's come fourth in Hawaii Ironman Chance four times. But some of those times she's been overtaken and then, then she's been in third position and then she overtakes again. She has got such grit and determination. If Lucy gets past, it doesn't mean it's over. There's right. so many occasions we've seen that kind of strength to come back. But it's going to be tough out there with um, Ashley Gentle running the way she is today. Well, Lucy Charles Barkley wanted to be in amongst it, in the thick of it, at these PTO races, and she's she's getting all of that today. She's no longer out there by herself. She's got company of Annie Haug, and now coming up is Ashley Gentle as well. But these are marks of champions, their ability to deal with all of this as Annie Haug laps Ellie Salthouse. Yeah, she's just starting um, fourth lap. It's a warm day here in Ibiza. I saw Annie taking advantage of the aid station a couple minutes back, drenched herself to keep the engine cool. 
You just see those clips coming through. India Lee, Paula Finley there, not too, too far apart. India Lee at the moment got that advantage. And then we see Emma Pallant Brown is, is really moving up fast. 302. She's got, got the potential to overtake fourth and fifth. I think just the speed she's she's been catching. Just incredible run shape there from Emma Pallant. I mean, she comes from a running background. She she was a she's raced for Great Britain as a junior in athletics. So such a high standard when she was young. A lot of injuries really led her to triathlon. She she couldn't run for a while and started doing triathlon and has just excelled, at, at, especially at this distance. It's really kind of suits her. And we can see here she's she's in, well, she's in sixth position, but she ha does have that potential to break into the at least the top five. And a real strength of schedule last year, raced 12 times, including the Ironman 70.3 Mallorca, where she, where she won. I can't believe that she won the World Duathlon Championships here last week. Was it like this week? Yeah, last weekend. Last weekend, yeah. So. yeah that's <laughs> yeah. crazy. Like just to maintain just, just a little warm-up race yeah, exactly <laughs> i think and sara perez salah as well we saw her early on she did the aquathon world championships and finished fourth so right. a lot of athletes using this kind of multi-sport festival to uh, get ready for this weekend i believe that she actually was uh, was ill in march as well so it hasn't all been uh, great for Emma Pallant Brown, but still looking, looking great today. Just, uh, just, just goes to show you the susceptibility for illness. But you elite athletes bounce back pretty quick as well. Can still post some of these incredible results. Yeah, it's, it's, it's having that illness and knowing you have to be really sensible. I think Emma Pallant Brown was at her race. She was wrapped her bike in Lanzarote and then couldn't race because she was sick. So it's really hard to pull out when you're there. You've done all the training, you've done your taper, you don't want to, but you have to make these sensible decisions sometimes and think about the rest of the year and, and how it's going to affect you. Annie Haug out front. So Still seeing 20 seconds on that gap there. It looks like it's gone out a li little bit further. She's really, a, there's a big gap behind her now. And, and at this point, she's laughing athletes regularly. And in a way, it's quite nice. She's got someone to aim for in the future, in, in like in, you know, 200 meters, or I'm just going to pass them, pass right. them, kind of just using the people around you, using everything around you. Fly by them, fly by them. <laughs> yeah, fly by them. <laughs> the speed she's running, yes. She's going full chat around this run course. And beautiful section of the run course here through the town, through it really twisty. There's there's lots of spectators around. A little it, bit of reprieve from the sunshine as well. But it is a clear path ahead for Annie Haug, who's looking good for this top spot with about seven kilometers to go. And see, there's the timing split now. It's currently 39 to Lucy Charles Barkley. So it, it is coming down. Ashley Gentle, she's getting closer. She's within that 20 seconds now. It's going to be a really, there's, there's two, well, probably uh, one and a half laps left now. So it's going to be a big push from Ashley Gentle to, to get clear at the right point. She do, maybe doesn't want to leave it to a sprint. Or, but mind you, I've seen Ashley Gentle sprint very well. <laughs> so she maybe would be fine for a sprint. Annie Howe really taking charge of this race now, running with authority. I'd love to know what she's thinking at this point, because so far ahead, but she still continues to push. She, she could probably bring it down a level if she wanted to. I just don't think it's in her nature to do that, though. Yeah, I guess it, there, there's the risks. There are the strategic risks of blowing up on, on the course. Yeah, and I think... Yeah, just keeping on going. I don't think anyone allows themselves to think they've won pretty much till they get to the carpet at the end, till they get to that finish shoot, and that's when you can kind of enjoy it. You see Ashley Gentle rounding that turn. She'll have Lucy Charles. She'll just be able to see Lucy Charles Barkley at some point now. It's passing Didi Dutrix. And that is... Ashley Gentle, keeping a really good pace at the moment. She has eyes on Lucy Charles Barkley.
Lovely to see the support out there as well. Yeah, great support for the athletes. Is that Lucy in front of her? Looks like it. Yeah, that's close, isn't it? Very close Really indeed. close. It's come down really quick. Maybe is she making her move? She could be making a move, or, or maybe Lucy Charles just, just feeling the pressure a little bit and just, just slightly slowing. It might not even be much. They're so close anyway. Just that slight slowing. Well, she's definitely in her sights now. Lucy Charles Barkley, who led this race for so very long. She was picked off by Annie Haug. And now she's having to deal with Ashley Gentle. And Lucy Charles Barkley will know how close she is, but it's just that matter of just... So it's just focusing on you and the moment, because there's nothing you can do. You can't control how people are coming up to you. You can control how you respond. So she can try and go with her for a bit. It's, what's Ashley going to do? Is she going to catch? I think she's probably just going to go straight past. She might go wide, put in a bit of a surge, just to try and say, shake yes. her, make sure no one kind of gets on the sh Lucy doesn't get on the shoulder. Yeah, she did. I think she did that in Dallas. She really kicked on. And she's just in the shadows of Charles Barkley now. Look for her to make her move. There she goes. And she does surge. Yeah, straight she went in front wide. and straight into second. There goes Ashley Gentle. Strong run from her as predicted. And Lucy Charles Barkley drops down to third. Emma Pallant Brown is in fourth. So now Ashley Gentle will be able to see how much gap she's made on yeah, Lucy that, as yeah. they make the turn. A little look then, just to check. So a sneaky look. It's the best <laughs> place to look. Because if you look behind, then it's a show of weakness. But if right. you just look in on the turn, you can get away with that, I think. And Lucy Charles still looks like she's moving really well. It just hasn't been able to match that pace there of Ashley Gentle and Annie Howe, who's now just down the road. I think she's got a gel in her hand now. Very important to maintain the fueling, especially at the sort of pace that these guys are, are running over this 18 kilometer run course. And this is a, a breakaway group of one, two, three, how gentle Charles Barkley, but anything can happen in racing. Yeah, with Emma Pallant Brown in fourth, but it's uh, it's a big gap now to close down. It's going to be, uh, I think we'd have to see Lucy Charles Barkley really blow up and, and slow down for that to happen. But Emma Pallant's not going to give up, but neither is Lucy Charles Barkley. Just, uh, so strong. She just makes it look so easy, doesn't she? She looks yeah. so comfortable. I mean, you can see she's running fast, but it just looks so smooth and relaxed. Five kilometers to go. So that's uh, Annie Haug just running on, but just behind her, she now has Ashley Gentle. She passed Lucy Charles Barkley and she really kicked on as she went around the Brits. Yeah, it was a good surge there. She kind of got up on her shoulder and then really made a big effort. She didn't want Lucy Charles Barkley slipping onto her shoulder, so that was a really good move there by Gentle. And there is Ashley Gentle. Steady turnover. She's a lot taller than Annie Haug. I think that's the other thing about Annie. She's I think she's uh, quite, it's about five foot three, so her turnover of legs is uh, very yeah. high by comparison. Yeah, she's, she's a small athlete. Ashley Gentle, that little bit taller, such a familiar figure at these races now. Normally, well, she is just chasing down, running down the field. Not in that first position today, but still a really solid performance. And I think she would be happy with this second position coming in. She, she'd had a few, maybe a shaky start to the season. People definitely expected more from her. She finished third at a half Ironman race recently. And 
it wasn't the highest standard of field. So I said that sometimes takes the pressure off, but I think people are still thinking of her as one of the best at this distance, but, and it's still another good day for her. Yeah. Yeah, there was the, the I think the travel as well that you said could have factored quite heavily into that race that people were taking a close look at. But she's proved time over that she is worthy of that top spot. Yeah, and she, she's traveling with her husband, Josh Anberger, as well. He's um, he's racing tomorrow in a woodlock track and long distance race. So the two of them, they've kind of left their home in Brisbane. Now they're moving into Europe for four months. And she says she kind of likes that rather than back and forth. They'd rather come here, make a base, do all the races here for the year before going back to Australia. And that's the way she deals with it a lot better than the the doing the international travel several times a year. Yeah, and you were talking to me about how she has a very healthy balance between her professional athletics, but also her life at home with her friends and family. Yeah, I think she keeps it very much separate. It's a, That's her home life, and then triathlon is, is very much the job. It doesn't overtake the rest of her life, and I think that's really helped her, especially the last few years where she's really struggled, kind of leaving Olympic distance triathlon and kind of all the stuff that the emotional stuff that went around that and how hard that Olympic experience was. It's very handy to have that separate, supportive family life at that point. And she got married, was it last year? Yeah, the end of last year. So she just won these two PTO Opens. She had the opportunity to go and race the Half Ironman Worlds, which she was considered one of the favourites. But she said, no, I want to go home. I want to get married. I don't want to do any racing in the lead up to it. I want to enjoy this moment and be at home with my friends and family. So I think that there really shows how important she places that. And that comes above the races. Yeah, and does that surprise you? Because from, from my perspective, you, you athletes have a, a smaller window to achieve all of it. And when you're in form, and when you're having a season like she has, like there's every chance, as you say, could, could have taken home these big prizes again, the big bragging rights. Yeah, and I think it really depends on the athlete mentality. I think for the way it seems for Ashley, if she'd gone and done that, then maybe her longevity in her career isn't as long because she, she needs that balance. But yeah, here we see Emma Pallant-Brown. She's currently in fourth position. She's running incredibly, she's made up so much time on the leaders. So seven places she's jumped on the run. It's a fine run there by Emma Pallant-Brown. If you look back through Emma Pallant-Brown's results, she races so often. Yeah. <laughs> she's, like, she's always racing, and she's so rarely off the podium as well. I mean, that third at the 70.3 Worlds last year was probably one of the best performances of her life to get that there, the, that podium position. And, uh, yeah, it's great to see her coming out in this season and, and really doing well in her first races. Yeah, she's been doing lots of uh, lots of racing back in Johannesburg, like single discipline races, running, running, and uh, bike races as well. Yeah, she's British but lives in South Africa. She's also a physiotherapist as well. So, uh, <laughs> multi -talented. yeah, multi-talented. Yeah, she's two minutes down on Lucy Charles Barkley. So I just think that's that's too far. There's less than 5k to go. So two minutes in 5k it's uh, it would be a superhuman run from emma pallant brown to get onto that podium now yeah, she started a run club at an orphanage in johannesburg i believe as well so you know really big on the charitable efforts yeah absolutely amazing she coaches as well so there's a there'll be athletes here that she coaches that are doing races so she gets a lot of support out in the course a really popular athlete there she is looking very comfortable under 5k to go yeah and emma palance so this is what normally happens she is normally the athlete that's running from behind it's very normal for her we see there like a, her run is uh, her run is ranked fifth so she's um yeah she's right up there today and racing above her ranking there ranking coming in was eighth yeah strong stuff from emma palant brown as we are counting down the minutes here in ibiza for our first PTO Tour race of 2023 as we follow up on Ashley Gentle. She's in second place right now, a minute 23 behind Annie Haug. She's got 10 seconds on Lucy Charles Barkley. It looks like these are the ladies that will be bringing it home to the podium.
So there's the race pace. And we can see Lucy Charles Barkley, although she's been passed, she hasn't dropped off the pace much. This really gives her a shot. It, I think it definitely solidifies that third position. I don't think she's Emma Pallant has the time to catch her, but it just shows that she's there. And I think, like I said earlier, you don't count out Lucy Charles Barkley. I've seen her kind of written off and then come back quite a few times. Yeah, wouldn't that be something if she can get on the tail of Ashley Jensen and we have a sprint finish, but we won't put that pressure on her just yet. Yeah, it's only 10 seconds, so that surge Ashley Jensen put in, did she did manage to gap her, but Lucy Charles hasn't given up. That gap is still 10 seconds. And what a pace by Annie Howe, still outrunning everyone, not letting off the pedal. Yeah, I think so. Annie Haug out front now, and think just talking back about Lucy Charles Barkley. I mean, she's she's been in these situations before. She's been in thinking 2019 in Hawaii. She was passed. She was in fourth position, and she had that mental strength to dig in and get back onto the podium. It's incredible what she can do. So, we do have to watch that gap, see where it's going at the moment. Ten seconds, but really interesting to see whether that is going to come down. See the volunteers actually running down with the athletes then to make sure they're getting everything they need. And Annie Haug lapping more athletes out on the field. Just looking indestructible right now. 12 second gap. Four kilometers to go. Oh yeah, so between the gap between Ashley Gentle and Lisa Sorry. Charles Barrett yes. is going out slightly, but I mean I it's unbelievable. Annie Haug is now a minute 32 ahead of Ashley Gentle. It's just this run split is incredible. And I think, like you said, she's on course to run the same time as Alistair Brown. And she's going to have a top 10 run overall, men and women, today. Just over three kilometres to go. I think it's a big mental thing when you get to that last lap as well. So, right, come on, last lap. I believe that's the turn as well, actually, where she'll be going down the chutes. Yes, you see Lucy Charles Barkley running past Ashley Gentle to the tune of about 10 seconds. Is that a lace? Need some attention? Yeah, hard to see. Yeah, I'm not sure. You, normally they would have elastic laces yes. and it would be, um, yeah, you wouldn't have any problems. They did definitely look like there was something there on a shoe, maybe just something uh, picked up on the course. Maybe she's running so fast, her <laughs> shoes are falling apart. <laughs> so fast, they're breaking. <laughs> yeah, you, but you can see something there on her shoe, but if she's got elastic laces in, she's fine, and um, I'm sure that shoe is going to stay on. Mind you, I think she could run just as fast with one shoe. Yeah. <laughs> to be Wouldn't honest. That'd be something. Oh, the drama. But yeah, miles clear now. Unless something goes drastically wrong, she she's just running away with this yeah. and, the, and we know she's going to go to the line it's what she's done in all her races she might take time to enjoy the finish shoot i imagine but it's uh yeah the battle behind now is is just that second and third can lucy charles barkley really stay within touch and distance Ash, we can still see ashley gentle there lucy charles barkley you just never know what's going to happen in these races. I think back to the US Open, we thought Taylor Nib had it in the bag and then started walking at some one point. So <laughs> you just don't know what's going to happen. And we think Ashley Gentle's ahead, but just don't count out anything. Well, they are on their final lap now as the crowds continue to gather to help these athletes bring it home. Lucy Charles Barkley, who led this race for so very long, Still looking good on the run for that third position. She's not letting Ashley Gentle out of her sights, but Annie Haug, very dominant since she put on her runners. Yeah, just looking smooth in control. So many experience, so much experience now that Annie Haug has from kind of that short distance career going to the Olympics and now through to all distances, middle distance. She's obviously good at this distance, Collins Cup. She's really just a performer on every level. 
an absolute pleasure to watch running. Yeah, it doesn't look like her tank's running dry at all. Just maintaining a really fast pace. And she's so far clear now of, of the others. I suppose it's just that keeping in the right zone, just don't, not forgetting to do anything, not getting carried away. That doesn't look like she is at all, because we've seen her kind of take on new nutrition, slow down at the aid stations, but really keeping your head when everything's kind of going on. You might have that occasional thought coming to your mind, I'm going to win, but you just kind of maybe cancel it out, just keep staying in the moment, staying where you are, staying focused until you're really, really close to the end. She's been involved in this sport for so very long. Olympic Games back in 2012. She's been achieving at the highest level. 2017, she was winning 70.3 races and consistently been doing so. Always hitting those podiums, it feels like as well. Yeah, and, and all today, just coming from quite a big deficit in the swim, she rode incredibly well, kept herself in the race, and just knowing, I suppose, knowing you've got this kind of run in your back pocket, it's just it probably makes the whole race a little bit more relaxing. Yeah. <laughs> and again, for Ashley Gentle, she's Ooh. just nearly the wrong side of the cone, yeah. <laughs> just making sure she's the right way. I think this is a good start for her for the season and maybe taking a bit of pressure off. There we've got our first and second on screen. Annie Haug building up that lead, though. She's, she's going to be almost two minutes by the end. This is such a dominant run. Yeah, maybe just not got that high turnover we saw at the start of the run, but she's still pushing. She's not got far to go now. Yeah, she's keeping the gap. She's maintaining relative to the field. There's one and a half kilometers to go. Annie Haug featured at the Collins Cup, but we haven't seen her on a tour race. We certainly, well, she's certainly making an indelible mark today. She's got one more dead turn to do, and then it's all straight back towards, uh, no more of the, the turns, all straight running all the way back down to the finish shoot. It's been a fantastic performance by Annie Haug. Real quality triathlete. And I think on paper, you could see her results already were good this year, but she hadn't raced anyone you know, in that top and maybe just didn't have the hype around it that some of the other, other athletes have. But yeah, just to come in here and uh, completely smash the first race of the season, I'm, I'm sure we'll see this in other races of this distance through the rest of the year. There's actually Gentle rounding the statue down in Ibiza town. In your smaller box. The gap is over two minutes as either Ashley Gentle is slowing down or Annie Haug is speeding up. I'm not sure which. Yeah, I'm not sure which, but maybe a bit of both. And I think just maybe we saw her mentality a little bit there. She just loves those sessions where she just goes hard on the treadmill for as long as possible. And maybe that's maybe that mindset she's in today. She doesn't need to ease back. She's just going to keep pushing to the line because it's just what she loves to do. 700 meters now for Annie Haug. She can almost smell that finish line. I feel like she's picking it up yeah. for the finish. She feels Why not? Wind it up. I'm sure she might take the time to uh, to enjoy the finish, but yeah, she's just enjoying pushing herself to the absolute limits and thriving off racing the best women in the world. It's just been a fantastic performance from her today. So solid, and then the run has just been outstanding. She took control very early on, didn't she? She just came out of there just, just fast, moved into the lead and just hasn't looked back. Ninth out of T2. And then just ran down the field to assume the top spot as she's now going to bring it home. We just saw her passing Ashley Gentle there and you can see then how big that gap actually is. Yeah, over two minutes to... The second place, Ashley Gentle. 
Lucy Charles Barkley. So sorry, it's so Lucy Charles Barkley as well. Within 22 seconds. So although that gap went out, it has stayed the same. She's hung tough. She's really, she's just such a survivor, isn't she? Just digs in so deep. Annie Haug ignored the aid station as she makes her final turns. This on the coast of the Mediterranean. They're bringing this one home. The inaugural PTO European Tour race here in Ibiza. Annie Haug. Not long to go now before she'll meet the cheers. There must be a sign of a smile now. I'm sure she's got a smile on her face. She's almost there. Oh, it's just been wonderful to watch and just the way that she attacks the tarmac is quite incredible. Yeah, there's a wave. Here we go. She makes that corner. It has been one of the most celebrated fields in women's triathlon, but Annie Haug has run through to win the PTO European Tour race here in Ibiza. What a run. Well, just what a performance. Absolutely incredible. Just demolished the field on the run. She's, she's, I mean, there's people running from behind, but she just got herself in the perfect position and just executed that amazing run. Brilliant stuff. And she deserves a sit down as well. <laughs> Definitely deserves a chance to sit down, yeah. You can see there, she, she didn't have to push that hard, but that's just here. She wanted to get everything out of herself. Fantastic performance from Annie Haug. Really was strategically brilliantly done, and she just proves how strong she is at various different uh, distances, actually. But wonderful, really great race. She'll be enjoying that victory for sure. Soon she will have Ashley Gentle make the turn to come down the chute. Yeah, she's not too far off. That two minutes feels like a really long time though. Yeah. When she crosses the finish line. Oh, Ashley Gentle, she must be hot. She's taken on age. She's nearly there, but still feels that need to, to get the water on herself. Just cool down. Yeah, it's been a it's been a great run by Ashley Gentle as well, predictably. I mean, not a bad record, is it? No. <laughs> not a bad record at all. First or second in all of the PTO Opens she's taken part in so far. Yeah, you'll take that every day of the week. As she just gets herself set. She's about to meet the cameras. We were all a bit nervous that we heard that there was an illness that she might not be making the line this morning. Yeah, it was touch and go whether she was racing. She definitely hadn't been feeling well the few days leading into this. So it was, it was excitement when everyone knew that she was racking her bike this morning. And she's gone out there and just had a, oh, especially considering she might have had something going on. Makes it uh, yeah, ever more impressive. Really impressive. Well, she certainly loves this 100 kilometer race, proving time, time and time again how very strong she is as she enjoys bringing it home here in Ibiza. It is second place for Ashley Gentle. Congratulations to her. And she goes over, or Annie Howe comes to meet her at the finish line. Beautiful stuff. They can now enjoy the, the sights and sounds here in Ibiza. The work is done. The work is done. I think they need to lie down. <laughs> Maybe before going out clubbing later. And here's Lucy Charles Barkley to take third here in Ibiza. What an effort it's been from her today. Led the swim, led the bike. And it was a tough run with those ladies in the field. Yeah, I think Lucy Charles Barkley, no matter where she finishes, she's always had an impact on the race. She's such, a, just every time she's in a race, you know kind of that swim's going to be fast and it always causes things to happen for later on in the course of the race. And there's a lot of ground left in 2023. This is a good indicator of where these athletes are at at, at this stage, but I still think there's going to be some changes, some some improvements but I think that we're going to see I hope to see all of these 
uh, athletes again at the next PTO in the US. Yeah, and when you have a series of races, it always changes through the year. People come up and down at different points, but generally the top athletes are always close, but that, that little percentage they need takes them from maybe that third to first. So we might see this position kind of change later on in the year, but I'd imagine these women, three of the best women in the sport, we'd imagine them being kind of near the top in, in every race they're going into. Eight out of the 10 best in the PTO rankings towed the line. And we've got our first three home. Emma Pallant-Brown comes home for fourth. What a week it has been for her. And what a run again. Another sensational run. Amazing run. Just just uh, getting up to fourth there. Not quite. A th if she had a few more kilometers, she might have been able to do it. But incredibly fast run. She had the second fastest run split of the day behind, you guessed it, Annie Haug. Annie Haug. <laughs> yeah. We're just, we're just getting word that there were only 12 men that ran faster than Annie Haug out of the 26 that placed today. <laughs> it's going to be a theme coming into these, uh, these PTO Opens. Uh, how many men will Annie Haug outrun? <laughs> Some of the men will be running scared. Oh, 100%. She is a fantastic, fantastic athlete. Yes, Emma there with um, Jared Brown, her husband. Lucy Charles with her husband, Reese. Just nice to have that support there at the finish line. The people who know the most about what you've gone through to get to that position. And here is Paula Findlay. She makes it over the line. Congratulations to her. It's a solid fifth position for Paula Findlay. I think considering how she was definitely playing it down uh, in the time of year for her for this race, she's had a really great performance there. And there's Tamara Jewett. She now nicks the second fastest run split as she comes over the line. But we're going to send it down to Alex. Yes, the women's PTO European Open champion, Anna Haug, is alongside. I, I, it's an extraordinary achievement what you've just done and yet you have made it look absolutely effortless almost like you hit cruise control how comfortable was that and what does it mean to you to cross that line in first today oh it's not comfortable at all i mean i compete against the best in the world and that really pushes me to get the best out of me i mean you need the best in the world to get to see how good you are and um yeah i had just a fantastic race i must say i mean my swim was okay i would say and i felt very strong on the bike and and I knew I can run pretty quick, but you never know. I mean, it's the first race of the year against the best in the world. You never know where you are. It's always a box of chocolate, but um, yeah, I tried my best and yeah, always keep strong in the head. I think you always have to believe that you can make it. Annie, you said there, you know, you can run quite strong. Did you know you've outran more than half of the men's field? out there today so i think some of them might be running scared from you in the future i mean i had a little bit of mission with sam late no, um to beat him but he's not here so i thought okay i have to beat the other guys now or not uh, honestly i mean it feels a little bit like a redemption for all the pain of the itu distance you know so i'm really really happy with my race and my running and yeah Amazing, Lucy, well done, well done. We're sort of getting everybody in, it's a bit of a bun fight, but congratulations on that. Did that feel today that you were in the flow or was it at times a bit of a battle? Oh, you know what, I absolutely love that. First race of the season, it was absolutely brutal. I left everything out there. I went as hard as I could to try and get the gap and was running scared from these girls, but pretty happy to still make it to the podium. Fantastic. We felt like you had a little bit of a glint in your eye before the race. I mean, in the interviews we'd done with you beforehand, you were probably the only one who kind of gave an indication of that you felt like you were coming here fit. So that's really just shown on the course there. You must be pleased with that. Yeah, you know what, I've had a really good block. I wasn't quite sure where I was, but I felt like I'd seen some good things in training and I felt like I was able to deliver that today. Yeah, another third on the PTO tour. So we'll keep pushing for another step up, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I was going to say, what's it going to take for you, do you think, to just find that little bit extra? You know what, I think it's just time. I mean, it's still early in the season and I'm really happy with that result. So now I can go away. I know where I need to put the work in and come back for the next one and hopefully move up a spot or two. Amazing. And what about for you, Anna? In terms of your consistency at the moment, it is absolutely extraordinary. What is that down to? Where are you finding this run of form from? 
I, I think it's just consistency. It's all about uh, in, in um, uh, endurance sport. It's about consistency. And I struggled a bit from COVID in 2021, and I finally found a solution for that problem because I always had a little bit energy problems. And once that's solved, I mean, um, I can perform again. So I'm really, really happy that I could sort that out because it was really worrying me. And but now I hope, I keep my fingers crossed, that the season will be better than the last two seasons. It certainly started pretty well. You're going to need a little bit more energy just to get yourself to the podium, up onto that top step. Annie, well done to you. Lucy, thank you very much. We'll let you go to the podium. You've got some, some you, West Girls. Clare. Well done. Great to hear from both Lucy and Annie. And it certainly looked like a, a hard race. And Lucy Charles Barkley saying she left it all out there. But it was Annie Haug's day. What a sensational performance from her. That consistency is key. It is paying off. And you see there the top spot of 102.55. So Ashley Gentle coming in second. Lucy Charles Barkley followed by Emma Pannon Brown, Paula Finley, Tamara Jewett. Tamara Jewett, I'm sorry, the two Canadians, India Lee with a, a great seventh, Luisa Baptista making up eighth. This was a stacked field, Helen, and a, just a, a, a wonderful win for Annie Howard. Kicks off the year in fine fashion as well. It really does kick off the year, and incredible splits from all over, and some really fast racing from all the women. Lots to enjoy this victory as well. They have seen greatness today in Ibiza. And not long now, we will make it all official and give the ladies their moment down at the ceremony. It has been a monster couple of races to kick off the PTO Tour in 2023 here from the White Isle. Loads of sport going on this week here from Ibiza. But this really was a bit of a jewel in the crown with the list of competitors in both the men's and the women's race. And there is more coming from the PTO later this year. The next stop on the tour, we will be heading stateside to Milwaukee in August. Fourth and fifth. See all of those there, of course. There were a few that we didn't get to see today that will be keen to get back uh, on that start line for a PTO Tour race. This Watching this today can only make them even more motivated and hungry. And I'm excited to see the return of these athletes today to see what they can produce next time out. Yeah, completely. That, that's what we want. All these US, so all these PTO Opens is to have the best athletes in the world racing often. So we get to see these battles. We get to see how well, these incredible stories from the athletes. There's a lot of money on the line as well with the PTO Tour. $600,000 prize purse to be shared. $100,000 going to the top spot and then distributed from there. So it's life-changing stuff it really is yeah it can really make such an impact on your career and the life of an athlete can be short so these big paydays when you get them you have to enjoy all right to give them their moments, we send it down gentlemen, welcome to the medal ceremony of the 2023 pto european open presenting today are going to be vicente marie Presente Conseil Ibiza, Debbie Alexander, World Triathlon Vice President, Rafael Ruiz, Mayor of Ibiza, and Chris Commode, PTO Executive Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, in third place and the winner of the bronze medal representing Great Britain, Lucy Charles Barkley! In second place and the winner of the silver medal, representing Australia, Ashley Gentle! In primo lugar, il ganador della 
Mohamed Ayede Oro in PTO European Open 2023. In first place and the winner of the gold medal in the 2023 PTO European Open, representing Germany, Anna Haug. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please join us for the champagne celebration. What a fantastic performance, ladies and gentlemen, by our top three, Anna Haug in first, Ash Gentle in second, and Lucy Charles Barkley in her comeback race in third place. Well done. Well done to everyone. Uh, congratulations on this fantastic race. That was outstanding race. And now let's play the game spraying the photographer. Ladies and gentlemen, congratulations once again to these three ladies. What a great performance. So what a day of racing we've had. And just a recap, the board for the women's race and it's Germany's Annie Haug who takes the top spots with an outstanding run. Ashley Gentle, Lucy Charles Barkley join her on the podium. We also have Emma Pallant Brown, who's had a fantastic week with winning the duathlon as well as coming in fourth here at the PTO Tour. Paula Finley, Tamara Jewett as well. A really great field that came over the line here in Ibiza and some big points on the board that will serve them very well for the rest of the season. And it's just a wash with big names in short, middle and long distance racing as well. Grace Tech, Fenella Language up there as well, Amelia Watkinson, lots of uh, big name triathletes that were performing here in Ibiza. And the men, it was Max Newman's day, the Australian such a fantastic performance to come in ahead of Christian Blumenfeld who looks like it hurt him a little bit to be there in number two. He wants to take that number one spot back but realises where he's at in the season. Magnus Dietlev, I mean, looking fantastic as well. So big performances through a few that will be looking to make improvements on their performance today. But it can't be ignored, the strength of field. And it was great to be here in Ibiza for this inaugural PTO European Open. It's been a great day of racing, hasn't it, Helen? It's been an amazing day of racing. I've kind of forgotten about the men's. I've been so carried away with the women. So great to get that refresh there. But what an excellent day of racing. We saw the top three greatest of all time go head to head, but someone else came out on top, which was really interesting. Big winners here in Ibiza, and it really will help shape the season.
Well, what a day. Two spectacular races, two very worthy champions. I just want to bring Vicky back in, actually, as we reflect on Anna Haug and her performance. What is it, I suppose, you, when you see an elite athlete doing what they do best, the way that she ran in particular and the effortless nature of it, but coupled with the fact that she said it was a real battle out there, I mean, just sum up her performance today in your eyes. I mean, she was, she said it herself, her swim was strong, it was good, it was put, a, it laid the foundations for her day. Followed by that, she was really strong on the bike and we know what she can do on the run. She's done it time and time again in races. We haven't seen it quite so much on the PTO Tour yet because she hadn't yet started at the PTO Tour. She'd raced Collins Cup, she'd raced the Daytona PTO Championships in 2020, but we hadn't seen her at the PTO Tour. And she's just laid down a run that was faster than 50% of the men's field. I mean, extraordinary. Quite remarkable. She's also proving that age is no barrier in this sport. Well, we talk about her consistency, but she is towards the more experienced end of the field, if we can put it that way. Absolutely no sign of slowing down at all. And presumably, she'll just want to keep going for as long as she's loving it. Well, none at all. And she was turned, I hope she doesn't mind me saying, she turned 40 in January this year. And she's the oldest athlete in the field today, in the female field today. And she showed that that's absolutely no barrier to her at all. She clearly thrives on the sport, loves the sport, immerses herself completely in what she does day to day. And you talked about the consistency. She hasn't been off a podium in five years. Yeah. I mean, that's absolutely extraordinary. That kind of record just doesn't happen. Um, I want to ask you about Ashley Gentle as well. We haven't yet had the chance to, to speak to Ashley because I think she has in sort of the metaphors, emptied the tank today. I mean, it wasn't terribly well coming into it, but has left absolutely everything out on the course today. Yeah, I think we, we didn't know. It's been mentioned a fair bit in commentary. We didn't know if she was going to take the start line today. We, yes, this time yesterday, it was looking very hit and miss as to whether she was going to actually get down here to race. But what a testament to an athlete and what a mentality that is to say, I'm not 100%, but I'm here in Ibiza. I'm going to I'm gonna tow the start line. I'm going to see what happens. Found herself in a pretty strong position all day and really in contention for the top spot. So I'm absolutely not surprised that she's now needing a little bit of a, little bit of a lie down, a bit of medical attention, but unbelievable performance. Hopefully she is up on her feet and not feeling too bad in the not too distant future. Let's take you through what has been a, a remarkable race, a wonderful story of the day as far as the women are concerned and really all about Lucy Charles Barkley in the early exchanges. She said how delighted she was with the performance. I just wonder when the reflections come a little bit later, whether the frustrations might grow. But in terms of her swim and her bike ride today, I mean, she is out there doing what she's trained for and what she does best. Well, this is trademark Lucy. Lucy always likes to lead from the gun. Her aim in every race is to get as big a gap as possible on the swim, keep extending on the bike and then see what she's got left in the tank. There's no conserving energy as far as Lucy Charles Barkley is concerned and we saw her do exactly that again today. And she was good enough for all but two of the athletes. She held on to that third place but I do think she's going to go away and go yeah you know what I'm a bit hungry for a little bit more and another step up on that podium. Tell me about the psychology of when you have put in so much to lead in you know I suppose for two-thirds of the race etc how hard it is to keep going to find that extra win to find another attack to keep in there oh i mean of course it's hard you're you're giving absolutely everything you've got but it is it's a real psychological battle and you know what you can do is 80 percent in your in your head really as opposed to 80 percent in your body it's it's the mind that you've got to be able to control so at those points when your mind says stop that's when you have to override and keep going and is that just training 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 that's going to help her find that little bit extra to stand on the top of the podium rather the, than in third or are there other little adjustments that might help her along the way i think there's a few things i think yes the training is obviously super important and she mentioned it was her first race of the season it's really difficult to come to your first race of the season and perform at your peak it's something that a lot of athletes really struggle with and then on top of that again i think maybe there is a little bit of race savvy a bit of race tactics and she was so good at the end of the 2021 season. She's still just getting back there. And I think we're going to see another level soon. One of the big stories coming into today's race in the women's side of things is just the depth of field. And just to pick up on a couple of others who finished off the podium, but Emma Pallant-Brown in fourth, Tamara Jewett as well. We have now got just such a remarkable strength in depth in this race. I mean, can, we, can you see a lot of 
alterations, a lot of challenges coming from within the pack? Well, it seems like with every couple of months there's someone else. There's another name that we're talking about. Last year it was Ashley Gentle. The height before the beginning of this race, we were talking about Tamara Jewett coming along. And, of course, Emma Paller-Brown, who's done a fantastic job putting herself up there in fourth place. We've got names coming from left, right and centre. It's amazing. It really is. It's fantastic to be a part of triathlon with the PTO at the moment. We're bringing in Emma Paller-Brown right on cue. Welcome to you. Hey. We were just Hi. saying, actually, a remarkable day today for the women's side of things and an unbelievably competitive field. But just give us a little bit of an assessment on, on how you went today. Yeah, so um, I was really happy with my swim. Like, normally it's my weakest um, and I had a good swim. Um, trying to keep it fairly solid, steady on the bike. Um, before last year, I've overbiked a lot and then blown up on the run. Um, so, yeah, I kind of kept it more controlled on the bike and then had fun with the run. You really did have fun with that run. You were catching and catching and catching and, you know, it wouldn't have been too many more kilometres before maybe you could have found yourself on the podium. Is that kind of going to be in your back of your mind for the next time? Yeah, definitely. I, I kind of... Um I, yeah, they looked like they were a long, long way off, um, and I'm sure they had it covered, but um, yeah, definitely would have liked to have chased a little bit more on the kilometres. I was going to ask you, actually, how much today was it about sticking to your game plan, and how much was it about reacting to what was going on around you? Yeah, I think um, with this kind of field, it was very much like you've got to be in the race and you've got to react to the other girls and you've got to know who you want to go with and who might blow you up. Um, and yeah, I was just off that kind of lead pack and I was trying to chase and I could see my watts going up and I thought, no, I'm, I'm going to kill my legs here. So yeah, it's, it's very much like racing them, but also knowing your limits. And for a lot of people, it's been about getting rid of some of the cobwebs from months of training. Does it feel nice to have one under the belt and there's a lot more to come, a lot more to look forward to? Yeah, so much so. I mean, this is this feels like it's so early in the season to do such a big race. It's literally my first triathlon since six months. Um, so, yeah, it's. I, I think this season is going to be a cracker. And to do that, I guess, in a field of this quality, we've never seen the likes of this quality in a race before. At the first big race of the year as well, it must give you so much confidence going into the rest of the season to say, you know what, first race in six months, I posted a brilliant run split, brilliant all-round race, fourth place. Yeah, definitely. And, and like you say, this is it's so important that our sport sees these kind of fields come together because, yeah, this is just going to elevate everyone's game and, and it really was the strongest field I've, I've ever been in. Good on you, Emma. Thank you very much. You can grab a drink. You deserve a glass of something cold and hopefully alcohol. Like, come on in, Ashley. Well done. I mean, that looked heroic. I know you weren't feeling terribly well before the start of the day. I don't want to sort of put excuses out there for you, but how tough a ride was that today? Yeah, it was super tough. Um, I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice a little bit. Yeah, um, really didn't know how it was going to go today. I felt real off yesterday. Um, I don't really know what it was, but um, yeah, I left it all out there today. And yeah, I'm really proud of the way I raced. How touch and go were you to actually take to the start line? Um, well, it's a really long way to come to a race. So I think I would have started no matter what, unless I had a really bad night last night. But um, you know, there's been races in the past where I felt similar or just really unsure and yeah, it's gone really well um, or it's kind of gone really badly, but sometimes it's worth the risk. So um, yeah, I'm yeah very happy I started and, and really proud of the race I put together. I was going to ask you exactly that really. I mean, have you learned something about yourself today? We saw the glory last year when everything was under control, but to come and do what you've done today with all the challenges you've had, what have you learned? Yeah. I I guess um, it's been a bit of a tumultuous couple of weeks in Europe, to be honest. Um, but sometimes that's part of, you know, being a professional. You have to kind of roll with the punches, and um, like it never really goes perfect. I don't really know what a perfect pre preparation is, but it's really about trying to overcome challenges and doing the best you can, trusting yourself. And you know, at the end of the day, I would have been happy with however I came, as long as I put together a race that you know was my best on that day so I did that today and it was just a class above everyone else and um, she was incredible and really deserved that win. That's very gracious of you. I mean 
You've just spoken there about the challenges you faced in the last couple of weeks. Amongst that is the illness that you've woken up with yesterday as well. You must be not just proud of what you've done, but really confident going forward that, you know, I can lay down a performance like that. I can come second in this field when I'm not 100%. What does that mean for the rest of the year? Yeah, I, I was really unsure of, um, yeah, how it's going to go. And, you know, it's a bit nerve wracking because, you know, a lot of people, you know, had high hopes of how I was going to do based on last year but um, last year was last year right um, this is a new year um, it's new courses new challenges and you know you still got still got to work extremely hard every single day to put your best foot forward on the race course so um, I'm really looking forward to yeah learnt so much already this year and I really feel like I've got a lot more to give throughout the year Good on you. well done go and recover but lovely to see you. we'll let you step out we've got about a minute to go until we're off well done Ashley we shall see you in Milwaukee and breathe. Yeah. What a weekend. Sum that all up for us. I mean, the greatest athletes of all time, all on one course, on one day, here in the sunshine. It's a triathlon fans' absolute dream. Um, brilliant two races. Well done. Thank you very much. Time for you to go and find Emmy, the little one. Keep yeah. her out of the sunshine. Lovely to have Vicky alongside. Just to mark your card, 4th and 5th of August is when we are back in Milwaukee for the uh, PTO US Open. We'll have the stellar names back on the start line once again, and we shall look uh, forward to much more of the same. Thank you once again, Vicky. We've had a remarkable day here in Ibiza, and the good news is we've got a good after party to look forward to. Bye for now.